This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Today's reading by Alex Foster, www.alexfoster.me.uk A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, with Strictures on Political and Moral Subjects, by Mary Wollstonecraft, with a biographical sketch of the author. Part 1 A Brief Sketch of the Life of Mary Wollstonecraft Mary Wollstonecraft was born in 1759. Her father was so great a wanderer that her place of birth is uncertain. She supposed, however, it was London or Epping Forest. At the later place she spent the first five years of her life. In early youth she exhibited traces of exquisite sensibility, soundness of understanding and decision of character. But her father being a despot in his family, and her mother one of his subjects, Mary derived little benefit from their parental training. She received no literary instructions, but such as were to be had in an ordinary day school. Before her sixteenth year she became acquainted with Mr. Clare, a clergyman, and Miss Frances Blood, the latter two years older than herself, who, possessing good taste and some knowledge of the fine arts, seemed to have given the first impulse to the formation of her character. At the age of nineteen she left her parents, and resided with a Mrs. Dawson for two years, when she returned to the parental roof to give attention to her mother, whose ill health made her presence necessary. On the death of her mother, Mary bade a final adieu to her father's house, and became an inmate of F. Blood. Thus situated, their intimacy increased, and a strong attachment was reciprocated. In 1783 she commenced a day school at Newington Green, in conjunction with her friend F. Blood. At this place she became acquainted with Dr. Price, to whom she became strongly attached. The regard was mutual. In 1792 she removed to Paris, where she became acquainted with Gilbert Imlay of the United States, and from this acquaintance grew an attachment which brought the parties together without legal formalities to which she objected on account of some family embarrassments in which he would thereby become involved. The engagement was, however, considered by her of the most sacred nature, and they formed the plan of emigrating to America, where they should be enabled to accomplish it. These were the days of Robespierrean cruelty, and Imlay left Paris for Havre, whither, after a time, Mary followed him. They continued to reside there until he left Havre for London, under pretense of business, and with a promise of rejoining her soon at Paris, which, however, he did not, but in 1795 sent for her to London. In the meantime she had become the mother of a female child, whom she called Frances in commemoration of her early friendship. Before she went to England she had some gloomy forebodings that the affections of Imlay had waned if they were not estranged from her. On her arrival these forebodings were sorrowfully confirmed. His attentions were too formal and constrained to pass unobserved by her penetration, and though he ascribed his manner and his absence to business duties, she saw his affection for her was only something to be remembered. To use her own expression, love, dear delusion. Rigorous reason has forced me to resign, and now my rational prospects are blasted, just as I have learned to be contented with rational enjoyments. To pretend to depict her misery at this time would be futile. The best idea can be formed of it from the fact that she had planned her own destruction, from which Imlay prevented her. She conceived the idea of suicide a second time, and threw herself into the Thames. She remained in the water until consciousness forsook her, but she was taken up and resuscitated. After diverse attempts to revive the affections of Imlay with sundry explanations and professions on his part, through the lapse of two years she resolved finally to forgo all hope of reclaiming him, and endeavour to think of him no more in connection with her future prospects. In this she succeeded so well that she afterwards had a private interview with him, which did not produce any painful emotions. In 1796 she revived or improved an acquaintance which commenced years before with William Goodwin, author of Political Justice, and other works of great notoriety. Though they had not been favourably impressed with each other on their former acquaintance, they now met under circumstances which permitted a mutual and just appreciation of character. Their intimacy increased by regular and almost imperceptible degrees. The partiality they conceived for each other was, according to her biographer, in the most refined style of love. It grew with equal advances in the mind of each. It would have been impossible for the most minute observer to have said who was before or who after. One sex did not take the priority which long-established custom has awarded it, nor the other overstep that delicacy which is so severely imposed. Neither party could assume to have been the agent or the patient, the toil-spreader or the prey in the affair. 
when in the course of things the disclosure came, there was nothing in a manner for either to disclose to the other. Mary lived but a few months after her marriage, and died in childbed, having given birth to a daughter who is now known to the literary world as Mrs. Shelley, the widow of Percy Bysshe Shelley. We can scarcely avoid regret that one of such splendid talents and high-toned feelings should, after the former seemed to have been fully developed, and the latter had found an object in whom they might repose, after their eccentric and painful efforts to find a resting place, that such an one should at such a time be cut off from life is something which we cannot contemplate without feeling regret. We can scarcely repress that murmur that she had not been removed ere clouds darkened her horizon, or that she had remained to witness the brightness and serenity which might have succeeded. But thus it is. We may trace the cause to antisocial arrangements. It is not individuals but society which must change it, and that not by enactments, but by a change in public opinion. The authoress of The Rights of Woman was born April 1759, died September 1797. That there may be no doubt regarding the facts in this sketch, they are taken from a memoir written by her afflicted husband. In addition to many kind things which he has said of her, he was not blinded to imperfections in her character, is that she was lovely in her person, and in the best and most engaging sense, feminine in her manners. A letter to Monsieur Talion Perigord, the late Bishop of Autun. Sir, having read with great pleasure a pamphlet which you have lately published on national education, I dedicate this volume to you, the first dedication that I have ever written, to induce you to read it with attention, and, because I think that you will understand me, which I do not suppose many pert witlings will who may ridicule the arguments they are unable to answer. But, sir, I carry my respect for your understanding still farther, so far that I am confident you will not throw my work aside and hastily conclude that I am in the wrong because you did not view the subject in the same light yourself. And pardon my frankness, but I must observe that you treated it in too cursory a manner, content to consider it as it had been considered formerly, when the rights of man and not to advert to woman were trampled on as chimerical. I call upon you, therefore, now to weigh out what I have advanced respecting the rights of woman and national education, and I call with the firm tone of humanity. For my arguments, sir, are dictated by a disinterested spirit. I plead for my sex, not for myself. Independence I have long considered as the grand blessing of life, the basis of every virtue, and independence I will ever secure by contracting my wants, though I were to live on a barren heath. It is, then, an affection for the whole human race that makes my pen dart rapidly along to support what I believe to be the cause of virtue, and the same motive leads me earnestly to wish to see woman placed in a station in which she could advance, instead of retarding the progress of those glorious principles that give a substance to morality. My opinion, indeed, respecting the rights and duties of woman, seems to flow so naturally from these simple principles that I think it scarcely possible but that some of the enlarged minds who formed your admirable constitution will coincide with me. In France there is undoubtedly a more general diffusion of knowledge than in any part of the European world, and I attribute it in a great measure to the social intercourse which has long subsisted between the sexes. It is true, I utter my sentiments with freedom, that in France the very essence of sensuality has been extracted to regale the voluptuary, and a kind of sentimental lust has prevailed, which, together with a system of duplicity that the whole tenor of their political and civil government taught, have given a sinister sort of sagacity to the French character, properly termed finesse, and a polish of manners that endures the substance by hunting sincerity out of society. And modesty, the fairest garb of virtue, has been more grossly insulted in France than even in England, till their women have treated as prudish that attention to decency which brutes instinctively observe. Manners and morals are so nearly allied that they have often been confounded. But though the former should only be the natural reflection of the latter, yet when various causes have produced factitious and corrupt manners which are very early caught, morality becomes an empty name. The personal reserve and sacred respect for cleanliness and delicacy in domestic life, which French women almost despise, are the graceful pillars of modesty. But far from despising them, if the pure flame of patriotism have reached their bosoms, they should labour to improve the morals of their fellow citizens by teaching men not only to respect modesty in women, but to acquire it themselves as the only way to merit their esteem. 
Contending for the rights of women, my main argument is built on this simple principle, that if she be not prepared by education to become the companion of man, she will stop the progress of knowledge, for truth must be common to all, or it will be inefficacious with respect to its influence on general practice. And how can woman be expected to cooperate unless she know why she ought to be virtuous? Unless freedom strengthen her reason till she comprehend her duty and see in what manner it is connected with her real good. If children are to be educated to understand the true principle of patriotism, their mother must be a patriot, and the love of mankind from which an orderly train of virtues spring can only be produced by considering the moral and civil interest of mankind. But the education and situation of woman at present shuts her out from such investigations. In this work I have produced many arguments which to me were conclusive, to prove that the prevailing notion respecting a sexual character was subversive of morality, and I have contended that to render the human body and mind more perfect, chastity must more universally prevail, and that chastity will never be respected in the male world till the person of a woman is not, as it were, idolized, when little virtue or sense embellish it with the grand traces of mental beauty, or the interesting simplicity of affection. Consider, sir, dispassionately these observations, for a glimpse of this truth seemed to open before you when you observed that to see one half of the human race excluded by the other from all participation of government was a political phenomenon that, according to abstract principles, it was impossible to explain. If so, on what does your constitution rest? If the abstract rights of man will bear discussion and explanation, those of woman, by a parity of reasoning, will not shrink from the same test. Though a different opinion prevails in this country, built on the very arguments which you use to justify the oppression of women, prescription. Consider, I address you as a legislator, whether, when men contend for their freedom and to be allowed to judge for themselves respecting their own happiness, it is not inconsistent and unjust to subjugate woman, even though you firmly believe that you are acting in the manner best calculated to promote their happiness. Who made man the exclusive judge if woman partake with him the gift of reason? In this style argue tyrants of every denomination, from the weak king to the weak father of a family. They are all eager to crush reason, yet always assert that they usurp its throne only to be useful. Do you not act a similar part when you force all women by denying them civil and political rights to remain immured in their families groping in the dark? For surely, sir, you will not assert that a duty can be binding which is not founded on reason. If, indeed, this be their destination, arguments may be drawn from reason, and thus augustly supported, the more understanding women acquire, the more they will be attached to their duty, comprehending it, for unless they comprehend it, unless their morals be fixed on the same immutable principles as those of man, no authority can make them discharge it in a virtuous manner. They may be convenient slaves, but slavery will have its constant effect, degrading the master and abject dependent. But if women are to be excluded without having a voice from a participation of the natural rights of mankind, prove first, to ward off the charge of injustice and inconsistency, that they want reason, else this flaw in your new constitution, the first constitution founded on reason, will ever show that man must in some shape act like a tyrant, and tyranny in whatever part of society it rears its brazen front will ever undermine morality. I have repeatedly asserted, and produced what appeared to me irrefragable arguments drawn from matters of fact, to prove my assertion that women cannot by force be confined to domestic concerns, for they will, however ignorant, intermeddle with more weighty affairs, neglecting private duties only to disturb, by cunning tricks, the orderly plans of reason which rise above their comprehension. Besides, whilst they are only made to acquire personal accomplishments, Men will seek for pleasure in variety, and faithless husbands will make faithless wives. Such ignorant beings, indeed, will be very excusable. When, not taught to respect public good, nor allowed any civil right, they attempt to do themselves justice by retaliation. The box of mischief thus opened in society, what is to preserve private virtue, the only security of public freedom and universal happiness? Let there be, then, no coercion established in society, and the common law of gravity prevailing, the sexes will fall into their proper places. And now that more equitable laws are forming your citizens, marriage may become more sacred. Your young men may choose wives from motives of affection, and your maidens allow love to root out vanity. 
The father of a family will not then weaken his constitution and debase his sentiments by visiting the harlot, nor forget in obeying the call of appetite the purpose for which it was implanted. And the mother will not neglect her children to practice the arts of coquetry, when sense and modesty secure her the friendship of her husband. But till men become attentive to the duty of a father, it is vain to expect women to spend that time in their nursery, which they, wise in their generation, choose to spend at their glass. For this exertion of cunning is only an instinct of nature to enable them to obtain indirectly a little of that power of which they are unjustly denied a share. For if women are not permitted to enjoy legitimate rights, they will render both men and themselves vicious to obtain illicit privileges. I wish, sir, to set some investigations of this kind afloat in France, and should they lead to a confirmation of my principles, when your constitution is revised, the rights of woman may be respected, if it be fully proved that reason calls for this respect, and loudly demands justice for one half of the human race. I am, sir, yours respectfully, M. W. End of section. Recorded in Nottingham, England, on the 12th of November, 2006. By Alex Foster, www.alexfoster.me.uk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Krista McQuillan, MediaTinker.com. Vindication of the Rights of Women by Mary Wollstonecraft. Introduction. After considering the historic page, and viewing the living world with anxious solicitude, the most melancholy emotions of sorrowful indignation have depressed my spirits, and I've sighed when obliged to confess that either nature has made a great difference between man and man, or that civilization, which has hitherto taken place in the world, has been very partial. I have turned over various books written on the subject of education, and patiently observed the conduct of parents and the management of schools, but what has been the result? A profound conviction that the neglected education of my fellow creatures is the grand source of the misery I deplore, and that women in particular are rendered weak and wretched by a variety of concurring causes, originating from one hasty conclusion. The conduct and manners of women, in fact, evidently prove that their minds are not in a healthy state, for like the flowers that are planted in too rich a soil, strength and usefulness are sacrificed to beauty, and the flaunting leaves after having pleased a fastidious eye, fade, disregarded on the stalk long before the season when they ought to have arrived at maturity. One cause of this barren blooming I attribute to a false system of education, gathered from the books written on this subject by men, who, considering females rather as women than human creatures, have been more anxious to make them alluring mistresses than rational wives. And the understanding of the sex has been so bubbled by this specious homage, that the civilized women of the present century, with a few exceptions, are only anxious to inspire love, when they ought to cherish a nobler ambition, and by their abilities and virtues, exact respect. In a treatise, therefore, on female rights and manners, the works which have been particularly written for their improvement must not be overlooked, especially when it is asserted in direct terms that the minds of women are enfeebled by false refinement that the books of instruction, written by men of genius, have had the same tendency as more frivolous productions, and that in the true style of Mahometanism they are only considered as females and not as part of the human species, when improvable reason is allowed to be the dignified distinction which raises men above the brute creation and puts a natural scepter in a feeble hand. Yet, because I am a woman, I would not lead my readers to suppose that I mean violently to agitate the contested question respecting the equality and inferiority of the sex, but as the subject lies in my way, and I cannot pass over it without subjecting the main tendency of my reasoning to misconstruction, I shall stop a moment to deliver in a few words my opinion. In the government of the physical world, it is observable that the female in general is inferior to the male. The male pursues, the female yields. This is the law of nature, and it does not appear to be suspended or abrogated in favor of women. This physical superiority cannot be denied, and it is a noble prerogative. But not content with this natural preeminence, men endeavor to sink us still lower, merely to render us alluring objects for a moment, and women, intoxicated by the adoration which men, under the influence of their senses, pay them. 
do not seek to obtain a durable interest in their hearts, or to become the friends of the fellow creatures who find amusement in their society. I am aware of an obvious inference. From every quarter I have heard exclamations against masculine women. But where are they to be found? If by this appellation men mean to inveigh against their ardor in hunting, shooting, and gaming, I shall most cordially join in the cry. But if it be against the imitation of manly virtues, or, more properly speaking, the attainment of those talents and virtues, the exercise of which ennobles the human character, and which raises females in the scale of animal being, when they are comprehensively termed mankind, all those who view them with a philosophical eye must, I should think, wish with me that they may every day grow more and more masculine. This discussion naturally divides the subject. I shall first consider women in the grand light of human creatures, who, in common with men, are placed on this earth to unfold their faculties, and afterwards I shall more particularly point out their peculiar designation. I wish also to steer clear of an error which many respectable writers have fallen into, for the instruction which has hitherto been addressed to women has rather been applicable to ladies, if the little indirect advice that scattered through Sanford and Merton be accepted, but addressing my sex in a firmer tone, I pay particular attention to those in the middle class, because they appear to be in the most natural state. Perhaps the seeds of false refinement, immorality, and vanity have ever been shed by the great. Weak artificial beings raised above the common wants and affections of their race, in a premature, unnatural manner, undermine the very foundation of virtue, and spread corruption through the whole mass of society." As a class of mankind, they have the strongest claim to pity. The education of the rich tends to render them vain and helpless, and the unfolding mind is not strengthened by the practice of those duties which dignify the human character. They live only to amuse themselves, and by the same law which in nature invariably produces certain effects, they soon only afford barren amusement. But as I purpose taking a separate view of the different ranks of society, and of the moral character of women, in each, this hint is, for the present, sufficient. And I have only alluded to the subject because it appears to me to be the very essence of an introduction, to give a cursory account of the contents of the work it introduces. My own sex, I hope, will excuse me if I treat them like rational creatures, instead of flattering their fascinating graces, and viewing them as if they were in a state of perpetual childhood, unable to stand alone. I earnestly wish to point out in what true dignity and human happiness consists. I wish to persuade women to endeavor to acquire strength, both of mind and body, and to convince them that the soft phrases, susceptibility of heart, delicacy of sentiment, and refinement of taste are almost synonymous with epithets of weakness, and that those beings who are only the objects of pity in that kind of love which has been termed its sister will soon become objects of contempt. Dismissing, then, those pretty feminine phrases, which the men condescendingly use to soften our slavish independence, and despising that weak elegancy of mind, exquisite sensibility, and sweet docility of manners supposed to be the sexual characteristics of the weaker vessel, I wish to show that elegance is inferior to virtue, that the first object of laudable ambition is to obtain a character as a human being, regardless of the distinction of sex, and that secondary views should be brought to this simple touchstone. This is a rough sketch of my plan, and I should express my conviction with the energetic emotions that I feel whenever I think of the subject. The dictates of experience and reflection will be felt by some of my readers. Animated by this important object, I shall disdain to call my phrases or polish my style. I aim at being useful, and sincerity will render me unaffected. For wishing rather to persuade by the force of my arguments than dazzle by the elegance of my language, I shall not waste my time in rounding periods nor in fabricating the turgid bombast of artificial feelings, which, coming from the head, never reach the heart. I shall be employed about things, not words, and anxious to render my sex more respectable members of society, I shall try to avoid that flowery diction which is slided from essays into novels and from novels into familiar letters and conversation. These pretty nothings, these caricatures of the real beauty of sensibility, dropping glibly from the tongue, vitiate the taste, and create a kind of sickly delicacy that turns away from simple unadorned truth, and a deluge of false sentiments and overstretched feelings stifling the natural emotions of the heart, render the domestic pleasures insipid, that ought to sweeten the exercise of those severe duties, 
which educate a rational and immortal being for a nobler field of action. The education of women has, of late, been more attended to than formerly, yet they are still reckoned a frivolous sex, and ridiculed or pitied by the writers who endeavor by satire or instruction to improve them. It is acknowledged that they spend many of the first years of their lives in acquiring a smattering of accomplishments. Meanwhile, strength of body and mind are sacrificed to libertine notions of beauty, to the desire of establishing themselves, the only way women can rise in the world, by marriage. And this desire making mere animals of them, when they marry, they act such as children may be expected to act. They dress, they paint, and nickname God's creatures. Surely these weak beings are only fit for the seraglio. Can they govern a family, or take care of the poor babes whom they bring into the world? If it then can be fairly deduced from the present conduct of the sex, from the prevalent fondness for pleasure which takes place of ambition in those nobler passions that open and enlarge the soul, that the instruction which women have received has only tended, with the constitution of civil society, to render them insignificant objects of desire, mere propagators of fools. If it can be proved that in aiming to accomplish them without cultivating their understandings, they are taken out of their sphere of duties and made ridiculous and useless when the short-lived bloom of beauty is over, I presume that rational men will excuse me for endeavoring to persuade them to become more masculine and respectable. Footnote. A lively writer, I cannot recall his name, asks, what business women turned to forty have to do in the world? Indeed, the word masculine is only a bugbear. There is little reason to fear that women will acquire too much courage or fortitude, for their apparent inferiority with respect to bodily strength must render them in some degree dependent on men in the various relations of life. But why should it be increased by prejudices that give a sex to virtue, and confound simple truths with sensual reveries? Women are, in fact, so much degraded by mistaken notions of female excellence that I do not mean to add a paradox when I assert that this artificial weakness produces a propensity to tyrannize and gives birth to cunning, the natural opponent of strength, which leads them to play off those contemptible infantile airs that undermine esteem even while they excite desire. Do not foster these prejudices, and they will naturally fall into their subordinate yet respectable station in life. It seems scarcely necessary to say that I now speak of the sex in general. Many individuals have more sense than their male relatives, and as nothing preponderates where there is a constant struggle for an equilibrium, without it has naturally more gravity. Some women govern their husbands without degrading themselves, because intellect will always govern. End of the introduction. Chapter 1 of Vindication of the Rights of Woman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Vindication of the Rights of Woman by Mary Wollstonecraft Chapter 1 The Rights and Involved Duties of Mankind Considered in the present state of society, it appears necessary to go back to first principles in search of the most simple truths, and to dispute with some prevailing prejudice every inch of ground. To clear my way, I must be allowed to ask some plain questions, and the answers will probably appear as unequivocal as the axioms on which reasoning is built. Though, when entangled with various motives of action, they are formally contradicted, either by the words or conduct of men. In what does man's preeminence over the brute creation consist? The answer is as clear as that a half is less than the whole, in reason. What acquirement exalts one being above another? Virtue, we spontaneously reply. For what purpose were the passions implanted? that man by struggling with them might attain a degree of knowledge denied to the brutes, whispers experience. Consequently, the perfection of our nature and capability of happiness must be estimated by the degree of reason, virtue and knowledge that distinguish the individual and direct the laws which bind society. 
and that from the exercise of reason, knowledge and virtue naturally flow, is equally undeniable, if mankind be viewed collectively. The rights and duties of man thus simplified, it seems almost impertinent to attempt to illustrate truths that appear so incontrovertible. Yet such deeply rooted prejudices have clouded reason, and such spurious qualities have assumed the name of virtues, that it is necessary to pursue the course of reason, as it has been perplexed and involved in error, by various adventitious circumstances, comparing the simple axiom with casual deviations. Men, in general, seem to employ their reason to justify prejudices which they have imbibed, they cannot trace how, rather than to root them out. The mind must be strong that resolutely forms its own principles, for a kind of intellectual cowardice prevails, which makes many men shrink from the task, or only do it by halves. Yet the imperfect conclusions thus drawn are frequently very plausible, because they are built on partial experience, on just, though narrow, views. Going back to first principles, vice skulks with all its native deformity from close investigation. But a set of shallow reasoners are always exclaiming that these arguments prove too much, and that a measure rotten at the core may be expedient. Thus expediency is continually contrasted with simple principles, till truth is lost in a mist of words, virtue in forms, and knowledge rendered a sounding nothing by the specious prejudices that assume its name. That the society is formed in the wisest manner, whose constitution is founded on the nature of man, strikes, in the abstract, every thinking being so forcibly that it looks like presumption to endeavour to bring forward proofs, though proof must be brought, or the stronghold of prescription will never be forced by reason. Yet to urge prescription as an argument to justify the depriving men or women of their natural rights is one of the absurd sophisms which daily insult common sense. The civilization of the bulk of the people of Europe is very partial. Nay, it may be made a question whether they have acquired any virtues in exchange for innocence, equivalent to the misery produced by the vices that have been plastered over unsightly ignorance, and the freedom which has been bartered for splendid slavery. The desire of dazzling by riches the most certain preeminence that man can obtain, the pleasure of commanding flattering sycophants, and many other complicated low calculations of doting self-love, have all contributed to overwhelm the mass of mankind, and make liberty a convenient handle for mock patriotism. For whilst rank and titles are held of the utmost importance, before which genius... Quote, must hide its diminished head, unquote. it is, with a few exceptions, very unfortunate for a nation when a man of abilities, without rank or property, pushes himself forward to notice. Alas, what unheard of misery have thousands suffered to purchase a cardinal's hat for an intriguing, obscure adventurer, who longed to be ranked with princes, or lord it over them by seizing the triple crown. Such indeed has been the wretchedness that has flowed from hereditary honours, riches and monarchy, that men of lively sensibility have almost uttered blasphemy in order to justify the dispensations of providence. Man has been held out as independent of his power who made him, or as a lawless planet darting from its orbit, to steal the celestial fire of reason, and the vengeance of heaven lurking in the subtile flame sufficiently punished his temerity by introducing evil into the world. 
impressed by this view of the misery and disorder which pervaded society, and fatigued with jostling against artificial fools, Rousseau became enamoured of solitude, and being at the same time an optimist, he labours with uncommon eloquence to prove that man was naturally a solitary animal. Misled by his respect for the goodness of God, who certainly, for what man of sense and feeling can doubt it, gave life only to communicate happiness, he considers evil as positive and the work of man, not aware that he was exalting one attribute at the expense of another, equally necessary to divine perfection. Reared on a false hypothesis, his arguments in favour of a state of nature are plausible but unsound. I say unsound, for to assert that a state of nature is preferable to civilization in all its possible perfection is, in other words, to arraign supreme wisdom, and the paradoxical exclamation that God has made all things right, and that evil has been introduced by the creature whom he formed, knowing what he formed, is as unphilosophical as impious. When that wise being, who created us and placed us here, saw the fair idea, he willed, by allowing it to be so, that the passions should unfold our reason, because he could see that present evil would produce future good. Could the helpless creature whom he called from nothing break loose from his providence and boldly learn to know good by practising evil without his permission, no, how could that energetic advocate for immortality argue so inconsistently? Had mankind remained forever in the brutal state of nature, which even his magic pen cannot paint as a state in which a single virtue took root, it would have been clear, though not to the sensitive, unreflecting wanderer, that man was born to run the circle of life and death, and adorn God's garden for some purpose which could not easily be reconciled with his attributes. But if, to crown the whole, there were to be rational creatures produced, allowed to rise in excellency by the exercise of powers implanted for that purpose, if benignity itself thought fit to call into existence a creature above the brutes, who could think and improve himself, why should that inestimable gift, for a gift it was if a man was so created as to have a capacity to rise above the state in which sensation produced brutal ease, be called in direct terms a curse? A curse it might be reckoned if all our existence was bounded by our continuance in this world, for why should the gracious fountain of life give us passions and the power of reflecting, only to embitter our days and inspire us with mistaken notions of dignity? Why should he lead us from love of ourselves to the sublime emotions which the discovery of his wisdom and goodness excites, if these feelings were not set in motion to improve our nature, of which they make a part, and render us capable of enjoying a more godlike portion of happiness. Firmly persuaded that no evil exists in the world that God did not design to take place, I build my belief on the perfection of God. Rousseau exerts himself to prove that all was right originally. A crowd of authors that all is now right, and I that all will be right. But, true to his first position, next to a state of nature, Rousseau celebrates barbarism, and, apostrophizing the shade of Fabricius, he forgets that, in conquering the world, the Romans never dreamed of establishing their own liberty on a firm basis, or of extending the reign of virtue. Eager to support his system, he stigmatizes as vicious every effort of genius, and uttering the apotheosis of savage virtues, he exalts those to demigods who were scarcely human, the brutal Spartans, 
who in defiance of justice and gratitude sacrificed in cold blood the slaves that had shown themselves men to rescue their oppressors. Disgusted with artificial manners and virtues, the citizen of Geneva, instead of properly sifting the subject, threw away the wheat with the chaff, without waiting to inquire whether the evils which his ardent soul turned from indignantly were the consequence of civilization or the vestiges of barbarism. He saw vice trampling on virtue and the semblance of goodness taking place of the reality. He saw talents bent by power to sinister purposes and never thought of tracing the gigantic mischief up to arbitrary power, up to the hereditary distinctions that clash with the mental superiority that naturally raises a man above his fellows. He did not perceive that the regal power, in a few generations, introduces idiotism into the noble stem, and holds out baits to render thousands idle and vicious. Nothing can set the regal character in a more contemptible point of view than the various crimes that have elevated men to the supreme dignity. Vile intrigues, unnatural crimes, and every vice that degrades our nature have been the steps to this distinguished eminence. Yet millions of men have supinely allowed the nerveless limbs of the posterity of such rapacious prowlers to rest quietly on their ensanguined thrones. What but a pestilential vapour can hover over society when its chief director is only instructed in the invention of crimes or the stupid routine of childish ceremonies? Will men never be wise? Will they never cease to expect corn from tares and figs from thistles? It is impossible for any man, when the most favourable circumstances concur, to acquire sufficient knowledge and strength of mind to discharge the duties of a king entrusted with uncontrolled power. How then must they be violated when his very elevation is an insuperable bar to the attainment of either wisdom or virtue, when all the feelings of a man are stifled by flattery and reflection shut out by pleasure. Surely it is madness to make the fate of thousands depend on the caprice of a weak fellow-creature, whose very station sinks him necessarily below the meanest of his subjects. But one power should not be thrown down to exalt another, for all power intoxicates weak man and its abuse proves that the more equality there is established among men, the more virtue and happiness will reign in society. But this, and any similar maxim deduced from simple reason, raises an outcry. The church or the state is in danger, if faith in the wisdom of antiquity is not implicit, and they who, roused by the sight of human calamity, dare to attack human authority, are reviled as despisers of God and enemies of man. These are bitter calumnies, yet they reached one of the best men, Dr. Price, whose ashes still preach peace, and whose memory demands a respectful pause when subjects are discussed that lay so near his heart. After attacking the sacred majesty of kings, I shall scarcely excite surprise by adding my firm persuasion that every profession in which great subordination of rank constitutes its power is highly injurious to morality. A standing army, for instance, is incompatible with freedom, because subordination and rigour are the very sinews of military discipline, and despotism is necessary to give vigour to enterprises that one will directs. A spirit inspired by romantic notions of honour, a kind of morality founded on the fashion of the age, can only be felt by a few officers, whilst the main body must be moved by command, like the waves of the sea. 
for the strong wind of authority pushes the crowd of subalterns forward, they scarcely know or care why, with headlong fury. Besides, nothing can be so prejudicial to the morals of the inhabitants of country towns as the occasional residence of a set of idle, superficial young men, whose only occupation is gallantry, and whose polished manners render vice more dangerous by concealing its deformity under gay ornamental drapery. An air of fashion, which is but a badge of slavery, and proves that the soul has not a strong individual character, awes simple country people into an imitation of the vices, when they cannot catch the slippery graces of politeness. Every core is a chain of despots, who, submitting and tyrannizing without exercising their reason, become dead weights of vice and folly on the community. A man of rank or fortune, sure of rising by interest, has nothing to do but to pursue some extravagant freak, whilst the needy gentleman, who is to rise, as the phrase turns by his merit, becomes a servile parasite or vile panda. Sailors, the naval gentlemen, come under the same description, only their vices assume a different and a grosser caste. They are more positively indolent when not discharging the ceremonials of their station, whilst the insignificant fluttering of soldiers may be termed active idleness. More confined to the society of men, the former acquire a fondness for humour and mischievous tricks, whilst the latter, mixing frequently with well-bred women, catch a sentimental cant. But mind is equally out of the question whether they indulge the horse laugh or the polite simper. May I be allowed to extend the comparison to a profession where more mind is certainly to be found, for the clergy have superior opportunities of improvement, though subordination almost equally cramps their faculties. The blind submission imposed at college to forms of belief serves as a novitiate to the curate who most obsequiously respects the opinion of his rector or patron, if he means to rise in his profession. Perhaps there cannot be a more forcible contrast than between the servile, dependent gait of a poor curate and the courtly mien of a bishop, and the respect and contempt they inspire render the discharge of their separate functions equally useless. It is of great importance to observe that the character of every man is in some degree formed by his profession. A man of sense may only have a cast of countenance that wears off as you trace his individuality, whilst the weak, common man has scarcely ever any character but what belongs to the body. At least all his opinions have been so steeped in the vat consecrated by authority that the faint spirit which the grape of his own vine yields cannot be distinguished. Society, therefore, as it becomes more enlightened, should be very careful not to establish bodies of men who must necessarily be made foolish or vicious by the very constitution of their profession. In the infancy of society, when men were just emerging out of barbarism, chiefs and priests, touching the most powerful springs of savage conduct, hope and fear, must have had unbounded sway. An aristocracy, of course, is naturally the first form of government. But clashing interests soon losing their equipoise, a monarchy and hierarchy break out of the confusion of ambitious struggles, and the foundation of both is secured by feudal tenures. This appears to be the origin of monarchical and priestly power, and the dawn of civilization. But such combustible materials cannot long be pent up, and getting vent in foreign wars and intestine insurrections, the people acquire some power in the tumult, which obliges their rulers to gloss over their oppression with a show of right. Thus, as wars, 
agriculture, commerce and literature expands the mind, despots are compelled to make convert corruption hold fast the power which was formerly snatched by open force. Footnote. Men of abilities scatter seeds that grow up, and have a great influence on the forming opinion, and when once the public opinion preponderates, through the exertion of reason, the overthrow of arbitrary power is not very distant. End of footnote. And this baneful lurking gangrene is most quickly spread by luxury and superstition, the sure dregs of ambition. The indolent puppet of a court first becomes a luxurious monster or fastidious sensualist, and then makes the contagion which his unnatural state spreads the instrument of tyranny. It is the pestiferous purple which renders the progress of civilization a curse and warps the understanding, till men of sensibility doubt whether the expansion of intellect produces a greater portion of happiness or misery. But the nature of the poison points out the antidote, and had Rousseau mounted one step higher in his investigation, or could his eye have pierced through the foggy atmosphere which he almost disdained to breathe, his active mind would have darted forward to contemplate the perfection of man in the establishment of true civilization, instead of taking his ferocious flight back to the night of sensual ignorance. End of chapter 1「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Carl Manchester, 2006. A Vindication of the Rights of Woman With Strictures on Political and Moral Subjects By Mary Wollstonecraft, 1792 Chapter 2 The Prevailing Opinion of a Sexual Character Discussed to account for and excuse the tyranny of man, many ingenious arguments have been brought forward to prove that the two sexes, in the acquirement of virtue, ought to aim at attaining a very different character. Or, to speak explicitly, women are not allowed to have sufficient strength of mind to acquire what really deserves the name of virtue. Yet it should seem, allowing them to have souls, that there is but one way appointed by providence to lead mankind to either virtue or happiness. If, then, women are not a swarm of ephemeral triflers, why should they be kept in ignorance under the specious name of innocence? Men complain, and with reason, of the follies and caprices of our sex, when they do not keenly satirise our headstrong passions and grovelling vices. Behold, I should answer, the natural effect of ignorance. The mind will ever be unstable, that has only prejudices to rest on, and the current will run with destructive fury, when there are no barriers to break its force. Women are told from their infancy, and taught by the example of their mothers, that a little knowledge of human weakness, justly termed cunning, softness of temper, outward obedience, and a scrupulous attention to a puerile kind of propriety, will obtain for them the protection of man. And should they be beautiful, everything else is needless, for at least twenty years of their lives. Thus Milton describes our first frail mother, Though when he tells us that women are formed for softness and sweet attractive grace, I cannot comprehend his meaning, unless, in the true Mahometan strain, he meant to deprive us of souls, and insinuate that we were beings only designed by sweet attractive grace, and docile blind obedience, to gratify the senses of man, when he can no longer soar on the wing of contemplation. How grossly do they insult us, who thus advise us only to render ourselves gentle domestic brutes, for instance, the winning softness so warmly and frequently recommended that governs by obeying. What childish expressions, and how insignificant is the being? Can it be an immortal one, who will condescend to govern by such sinister methods? Certainly, says Lord Bacon, man is of kin to the beast by his body, and if he be not of kin to God by his spirit, he is a base and ignoble creature. Men, indeed, appear to me to act in a very unphilosophical manner 
when they try to secure the good conduct of women by attempting to keep them always in a state of childhood. Rousseau was more consistent when he wished to stop the progress of reason in both sexes, for if men eat of the tree of knowledge, women will come in for a taste. But from the imperfect cultivation which their understandings now receive, they only attain a knowledge of evil. Children, I grant, should be innocent. But when the epithet is applied to men or women, it is but a civil term for weakness. For if it be allowed that women were destined by providence to acquire human virtues, and by the exercise of their understanding, that stability of character which is the firmest ground to rest our future hopes upon, they must be permitted to turn to the fountain of light, and not forced to shape their course by the twinkling of a mere satellite. Milton, I grant, was of a very different opinion, for he only bends to the indefeasible right of beauty, though it would be difficult to render two passages, which I now mean to contrast, consistent, but into similar inconsistencies are great men often led by their senses. To whom thus Eve with perfect beauty adorned, my author and disposer, what thou bidst, unargued I obey, so God ordains. God is thy law, thou mine, to know no more, is woman's happiest knowledge and her praise. These are exactly the arguments that I have used to children, but I have added, your reason is now gaining strength, and till it arrives at some degree of maturity, you must look up to me for advice, then you ought to think and only rely on God. Yet in the following lines, Milton seems to coincide with me, when he makes Adam thus expostulate with his maker. Hast thou not made me here thy substitute, and these inferior far beneath me set? Among unequals what society can sort, what harmony or true delight? Which must be mutual, in proportion due, given and received, but in disparity? The one intense, the other still remiss. Cannot well suit with either, but soon prove tedious alike, a fellowship I speak, such as I seek fit to participate, all rational delight. In treating, therefore, of the manners of women, let us, disregarding sensual arguments, trace what we should endeavour to make them in order to cooperate, if the expression be not too bold, with the supreme being. By individual education, I mean, for the sense of the word is not precisely defined, such an attention to a child as will slowly sharpen the senses, form the temper, regulate the passions as they begin to ferment, and set the understanding to work before the body arrives at maturity, so that the man may only have to proceed, not to begin, the important task of learning to think and reason. To prevent any misconstruction, I must add that I do not believe that a private education can work the wonders which some sanguine writers have attributed to it, Men and women must be educated in a great degree by the opinions and manners of the society they live in. In every age there has been a stream of popular opinion that has carried all before it, and given a family character, as it were, to the century. It may then fairly be inferred that till society be differently constituted, much cannot be expected from education. It is, however, sufficient for my present purpose to assert that whatever effect circumstances have on the abilities, every being may become virtuous by the exercise of its own reason. For if but one being was created with vicious inclinations, that is positively bad. What can save us from atheism? Or, if we worship a god, is not that god a devil? Consequently, the most perfect education, in my opinion, is such an exercise of the understanding as is best calculated to strengthen the body and form the heart. Or, in other words, to enable the individual to attain such habits of virtue as will render it independent. In fact, it is a farce to call any being virtuous whose virtues do not result from the exercise of its own reason. This was Rousseau's opinion respecting men. I extend it to women, and confidently assert that they have been drawn out of their sphere by false refinement and not by an endeavour to acquire masculine qualities. Still the regal homage which they receive is so intoxicating that till the manners of the times are changed and formed on more reasonable principles, it may be impossible to convince them that the illegitimate power which they obtain by degrading themselves is a curse, 
and that they must return to nature and equality if they wish to secure the placid satisfaction that unsophisticated affections impart. But for this epoch we must wait, wait perhaps till kings and nobles, enlightened by reason, and preferring the real dignity of man to childish state, throw off their gaudy hereditary trappings. And if then women do not resign the arbitrary power of beauty, they will prove that they have less mind than man. I may be accused of arrogance. Still, I must declare what I firmly believe, that all the writers who have written on the subject of female education and manners, from Rousseau to Dr. Gregory, have contributed to render women more artificial, weak characters than they would otherwise have been, and consequently more useless members of society. I might have expressed this conviction in a lower key, but I am afraid it would have been the wine of affectation, and not the faithful expression of my feelings. Of the clear result which experience and reflection have led me to draw. When I come to that division of the subject, I shall avert the passages that I more particularly disapprove of in the works of the authors I have just alluded to. But it is first necessary to observe that my objection extends to the whole purport of those books, which tend, in my opinion, to degrade one half of the human species and render women pleasing at the expense of every solid virtue. Though to reason on Rousseau's ground, if man did attain a degree of perfection of mind when his body arrived at maturity, it might be proper, in order to make a man and his wife one, that she should rely entirely on his understanding, and the graceful ivy, clasping the oak that supported it, would form a whole, in which strength and beauty would be equally conspicuous. But alas, husbands as well as their helpmates are often only overgrown children, nay, thanks to early debauchery, scarcely men in their outward form, and if the blind lead the blind, one need not come from heaven to tell us the consequence. Many are the causes that, in the present corrupt state of society, contribute to enslave women by cramping their understandings and sharpening their senses. One, perhaps, that silently does more mischief than all the rest is their disregard of order. To do everything in an orderly manner is a most important precept, which women, who generally speaking receive only a disorderly kind of education, seldom attend to with that degree of exactness that men, who from their infancy are broken into method, observe. This negligent kind of guesswork, for what other epithet can be used to point out the random exertions of a sort of instinctive common sense never brought to the test of reason, prevents their generalising matters of fact, so they do today what they did yesterday, merely because they did it yesterday. This contempt of the understanding in early life has more baneful consequences than is commonly supposed. For the little knowledge which women of strong minds attain is from various circumstances of a more desultory kind than the knowledge of men, and it is acquired more by sheer observations on real life than from comparing what has been individually observed with the results of experience generalised by speculation. Led by their dependent situation and domestic employments more into society, what they learn is rather by snatches. And as learning is with them, in general, only a secondary thing, they do not pursue any one branch with that persevering ardour necessary to give vigour to the faculties and clearness to the judgment. In the present state of society, a little learning is required to support the character of a gentleman, and boys are obliged to submit to a few years of discipline. But in the education of women, the cultivation of the understanding is always subordinate to the acquirement of some corporeal accomplishment. Even while enervated by confinement and false notions of modesty, the body is prevented from attaining that grace and beauty which relaxed half-formed limbs never exhibit. Besides, in youth their faculties are not brought forward by emulation, having no serious scientific study. If they have natural sagacity, it is turned too soon on life and manners. They dwell on effects and modifications without tracing them back to causes, and complicated rules to adjust behaviour are a weak substitute for simple principles. As a proof that education gives this appearance of weakness to females, we may instance the example of military men, who are, like them, sent into the world before their minds have been stored with knowledge or fortified by principles. The consequences are similar. Soldiers acquire a little superficial knowledge snatched from the muddy current of conversation and from continually mixing with society they gain what is termed a knowledge of the world 
and this acquaintance with manners and customs has frequently been confounded with a knowledge of the human heart. But can the crude fruit of casual observation, never brought to the test of judgment, formed by comparing speculation and experience, deserve such a distinction? Soldiers as well as women practice the minor virtues with punctilious politeness. Where is then the sexual difference, when the education has been the same? All the difference I can discern arises from the superior advantage of liberty which enables the former to see more of life. It is wandering from my present subject, perhaps, to make a political remark, but as it was produced naturally by the train of my reflections, I shall not pass it silently over. Standing armies can never consist of resolute, robust men. They may be well-disciplined machines, but they will seldom contain men under the influence of strong passions, or with very vigorous faculties. And as for any depth of understanding, I will venture to affirm that it is as rarely to be found in the army as amongst women. And the cause, I maintain, is the same. It may be further observed that officers are also particularly attentive to their persons, fond of dancing, crowded rooms, adventures and ridicule. Footnote. Why should women be censured with petulant acrimony? because they seem to have a passion for a scarlet coat. Has not education placed them more on a level with soldiers than any other class of men? End footnote. Like the fair sex, the business of their lives is gallantry. They are taught to please, and they only live to please. Yet they do not lose their rank in the distinction of sexes, for they are still reckoned superior to women, though in what their superiority consists, beyond what I have just mentioned, it is difficult to discover. The great misfortune is this, that they both acquire manners before morals and a knowledge of life before they have, from reflection, any acquaintance with the grand ideal outline of human nature. The consequence is natural. Satisfied with common nature, they become a prey to prejudices, and taking all their opinions on credit, they blindly submit to authority, so that, if they have any sense, it is a kind of instinctive glance that catches proportions and decides with respect to manners, but fails when arguments are to be pursued below the surface or opinions analysed. May not the same remark be applied to women? Nay, the argument may be carried still further, for they are both thrown out of a useful station by the unnatural distinctions established in civilised life. Riches and hereditary honours have made ciphers of women to give consequence to the numerical figure, and idleness has produced a mixture of gallantry and despotism into society, which leads the very men who are the slaves of their mistresses to tyrannise over their sisters, wives and daughters. This is only keeping them in rank and file, it is true. Strengthen the female mind by enlarging it, and there will be an end to blind obedience. But, as blind obedience is ever sought for by power, tyrants and sensualists are in the right way when they endeavour to keep women in the dark, because the former only want slaves, and the latter a plaything. The sensualist, indeed, has been the most dangerous of tyrants, and women have been duped by their lovers as princes by their ministers, whilst dreaming that they reigned over them. I now principally allude to Rousseau, for his character of Sophia is undoubtedly a captivating one, though it appears to me grossly unnatural. However, it is not the superstructure, but the foundation of her character, the principles on which her education was built, that I mean to attack, Nay, warmly as I admire the genius of that able writer, whose opinions I shall often have occasion to cite, indignation always takes place of admiration, and the rigid frown of insulted virtue effaces the smile of complacency which his eloquent periods are wont to raise, when I read his voluptuous reveries. Is this the man who, in his ardour for virtue, would banish all the soft arts of peace, and almost carry us back to Spartan discipline? Is this the man who delights to paint the useful struggles of passion, the triumphs of good dispositions, and the heroic flights which carry the glowing soul out of itself? How are these mighty sentiments lowered when he describes the pretty foot and enticing airs of his little favourite? But for the present I waive the subject, and instead of severely reprehending the transient effusions of overweening sensibility, I shall only observe that whoever has cast a benevolent eye on society must often have been gratified by the sight of a humble mutual love, not dignified by sentiment or strengthened by a union in intellectual pursuits. 
the domestic trifles of the day have afforded matters for cheerful converse, and innocent caresses have softened toils which did not require great exercise of mind or stretch of thought. Yet has not the sight of this moderate felicity excited more tenderness than respect? An emotion similar to what we feel when children are playing or animals sporting. Footnote. Similar feelings has Milton's pleasing picture of paradisiacal happiness ever raised in my mind. Yet instead of envying the lovely pair, I have with conscious dignity or satanic pride turned to hell for sublimer objects. In the same style, when viewing some noble monument of human art, I have traced the emanation of the deity in the order I admired, till, descending from that giddy height, I have caught myself contemplating the grandest of all human sights. For fancy quickly placed in some solitary recess an outcast of fortune, rising superior to passion and discontent. End footnote. Whilst the contemplation of the noble struggles of suffering merit has raised admiration and carried our thoughts to that world where sensation will give place to reason. Women are, therefore, to be considered either as moral beings or so weak that they must be entirely subjected to the superior faculties of men. Let us examine this question. Rousseau declares that a woman should never for a moment feel herself independent, that she should be governed by fear to exercise her natural cunning and made a coquettish slave in order to render her a more alluring object of desire, a sweeter companion to man whenever he chooses to relax himself. He carries the arguments, which he pretends to draw from the indications of nature, still further, and insinuates that truth and fortitude the cornerstones of all human virtue, should be cultivated with certain restrictions, because, with respect to the female character, obedience is the grand lesson which ought to be impressed with unrelenting vigour. What nonsense! When will a great man arise with sufficient strength of mind to puff away the fumes which pride and sensuality have thus spread over the subject? If women are by nature inferior to men, their virtues must be the same in quality, if not in degree, or virtue is a relative idea. Consequently, their conduct should be founded on the same principles and have the same aim. Connected with man as daughters, wives and mothers, their moral character may be estimated by their manner of fulfilling those simple duties. But the end, the grand end of their exertions, should be to unfold their own faculties and acquire the dignity of conscious virtue. They may try to render their road pleasant, but ought never to forget, in common with man, that life yields not the felicity which can satisfy an immortal soul. I do not mean to insinuate that either sex should be so lost in abstract reflections or distant views as to forget the affections and duties that lie before them, and are, in truth, the means appointed to produce the fruit of life. On the contrary, I would warmly recommend them, even while I assert that they afford most satisfaction when they are considered in their true sober light. Probably the prevailing opinion that woman was created for man, may have taken its rise from Moses's poetical story. Yet, as very few, it is presumed, who have bestowed any serious thought on the subject, ever supposed that Eve was, literally speaking, one of Adam's ribs, the deduction must be allowed to fall to the ground, or only be so far admitted as it proves that man, from the remotest antiquity, found it convenient to exert his strength to subjugate his companion, and his invention to show that she ought to have her neck bent under the yoke, because the whole creation was only created for his convenience or pleasure. Let it not be concluded that I wish to invert the order of things. I have already granted that from the constitution of their bodies men seem to be designed by providence to attain a greater degree of virtue. I speak collectively of the whole sex but I see not the shadow of a reason to conclude that their virtue should differ in respect to their nature. In fact, how can they if virtue has only one eternal standard? I must therefore, if I reason consequentially, as strenuously maintain that they have the same simple direction as that there is a God. It follows, then, that cunning should not be opposed to wisdom, little cares to great exertions, or insipid softness varnished over with the name of gentleness to that fortitude which grand views alone can inspire. I shall be told that woman would then lose many of her peculiar graces, and the opinion of a well-known poet might be quoted to refute my unqualified assertion. The Pope has said in the name of the whole male sex, Yet ne'er so sure are passions to create, as when she touched the brink of all we hate. 
in what light this sally places men and women, I shall leave to the judicious to determine. Meanwhile, I shall content myself with observing that I cannot discover why, unless they are mortal, females should always be degraded by being made subservient to love or lust. To speak disrespectfully of love is, I know, high treason against sentiment and fine feelings, but I wish to speak the simple language of truth, and rather to address the head than the heart. To endeavour to reason love out of the world would be to out Quixote Cervantes and equally offend against common sense, but an endeavour to restrain this tumultuous passion and to prove that it should not be allowed to dethrone superior powers or to usurp the sceptre which the understanding should ever coolly wield appears less wild. Youth is the season for love in both sexes, but in those days of thoughtless enjoyment provision should be made for the more important years of life when reflection takes place of sensation. But Rousseau, and most of the male writers who have followed his steps, have warmly inculcated that the whole tendency of female education ought to be directed to one point, to render them pleasing. Let me reason with the supporters of this opinion who have any knowledge of human nature. Do they imagine that marriage can eradicate the habitude of life? The woman who has only been taught to please will soon find that her charms are oblique sunbeams, and that they cannot have much effect on her husband's heart when they are seen every day, when the summer is past and gone. Will she then have sufficient native energy to look into herself for comfort and cultivate her dormant faculties? Or is it not more rational to expect that she will try to please other men and, in the emotions raised by the expectation of new conquests, endeavour to forget the mortification her love or pride has received? When the husband ceases to be a lover and the time will inevitably come, her desire of pleasing will then grow languid or become a spring of bitterness, and love, perhaps the most effervescent of all passions, gives place to jealousy or vanity. I now speak of women who are restrained by principle or prejudice. Such women, though they would shrink from an intrigue with real abhorrence, yet nevertheless wish to be convinced by the homage of gallantry that they are cruelly neglected by their husbands, or days and weeks are spent in dreaming of the happiness enjoyed by congenial souls till their health is undermined, and their spirits broken by discontent. How then can the great art of pleasing be such a necessary study? It is only useful to a mistress. The chaste wife and serious mother should only consider her power to please as the polish of her virtues, and the affection of her husband as one of the comforts that render her task less difficult and her life happier. But, whether she be loved or neglected, her first wish should be to make herself respectable, and not rely for her happiness on a being subject to like infirmities with herself. The worthy Dr Gregory fell into a similar error. I respect his heart, but entirely disapprove of his celebrated legacy to his daughters. He advises them to cultivate a fondness for dress, because a fondness for dress, he asserts, is natural to them. I am unable to comprehend what either he or Rousseau meant when they frequently use this indefinite term. If they told us that in a pre-existent state the soul was fond of dress and brought this inclination with it into a new body, I should listen to them with a half-smile, as I often do when I hear a rant about innate elegance. But if he only meant to say that the exercise of the faculties will produce this fondness, I deny it. It is not natural, but arises, like false ambition in men, from a love of power. Dr Gregory goes much further. He actually recommends dissimulation and advises an innocent girl to give the lie to her feelings and not dance with spirit when gaiety of heart would make her feel eloquent without making her gestures immodest. In the name of truth and common sense, why should not one woman acknowledge that she can take more exercise than another? Or, in other words, that she has a sound constitution and why, to damp innocent vivacity, is she darkly to be told that men will draw conclusions which she little thinks of? Let the libertine draw what inference he pleases, but I hope that no sensible mother will restrain the natural frankness of youth by instilling such indecent cautions. Out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. And a wiser than Solomon has said that the heart should be made clean and not trivial ceremonies observed, which it is not very difficult to fulfil with scrupulous exactness when vice reigns in the heart. Women ought to endeavour to purify their heart. 
but can they do so when their uncultivated understandings make them entirely dependent on their senses for employment and amusement when no noble pursuit sets them above the vanities of the day or enables them to curb the wild emotions that agitate a reed over which every passing breeze has power to gain the affections of a virtuous man is affectation necessary nature has given woman a weaker frame than man but to ensure her husband's affections must a wife who by the exercise of her mind and body while she was discharging the duties of a daughter wife and mother has allowed her constitution to retain its natural strength and her nerves a healthy tone is she i say to condescend to use art and feign a sickly delicacy in order to secure her husband's affection weakness may excite tenderness and gratify the arrogant pride of man but the lordly caresses of a protector will not gratify a noble mind that pants for and deserves to be respected fondness is a poor substitute for friendship in a seraglio i grant that all these arts are unnecessary the epicure must have his palate tickled or he will sink into apathy but have women so little ambition as to be satisfied with such a condition can they supinely dream life away in the lap of pleasure or the languor of weariness rather than assert their claim to pursue reasonable pleasures and render themselves conspicuous by practising the virtues which dignify mankind surely she has not an immortal soul who can loiter life away merely employed to adorn her person that she may amuse the languid hours and soften the cares of a fellow creature who is willing to be enlivened by her smiles and tricks when the serious business of life is over besides the woman who strengthens her body and exercises her mind will by managing her family and practising various virtues become the friend and not the humble dependent of her husband and if she by possessing such substantial qualities merit his regard she will not find it necessary to conceal her affection nor to pretend to an unnatural coldness of constitution to excite her husband's passions in fact if we revert to history we shall find that the women who have distinguished themselves have neither been the most beautiful nor the most gentle of their sex nature or to speak with propriety god has made all things right but man has sought him out many inventions to mar the work i now allude to that part of dr gregory's treatise where he advises a wife never to let her husband know the extent of her sensibility or affection voluptuous precaution and as ineffectual as absurd love from its very nature must be transitory to seek for a secret that would render it constant would be as wild a search as for the philosopher's stone or the grand panacea and the discovery would be equally useless or rather pernicious to mankind the most holy band of society is friendship it has been well said by a shrewd satirist that rare as true love is true friendship is still rarer this is an obvious truth and the cause not lying deep will not elude a slight glance of inquiry love the common passion in which chance and sensation take place of choice and reason is in some degree felt by the mass of mankind for it is not necessary to speak at present of the emotions that rise above or sink below love this passion naturally increased by suspense and difficulties draws the mind out of its accustomed state and exalts the affections but the security of marriage allowing the fever of love to subside a healthy temperature is thought insipid only by those who have not sufficient intellect to substitute the calm tenderness of friendship the confidence of respect instead of blind admiration and the sensual emotions of fondness this is must be the course of nature friendship or indifference inevitably succeeds love and this constitution seems perfectly to harmonize with the system of government which prevails in the moral world passions are spurs to action and open the mind but they sink into mere appetites become a personal and momentary gratification when the object is gained and the satisfied mind rests in enjoyment the man who had some virtue whilst he was struggling for a crown often becomes a voluptuous tyrant when it graces his brow and when the lover is not lost in the husband the dotard a prey to childish caprices and fond jealousies 
neglects the serious duties of life, and the caresses which should excite confidence in his children are lavished on the overgrown child, his wife. In order to fulfil the duties of life, and to be able to pursue with vigour the various employments which form the moral character, a master and mistress of a family ought not to continue to love each other with passion. I mean to say that they ought not to indulge those emotions which disturb the order of society and engross the thoughts that should be otherwise employed. The mind that has never been engrossed by one object wants vigour. If it can long be so, it is weak. A mistaken education, a narrow, uncultivated mind and many sexual prejudices tend to make women more constant than men. But for the present I shall not touch on this branch of the subject. I will go still further and advance without dreaming of a paradox that an unhappy marriage is often very advantageous to a family and that the neglected wife is in general the best mother and this would almost always be the consequence if the female mind were more enlarged for it seems to be the common dispensation of providence that what we gain in present enjoyment should be deducted from the treasure of life experience and that when we are gathering the flowers of the day and revelling in pleasure the solid fruit of toil and wisdom should not be caught at the same time the way lies before us we must turn to the right or left and he who will pass life away in bounding from one pleasure to another must not complain if he acquire neither wisdom nor respectability of character supposing for a moment that the soul is not immortal and that man was only created for the present scene i think we should have reason to complain that love infantine fondness ever grew insipid and palled upon the sense let us eat drink and love for tomorrow we die would be in fact the language of reason the morality of life and who but a fool would part with a reality for a fleeting shadow but if awed by observing the improbable powers of the mind we disdain to confine our wishes or thoughts to such a comparatively mean field of action that only appears grand and important as it is connected with a boundless prospect and sublime hopes what necessity is there for falsehood in conduct and why must the sacred majesty of truth be violated to detain a deceitful good that saps the very foundation of virtue why must the female mind be tainted by coquettish arts to gratify the sensualist and prevent love from subsiding into friendship or compassionate tenderness when there are not qualities on which friendship can be built let the honest heart show itself, and reason teach passion to submit to necessity. Or let the dignified pursuit of virtue and knowledge raise the mind above those emotions which rather embitter than sweeten the cup of life when they are not restrained within due bounds. I do not mean to allude to the romantic passion which is the concomitant of genius. Who can clip its wing? But that grand passion not proportioned to the puny enjoyments of life is only true to the sentiment and feeds on itself the passions which have been celebrated for their durability have always been unfortunate they have acquired strength by absence and constitutional melancholy the fancy has hovered round a form of beauty dimly seen but familiarity might have turned admiration into disgust or at least into indifference and allowed the imagination leisure to start fresh game with perfect propriety, according to this view of things, does Rousseau make the mistress of his soul, Eloisa, love Saint Pre, when life was fading before her. But this is no proof of the immortality of the passion. Of the same complexion is Dr. Gregory's advice respecting delicacy of sentiment, which he advises a woman not to acquire if she have determined to marry. This determination, however, perfectly consistent with his former advice he calls indelicate and earnestly persuades his daughters to conceal it though it may govern their conduct as if it were indelicate to have the common appetites of human nature noble morality and consistent with the cautious prudence of a little soul that cannot extend its views beyond the present minute division of existence if all the faculties of woman's mind are only to be cultivated as they respect her dependence on man if, when a husband be obtained, she have arrived at her goal, and meanly proud, rest satisfied with such a paltry crown, let her grovel contentedly, 
scarcely raised by her employments above the animal kingdom. But, if struggling for the prize of her high calling, she looks beyond the present scene, let her cultivate her understanding without stopping to consider what character the husband may have whom she is destined to marry. Let her only determine, without being too anxious about present happiness, to acquire the qualities that ennoble a rational being, and a rough inelegant husband may shock her taste without destroying her peace of mind. She will not model her soul to suit the frailties of her companion, but to bear with them. His character may be a trial, but not an impediment to virtue. If Dr. Gregory confined his remark to romantic expectations of constant love and congenial feelings, he should have recollected that experience will banish what advice can never make us cease to wish for when the imagination is kept alive at the expense of reason. I own it frequently happens that women who have fostered a romantic and natural delicacy of feeling waste their footnote, for example, the herd of novelists, end footnote, lives in imagining how happy they should have been with a husband who could love them with a fervid increasing affection every day and all day, but they might as well pine married as single, and would not be a jot more unhappy with a bad husband than longing for a good one. That a proper education, or, to speak with more precision, a well-stored mind, would enable a woman to support a single life with dignity, I grant, but that she should avoid cultivating her taste, lest her husband should occasionally shock it, is quitting a substance for a shadow. To say the truth, I do not know of what use is an improved taste, if the individual be not rendered more independent of the casualities of life, if new sources of enjoyment, only dependent on the solitary operations of the mind, are not opened. People of taste, married or single, without distinction, will ever be disgusted by various things that touch not less observing minds. On this conclusion, the argument must not be allowed to hinge, but in the whole sum of enjoyment, is taste to be denominated a blessing? The question is whether it produces most pain or pleasure. The answer will decide the propriety of Dr. Gregory's advice, and show how absurd and tyrannic it is thus to lay down a system of slavery, or to attempt to educate moral beings by any other rules than those deduced from pure reason, which apply to the whole species. Gentleness of manners, forbearance and long-suffering are such amiable godlike qualities that in sublime poetic strains the deity has been invested with them, and perhaps no representation of his goodness so strongly fastens on the human affections as those that represent him abundant in mercy and willing to pardon. Gentleness, considered in this point of view, bears on its front all the characteristics of grandeur, combined with the winning graces of condescension. But what a different aspect it assumes when it is the submissive demeanour of dependence, the support of weakness that loves because it wants protection, and is forbearing because it must silently endure injuries, smiling under the lash at which it dare not snarl. Abject as this picture appears, it is the portrait of an accomplished woman, according to the received opinion of female excellence, separated by specious reasoners from human excellence. Or, they, footnote, vide Russo and Swedenborg, end footnote, kindly restore the rib and make one moral being of a man and woman, not forgetting to give her all the submissive charms. How women are to exist in that state where there is to be neither marrying nor giving in marriage, we are not told. For though moralists have agreed that the tenor of life seems to prove that man is prepared by various circumstances for a future state, they constantly concur in advising woman only to provide for the present. Gentleness, docility and a spaniel-like affection are, on this ground, consistently recommended as the cardinal virtues of the sex, and, disregarding the arbitrary economy of nature, one writer has declared that it is masculine for a woman to be melancholy. She was created to be the toy of man, his rattle, and it must jingle in his ears whenever, dismissing reason, he chooses to be amused. To recommend gentleness, indeed, on a broad basis, is strictly philosophical. A frail being should labour to be gentle, but when forbearance confounds right and wrong, it ceases to be a virtue, and however inconvenient it may be found in a companion, that companion will ever be considered as an inferior, and only inspire a vapid tenderness, 
which easily degenerates into contempt. Still, if advice could really make a being gentle, whose natural disposition admitted not of such a fine polish, something towards the advancement of order would be attained. But if, as might quickly be demonstrated, only affection be produced by this indiscriminate counsel, which throws a stumbling block in the way of gradual improvement and true amelioration of temper, the sex is not much benefited by sacrificing solid virtues to the attainment of superficial graces, though for a few years they may procure the individual's regal sway. As a philosopher, I read with indignation the plausible epithets which men use to soften their insults, and as a moralist, I ask what is meant by such heterogeneous associations as fair defects, amiable weaknesses, etc. If there be one criterion of morals, but one archetype for man, women appear to be suspended by destiny, according to the vulgar tale of Mohammed's coffin. They have neither the unerring instinct of brutes, nor are allowed to fix the eye of reason on a perfect model. They were made to be loved, and must not aim at respect, lest they should be hunted out of society as masculine. But to view the subject in another point of view, do passive indolent women make the best wives? Confining our discussion to the present moment of existence, let us see how such weak creatures perform their part. Do the women who, by the attainment of a few superficial accomplishments, have strengthened the prevailing prejudice, merely contribute to the happiness of their husbands? Do they display their charms merely to amuse them? And have women, who have early imbibed notions of passive obedience, sufficient character to manage a family or educate children? So far from it that, after surveying the history of woman, I cannot help agreeing with the severest satirist, considering the sex as the weakest as well as the most oppressed half of the species. What does history disclose but marks of inferiority? And how few women have emancipated themselves from the galling yoke of sovereign man? So few that the exceptions remind me of an ingenious conjecture respecting Newton, that he was probably a being of superior order accidentally caged in a human body. Following the same train of thinking, I have been led to imagine that the few extraordinary women who have rushed in eccentrical directions out of the orbit prescribed to their sex were male spirits, confined by mistake in female frames. But if it be not philosophical to think of sex when the soul is mentioned, the inferiority must depend on the organs, or the heavenly fire which is to ferment the clay is not given in equal portions. But avoiding, as I have hitherto done, any direct comparison of the two sexes collectively, or frankly acknowledging the inferiority of women according to the present appearance of things, I shall only insist that men have increased that inferiority till women are almost sunk below the standard of rational creatures. Let their faculties have room to unfold and their virtues to gain strength and then determine where the whole sex must stand in the intellectual scale. Yet, let it be remembered that for a small number of distinguished women, I do not ask a place. It is difficult for us purblind mortals to say to what height human discoveries and improvements may arrive when the gloom of despotism subsides, which makes us stumble at every step, but when morality shall be settled on a more solid basis, then, without being gifted with a prophetic spirit, I will venture to predict that women will be either the friend or slave of man. We shall not, as at present, doubt whether she is a moral agent or the link which unites man with brutes. But should it then appear that like the brutes they were principally created for the use of man, he will let them patiently bite the bridle and not mock them with empty praise. Or, should their rationality be proved, he will not impede their improvement merely to gratify his sensual appetites. He will not, with all the graces of rhetoric, advise them to submit implicitly their understanding to the guidance of man. He will not, when he treats of the education of women, assert that they ought never to have the free use of reason. Nor would he recommend cunning and dissimulation to beings who are acquiring, in like manner as himself, the virtues of humanity. Surely there can be but one rule of right if morality has an eternal foundation, and whoever sacrifices virtue, strictly so called, to present convenience or whose duty is to act in such a manner, lives only for the passing day and cannot be an accountable creature. 
The poet should have dropped his sneer when he says, If weak women go astray, the stars are more in fault than they. For that they are bound by the adamantine chain of destiny is most certain. If it be proved that they are never to exercise their own reason, never to be independent, never to rise above opinion, or to feel the dignity of a rational will that only bows to God, and often forgets that the universe contains any being but itself, and the model of perfection to which its ardent gaze is turned, to adore tributes that, softened into virtues, may be imitated in kind, though the degree overwhelms the enraptured mind. If, I say, for I would not impress by declamation when reason offers her sober light, if they be really capable of acting like rational creatures, let them not be treated like slaves, or like the brutes who are dependent on the reason of man when they associate with him, but cultivate their minds, give them the salutary sublime curb of principle, and let them attain conscious dignity by feeling themselves only dependent on God. Teach them in common with man to submit to necessity instead of giving, to render them more pleasing a sex, to morals. Further, should experience prove that they cannot attain the same degree of strength of mind, perseverance and fortitude, let their virtues be the same in kind, though they may vainly struggle for the same degree. And the superiority of man will be equally clear, if not clearer, and truth as it is a simple principle which admits of no modification, would be common to both. Nay, the order of society, as it is at present regulated, would not be inverted. For woman would then only have the rank that reason assigned her, and arts could not be practised to bring the balance even, much less to turn it. These may be termed utopian dreams, thanks to that being who impressed them on my soul, and gave me sufficient strength of mind to dare to exert my own reason, till, becoming dependent only on him for the support of my virtue, I view with indignation the mistaken notions that enslave my sex. I love man as my fellow, but his sceptre, real or usurped, extends not to me, unless the reason of an individual demands my homage, and even then the submission is to reason and not to man. In fact, the conduct of an accountable being must be regulated by the operations of its own reason, or on what foundation rests the throne of God. It appears to me necessary to dwell on these obvious truths, because females have been insulated, as it were, and, while they have been stripped of the virtues that should clothe humanity, they have been decked with artificial graces that enable them to exercise a short-lived tyranny. Love, in their bosoms, taking place of every nobler passion, their sole ambition is to be fair, to raise emotion instead of inspiring respect. And this ignoble desire, like the civility in absolute monarchies, destroys all strength of character. Liberty is the mother of virtue. And if women be, by their very constitution, slaves, they must ever languish like exotics and be reckoned beautiful flaws in nature. As to the argument respecting the subjection in which the sex has ever been held, it retorts on man. The many have always been enthralled by the few, and monsters who scarcely have shown any discernment of human excellence have tyrannised over thousands of their fellow creatures. Why have men of superior endowments submitted to such degradation? For is it not universally acknowledged that kings viewed collectively have ever been inferior in abilities and virtue to the same number of men taken from the common mass of mankind? Yet have they not, and are they not still, treated with a degree of reverence that is an insult to reason? China is not the only country where a living man has been made a god. Men have submitted to superior strength to enjoy with impunity the pleasure of the moment. Women have only done the same, and therefore till it is proved that the courtier, who servilely resigns the birthright of a man, is not a moral agent, it cannot be demonstrated that woman is essentially inferior to man because she has always been subjugated. Brutal force has hitherto governed the world, and that the science of politics is in its infancy is evident from philosophers scrupling to give the knowledge most useful to man that determinate distinction. I shall not pursue this argument any further than to establish an obvious inference, that as sound politics diffuse liberty, mankind, including woman, 
will become more wise and virtuous. End of chapter 2 of A Vindication of the Rights of Woman by Mary Wollstonecraft This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri, Los Angeles, California, 2006. Vindication of the Rights of Women by Mary Wollstonecraft. Chapter 3. The Same Subject Continued. Bodily strength from being the distinction of heroes is now sunk into such unmerited contempt that men as well as women seem to think it unnecessary. The latter, as it takes from their feminine graces, and from that lovely weakness, the source of their undue power, and the former, because it appears inimical with the character of a gentleman. That they have both, by departing from one extreme run into another, may easily be proved, but it first may be proper to observe that a vulgar error has obtained a degree of credit which has given force to a false conclusion, in which an effect has been mistaken for a cause. People of genius have very frequently impaired their constitutions by study, or careless in attention to their health, and the violence of their passions bearing a proportion to the vigor of their intellects, the swords destroying the scabbard has become almost proverbial, and superficial observers have inferred from thence that men of genius have commonly weak, or to use a more fashionable phrase, delicate constitutions. Yet the contrary, I believe, will appear to be the fact. For on diligent inquiry I find that strength of mind has, in most cases, been accompanied by superior strength of body, natural soundness of constitution, not that robust tone of nerves and vigor of muscles which arise from bodily labor when the mind is quiescent, or only directs the hands. Dr. Priestley has remarked, in the preface to his biographical chart, that the majority of great men have lived beyond forty-five and considering the thoughtless manner in which they lavished their strength when investigating a favorite science, they have wasted the lamp of life, forgetful of the midnight hour, or when lost in poetic dreams, fancy has peopled the scene, and the soul has been disturbed till it shook the constitution by the passions that meditation had raised, whose objects, the baseless fabric of vision, faded before the exhausted eye, they must have had iron frames. Shakespeare never grasped the airy dagger with a nerveless hand, nor did Milton tremble when he led Satan far from the confines of his dreary prison. These were not the ravings of imbecility, the sickly effusions of distempered brains, but the exuberance of fancy, that in a fine frenzy wandering was not continually reminded of its material shackles. I am aware that this argument would carry me further than it may be supposed I wish to go, but I follow truth, and still adhering to my first position, I will allow that bodily strength seems to give man a natural superiority over women, and this is the only solid basis on which the superiority of the sex can be built. But I still insist that not only the virtue, but the knowledge of the two sexes should be the same in nature, if not in degree and that women, considered not only as moral but as rational creatures, ought to endeavor to acquire human virtues or perfections by the same means as men, instead of being educated like a fanciful kind of half-being, one of Rousseau's wild chimeras. But if strength of body be with some show of reason the boast of men, why are women so infatuated as to be proud of a defect? Rousseau has furnished them with a plausible excuse, which could only have occurred to a man whose imagination had been allowed to run wild, and refine on the impressions made by exquisite senses, that they might forsooth have a pretext for yielding to a natural appetite, without violating a romantic species of modesty which gratifies the pride and libertinism of man. Women deluded by these sentiments sometimes boast of their weakness, cunningly obtaining power by playing on the weakness of men and they may well glory in their illicit sway, for like Turkish bashaws they have more real power than their masters, but virtue is sacrificed to temporary gratifications, and the respectability of life to the triumph of an hour. Women as well as despots have now perhaps more power than they would have if the world, divided and subdivided into kingdoms and families, was governed by laws deduced from the exercise of reason. But in obtaining it, to carry on the comparison, their character is degraded, and licentiousness th spread through the whole aggregate of society. The many become pedestal to the few. 
I, therefore, will venture to assert that, till women are more rationally educated, the progress of human virtue and improvement in knowledge must receive continual checks. And if it be granted that women were not created merely to gratify the appetite of man, nor to be the upper servant who provides his meals and takes care of his linen, it must follow that the first care of these mothers or fathers who really attend to the education of females should be, if not to strengthen the body, at least not to destroy the constitution by mistaken notions of beauty and female excellence. Nor should girls ever be allowed to imbibe the pernicious notion that a defect can, by any chemical process of reasoning, become an excellence. In this respect, I am happy to find that the author of one of the most instructive books that our country has produced for children coincides with me in opinion. I shall quote his pertinent remarks to give the force of his respectable authority to reason. Quote, a respectable old man gives the following sensible account of the method he pursued when educating his daughter. I endeavored to give both to her mind and body a degree of vigor which is seldom found in the female sex. As soon as she was sufficiently advanced in strength to be capable of the lighter labors of husbandry and gardening, I employed her as my constant companion. Selene, for that was her name, soon acquired a dexterity in all these rustic employments which I considered with equal pleasure and admiration. If women are in general feeble in body and mind, it arises less from nature than from education. We encourage a vicious indolence and inactivity, which we falsely call delicacy. Instead of hardening their minds by the severer principles of reason and philosophy, we breed them to useless arts, which terminate in vanity and sensuality. In most of the countries which I had visited, they are taught nothing of a higher nature than a few modulations of the voice, or useless postures of the body. Their time is consumed in sloth and trifles, and trifles become the only pursuits capable of interesting them. We seem to forget that it is upon the qualities of the female sex that our own domestic comforts and the education of our children must depend. And what are the comforts or the education which a race of beings corrupted from their infancy and unacquainted with all the duties of life are fit to bestow? To touch a musical instrument with useless skill? To exhibit their natural or affected graces to the eyes of indolent and debauched young men who dissipate their husband's patrimony in riotous and unnecessary expenses? These are the only arts cultivated by women in most of the polished nations I had seen and the consequences are uniformly such as may be expected to proceed from such polluted sources, private misery, and public servitude. But Céline's education was regulated by different views, and conducted upon severer principles. If that can be called severity which opens the mind to a sense of moral and religious duties, and most effectually arms it against the inevitable evils of life. End quote. Mr. Day's Sanford and Merton, Volume 3. But should it be proved that woman is naturally weaker than man, from whence does it follow that it is natural for her to labor to become still weaker than nature intended for her to be? Arguments of this caste are an insult to common sense and savor of passion. The divine right of husbands, like the divine right of kings, may, it is to be hoped, in this enlightened age, be contested without danger. And though conviction may not silence many boisterous disputants, yet when any prevailing prejudice is attacked, the wise will consider and lead the narrow-minded to rail with thoughtless vehemence at innovation. The mother who wishes to give true dignity of character to her daughter must, regardless of the sneers of ignorance, proceed on a plan diametrically opposite to that which Rousseau has recommended with all the deluding charms of eloquence and philosophical sophistry, for his eloquence renders absurdities plausible, and his dogmatic conclusions puzzle without convincing those who have not ability to refute them. Throughout the whole animal kingdom, Every young creature requires almost continual exercise, and the infancy of children, conformable to this intimation, should be passed in harmless gambols that exercise the feet and hands without requiring very minute direction from the head or the constant attention of a nurse. In fact, the care necessary for self-preservation is the first natural exercise of the understanding, as little inventions to amuse the present moment unfold the imagination. But these wise designs of nature are counteracted by mistaken fondness or blind zeal. The child is not left a moment to its own direction, particularly a girl, and thus rendered dependent. Dependence is called natural. 
To preserve personal beauty and woman's glory, the limbs and faculties are cramped with worse than Chinese bands, and the sedentary life which they are condemned to live whilst boys frolic in the open air weakens the muscles and relaxes the nerves. As for Rousseau's remarks, which have since been echoed by several writers, that they have naturally, that is from their birth, independent of education, a fondness for dolls, dressing, and talking, they are so puerile as not to merit a serious refutation. That a girl, condemned to sit for hours together listening to the idle chat of weak nurses, or to attend at her mother's toilet, will endeavor to enjoy the conversation is indeed very natural, and that she will imitate her mother's or aunt's, and amuse herself by adorning her lifeless doll as they do in dressing her, poor innocent babe, is undoubtedly a most natural consequence. For men of the greatest abilities have seldom had sufficient strength to rise above the surrounding atmosphere, and if the page of genius has always been blurred by the prejudices of the age, some allowance should always be made for a sex who, like kings, see things through a false medium. In this manner may the fondness for dress, conspicuous in women, be easily accounted for without supposing it the result of a desire to please the sex on which they are dependent. The absurdity, in short, of supposing that a girl is naturally a coquette, and that a desire connected with the impulse of a nature to propagate the species should appear even before an improper education has, by heating the imagination, called it forth prematurely, is so unphilosophical that such a sagacious observer as Rousseau would never have adopted it, if he had not been accustomed to make reason give way to his desire of singularity, and truth to a favorite paradox. Yet thus to give a sex to mind was not very consistent with the principles of a man who argued so warmly, and so well, for the immortality of the soul. But what a weak barrier is truth when it stands in the way of a hypothesis! Rousseau respected, almost adored virtue, and yet allowed himself to love with a sensual fondness. His imagination constantly prepared inflammable fuel for his inflammable senses, but in order to reconcile his respect for self-denial, fortitude, and those heroic virtues, which a mind like his could not coolly admire, he labors to invert the law of nature, and broaches a doctrine pregnant with mischief, and derogatory to the character of supreme wisdom. His ridiculous stories, which tend to prove that girls are naturally attentive to their persons, without laying any stress on daily example, are below contempt and that a little miss should have such correct taste as to neglect the pleasing amusement of making o's, merely because she perceived that it was an ungraceful attitude, should be selected with the anecdotes of the learned pig. Quote, I once knew a young person who learned to write before she learned to read, and began to write with her needle before she could use a pen. At first, indeed, she took it into her head to make no other letter than the o. This letter she was constantly making of all sizes, and always the wrong way. Unluckily, one day, as she was intent on this employment, she happened to see herself in the looking-glass. When taking a dislike to the constrained attitude in which she sat while writing, she threw away her pen, like another palace, and determined against making the O any more. Her brother was also equally averse to writing. It was the confinement, however, and not the constrained attitude, that most disgusted him." End quote. Rousseau's Emilius. I have probably had an opportunity of observing more girls in their infancy than J. J. Rousseau. I can recollect my own feelings, and I have looked steadily around me. Yet so far from coinciding with him in opinion regarding the first dawn of the female character, I will venture to affirm that a girl whose spirits have not been dampened by inactivity, or innocence tainted by a false shame, will always be a romp, and the doll will never excite attention unless confinement allows her no alternative. Girls and boys, in short, would play harmless together, if the distinction of sex was not inculcated long before nature makes any difference. I will go further and affirm, as an indisputable fact, that most of the women in the circle of my observation who have acted like rational creatures, or shown any vigor of intellect, have accidentally been allowed to run wild, as some of the elegant formers of the fair sex would insinuate. The baneful consequences which flow from inattention to health during infancy and youth extend further than is supposed. Dependence of body naturally produces dependence of mind, and how can she be a good wife or mother, the greater part of whose time is employed to guard against or endure sickness, nor can it be expected that a woman will resolutely endeavor to strengthen her constitution and abstain from enervating indulgences, if artificial notions of beauty and false descriptions of sensibility have been early entangled with her motives of action. 
most men are sometimes obliged to bear with bodily inconveniences and to endure occasionally the inclemency of the elements the genteel women are literally speaking slaves to their bodies and glory in their subjection i once knew a weak woman of fashion who was more than commonly proud of her delicacy and sensibility she thought a distinguishing taste and puny appetite the height of all human perfection and acted accordingly i have seen this weak sophisticated being neglect all the duties of life yet recline with self-complacency on a sofa and boast of her want of appetite as a proof of delicacy that extended to or perhaps arose from her exquisite sensibility for it is difficult to render intelligible such ridiculous jargon yet at the moment i have seen her insult a worthy old gentleman whose unexpected misfortunes had made dependent on her ostentatious bounty, and who in better days had claims on her gratitude. Is it possible that a human creature should have become such a weak and depraved being, if, like the Sybarites, dissolved in luxury, everything like virtue had not been worn away, or never impressed by precept, a poor substitute, it is true, for cultivation of mind, though it serves as a fence against vice? such a woman is not a more irrational monster than some of the roman emperors who were depraved by lawless power yet since kings have been more under the restraint of the law and the curb however weak of honour the records of history are not filled with such unnatural instances of folly and cruelty nor does the despotism that kills virtue and genius in the bud hover over europe with that destructive blast which desolates turkey and renders the men as well as the soil unfruitful women are everywhere in this deplorable state for in order to preserve their innocence as ignorance is courteously termed truth is hidden from them and they are made to assume an artificial character before their faculties have acquired any strength taught from their infancy that beauty is woman's sceptre the mind shapes itself to the body and roaming round its gilt cage only seeks to adorn its prison men have various employments and pursuits which engage their attention and give a character to the opening mind but women confined to one and having their thoughts constantly directed to the most insignificant part of themselves seldom extend their views beyond the triumph of the hour but was their understanding once emancipated from the slavery to which the pride and sensuality of man in their short-sighted desire like that of dominion and tyrants of present sway has subjected them we should probably read of their weaknesses with surprise I must be allowed to pursue the argument a little further. Perhaps, if the existence of an evil being was allowed, who in the allegorical language of Scripture went about seeking whom he should devour, he could not more effectually degrade the human character than by giving a man absolute power. This argument branches into various ramifications. Birth, riches, and every intrinsic advantage that exalt a man above his fellows, without any mental exertion, sink him in reality below them. In proportion to his weakness, he is played upon by designing men, till the bloated monster has lost all traces of humanity. And that tribes of men, like flocks of sheep, should quietly follow such a leader, is a solecism that only a desire of present enjoyment and narrowness of understanding can solve. Educated in slavish dependence, and enervated by luxury and sloth, where shall we find men who will stand forth to assert the rights of man, or claim the privilege of moral beings, who should have but one road to excellence? Slavery to monarchs and ministers, which the world will be long in freeing itself from, and whose deadly grasp stops the progress of the human mind, is not yet abolished. Let not then men, in the pride of power, use the same arguments that tyrannic kings and venal ministers have used, and fallaciously assert that woman ought to be subjected because she has always been so. But when man governed by reasonable laws enjoys his natural freedom, let him despise woman if she does not share it with him, until that glorious period arrives, in discanting on the folly of the sex, let him not overlook his own. Women, it is true, obtaining power by unjust means, by practicing or fostering vice, evidently lose the rank which reason would assign them, and they become either abject slaves or capricious tyrants. They lose all simplicity, all dignity of mind in acquiring power, and act as men are observed to act when they have been exalted by the same means. It is time to effect a revolution in female manners, time to restore to them their lost dignity, and make them, as a part of the human species, labor by reforming themselves to reform the world. 
It is time to separate unchangeable morals from local manners. If men be demigods, let us serve them, and if the dignity of the female soul be as disputable as that of animals, if their reason does not afford sufficient light to direct their conduct whilst unerring instinct is denied, they are surely, of all creatures, the most miserable, and bent beneath the iron hand of destiny, must submit to be a fair defect in creation. But to justify the ways of providence respecting them, by pointing out some irrefragable reason for thus making such a large portion of mankind accountable and not accountable, would puzzle the subtlest casuist. The only solid foundation for morality appears to be the character of the supreme being, the harmony of which arises from a balance of attributes, and to speak with reverence, one attribute seems to imply the necessity of another. He must be just because he is wise, he must be good because he is omnipotent, for to exalt one attribute at the expense of another equally noble and necessary bears the stamp of the warped reason of man, the homage of passion. Man, accustomed to bow down to power in his savage state, can seldom divest himself of this barbarous prejudice, even when civilization determines how much superior mental is to bodily strength, and his reason is clouded by these crude opinions, even when he thinks of the deity. His omnipotence is made to swallow up or preside over his other attributes, and those mortals are supposed to limit his power irreverently who think that it must be regulated by his wisdom. I disclaim that species of humility which, after investigating nature, stops at the author. The high and lofty one, who inhabiteth eternity, doubtless possesses many attributes of which we can form no conception, but reason tells me that they cannot clash with those I adore, and I am compelled to listen to her voice. It seems natural for man to search for excellence, and either to trace it in the object that he worships, or blindly to invest it with perfection as a garment. But what good effect can the latter mode of worship have on the moral conduct of a rational being? He bends to power, he adores a dark cloud which may open a bright prospect to him, or burst in angry lawless fury on his devoted head, he knows not why. And supposing that the deity acts from the vague impulse of an undirected will, Man must also follow his own, or act according to rules deduced from principles which he disclaims as irreverent. Into this dilemma have both enthusiasts and cooler thinkers fallen, when they labored to free men from the wholesome restraints which a just conception of the character of God imposes. It is not impious thus to scan the attributes of the Almighty. In fact, who can avoid it that exercises his faculties? For to love God as the fountain of wisdom, goodness, and power appears to be the only worship useful to a being who wishes to acquire either virtue or knowledge. A blind, unsettled affection may, like human passions, occupy the mind and warm the heart, whilst to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God is forgotten. I shall pursue this subject still further when I consider religion in a light opposite to that recommended by Dr. Gregory, who treats it as a matter of sentiment or taste. To return from this apparent digression, it were to be wished that women would cherish an affection for their husbands founded on the same principle that devotion ought to rest upon. No other firm base is there under heaven, for let them beware of the fallacious light of sentiment, too often used, as a simpler phrase, for sensuality. It follows, then, I think, that from their infancy women should either be shut up like eastern princes, or educated in such a manner as to be able to think and act for themselves. Why do men halt between two opinions and expect impossibilities? Why do they expect virtue from a slave, or from a being whom the constitution of civil society has rendered weak, if not vicious? Still I know that it will require a considerable length of time to eradicate the firmly rooted prejudices which sensualists have planted. It will also require some time to convince women that they act contrary to their real interest on an enlarged scale, when they cherish or affect weakness under the name of delicacy, and to convince the world that the poisoned source of female vices and follies, if it be necessary, in compliance with custom, to use synonymous terms in a lax sense, has been the sensual homage paid to beauty, to beauty of features, for it has been shrewdly observed by a German writer that a pretty woman, as an object of desire, is generally allowed to be so by men of all descriptions, whilst a fine woman, who inspires more sublime emotions by displaying intellectual beauty, may be overlooked or observed with indifference by those men who find their happiness in the gratification of their appetites. I foresee an obvious retort. Whilst man remains such an imperfect being as he appears hitherto to have been, he will more or less be the slave of his appetites. And those women obtaining most power who gratify a predominant one, 
the sex is degraded by a physical, if not a moral necessity. This objection has, I grant, some force, but while such a sublime precept exists, as, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, it would seem that the virtues of man are not limited by the being who alone could limit them, and that he may press forward without considering whether he steps out of his sphere by indulging such a noble ambition. To the wild billows it has been said, Thus far shalt thou go, and no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. Vainly, then, do they beat and foam, restrained by the power that confines the struggling planets within their orbits, matter yields to the great governing spirit. But an immortal soul, not restrained by mechanical laws, and struggling to free itself from the shackles of matter, contributes to, instead of disturbing, the order of creation, when, cooperating with the father of spirits, it tries to govern itself by the invariable rule that, in a degree before which our imagination faints, the universe is regulated. Besides, if women are educated for dependence, that is, to act according to the will of another fallible being, and to submit right or wrong to the power, where are we to stop? Are they to be considered as vice-regents, allowed to reign over a small domain, and answerable for their conduct to a higher tribunal, liable to error? It will not be difficult to prove that such delegates will act like men subjected by fear, and make their children and servants endure their tyrannical oppression. As they submit without reason, they will, having no fixed rules to square their conduct by, be kind or cruel, just as the whim of the moment directs. And we ought not to wonder if sometimes, galled by their heavy yoke, they take a malignant pleasure in resting it on weaker shoulders. But supposing a woman, trained up to obedience, be married to a sensible man, who directs her judgment without making her feel the servility of her subjection, to act with as much propriety by this reflected light as can be expected when reason is taken at second hand, yet she cannot ensure the life of her protector. He may die and leave her with a large family. A double duty devolves upon her, to educate them in the character of both father and mother, to form their principles and secure their property. But alas, she has never thought, much less acted for herself. She has only learned to please men, to depend gracefully on them. Yet, encumbered with children, how is she to obtain another protector, a husband, to supply the place of reason? A rational man, for we are not treading on romantic ground, though he may think her a pleasing, docile creature, will not choose to marry a family for love when the world contains many more pretty creatures. What then is to become of her? She either falls an easy prey to some mean fortune hunter, who defrauds her children of their paternal inheritance and renders her miserable, or becomes the victim of discontent and blind indulgence. Unable to educate her sons or impress them with respect, for it is not a play on words to assert that people are never respected, though filling an important station, who are not respectable, she pines under the anguish of unavailing impotent regret. The serpent's tooth enters into her very soul, and the vices of licentious youth bring her with sorrow, if not with poverty also, to the grave. This is not an overcharged picture. On the contrary, it is a very possible case, and something similar must have fallen under every attentive eye. I have, however, taken it for granted that she was well disposed, though experience shows that the blind may as easily be led into a ditch as along the beaten road. But supposing, no very improbable conjecture, that a being only taught to please must still find her happiness in pleasing, what an example of folly, not to say vice, will she be to her innocent daughters? The mother will be lost in the coquette, and instead of making friends of her daughters, view them with eyes askance, for they are rivals rivals more cruel than any other because they invite a comparison, and drive her from the throne of beauty who has never thought of a seat on the bench of reason. It does not require a lively pencil or the discriminating outline of a caricature to sketch the domestic miseries and petty vices which such a mistress of a family diffuses. Still, she only acts as a woman ought to act, brought up according to Rousseau's system. She can never be reproached for being masculine, or turning out of her sphere. Nay, she may observe another of his grand rules, and cautiously preserving her reputation free of spot, be reckoned a good kind of woman. Yet in what respect can she be termed good? She abstains, it is true, without any great struggle from committing gross crimes, but how does she fulfill her duties? Duties, in truth, she has enough to think of to adorn her body and nurse a weak constitution. With respect to religion, she never presumed to judge for herself, but conformed, as a dependent creature should, to the ceremonies of the church which she was brought up in, 
piously believing that wiser heads than her own have settled that business, and not to doubt is her point of perfection. She therefore pays her tithe of mint and cumin, and thanks her God that she is not as other women are. These are the blessed effects of a good education, these the virtues of a man's helpmate. I must relieve myself by drawing a different picture. Let fancy now present a woman with a tolerable understanding, for I do not wish to leave the line of mediocrity, whose constitution, strengthened by exercise, has allowed her body to acquire its full vigor, her mind at the same time gradually expanding itself to comprehend the moral duties of life, and in what human virtue and dignity consist. Formed thus by the relative duties of her station, she marries from affection without losing sight of prudence, and looking beyond matrimonial felicity, she secures her husband's respect before it is necessary to exert mean arts to please him, and feed a dying flame, which nature doomed to expire when the object became familiar, when friendship and forbearance take place of a more ardent affection. This is the natural death of love, and domestic peace is not destroyed by struggles to prevent its extinction. I also suppose the husband to be virtuous, or she is still more in want of independent principles. Fate, however, breaks this tie. She is left a widow, perhaps, without a sufficient provision, but she is not desolate. The pang of nature is felt, but after time has softened sorrow into melancholy resignation, her heart turns to her children with redoubled fondness, and, anxious to provide for them, affection gives a sacred heroic cast to her maternal duties. She thinks that not only the eye sees her virtuous efforts, from whom all her comfort must now flow, and whose approbation is life, but her imagination, a little abstracted and exalted by grief, dwells on the fond hope that the eyes, which her trembling hand closed, may still see how she subdues her every wayward passion to fulfill the double duty of being the father as well as the mother of her children. Raised to heroism by misfortune, she represses the first faint dawning of a natural inclination before it ripens into love, and in the bloom of life forgets her sex, forgets the pleasure of an awakening passion, which might again have been inspired and returned. She no longer thinks of pleasing, and conscious dignity prevents her from priding herself on account of the praise which her conduct demands. Her children have her love, and her brightest hopes are beyond the grave, where her imagination often strays. I think I see her surrounded by her children, reaping the reward of her care. The intelligent eye meets hers, whilst health and innocence smile on their chubby cheeks, and as they grow up the cares of life are lessened by their grateful attention. She lives to see the virtues which she endeavored to plant on principles fixed into habits, to see her children attain a strength of character, sufficient to enable them to endure adversity without forgetting their mother's example. The task of life thus fulfilled, she calmly waits for the sleep of death, and rising from the grave, may say, Behold, thou gavest me a talent, and here are five talents. I wish to sum up what I have said in a few words, for I here throw down my gauntlet, and deny the existence of sexual virtues, not excepting modesty. For man and woman, truth, if I understand the meaning of the word, must be the same. Yet the fanciful female character, so prettily drawn by poets and novelists, demanding the sacrifice of truth and sincerity, virtue becomes a relative idea, having no other foundation than utility, and of that utility men pretend arbitrarily to judge, shaping it to their own convenience. Women, I allow, may have different duties to fulfill, but they are human duties, and the principles that should regulate the discharge of them, I sturdily maintain, must be the same. To become respectable, the exercise of their understanding is necessary. There is no other foundation for independence of character, I mean explicitly to say, that they must only bow to the authority of reason, instead of being the modest slaves of opinion. In the superior ranks of life, how seldom do we meet with a man of superior abilities, or even common acquirements. The reason appears to me to be clear. The state they are born in was an unnatural one. The human character has ever been formed by the employments the individual or class pursues, and if the faculties are not sharpened by necessity, they must remain obtuse. The argument may fairly be extended to women. For seldom occupied by serious business, the pursuit of pleasure gives that insignificancy to their character which renders the society of the great so insipid. The same want of firmness, produced by a similar cause, forces them both to fly from themselves to noisy pleasures and artificial passions, till vanity takes place of every social affection, 
and the characteristics of humanity can scarcely be discerned. Such are the blessings of civil governments, as they are at present organized, that wealth and female softness equally tend to debase mankind, and are produced by the same cause. But allowing women to be rational creatures, they should be incited to acquire virtues which they may call their own. For how can a rational being be ennobled by anything that is not obtained by its own exertions? End of chapter 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Vindication of the Rights of Woman by Mary Wollstonecraft. Chapter 4 Observations on the State of Degradation to Which Woman is Reduced by Various Causes. That woman is naturally weak or degraded by a concurrence of circumstances is, I think, clear. But this position I shall simply contrast with the conclusion, which I have frequently heard fall from sensible men in favor of an aristocracy, that the mass of mankind cannot be anything, or the obsequious slaves who patiently allow themselves to be penned up would feel their own consequence and spurn their chains. Men, they further observe, submit everywhere to oppression, when they have only to lift up their heads to throw off the yoke, yet, instead of asserting their birthright, they quietly lick the dust and say, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Women, I argue from analogy, are degraded by the same propensity to enjoy the present moment, and, at last, despise the freedom which they have not sufficient virtue to struggle to attain but I must be more explicit. With respect to the culture of the heart, it is unanimously allowed that sex is out of the question, but the line of subordination in the mental powers is never to be passed over. Only absolute in loveliness, the portion of rationality granted to woman is, indeed, very scanty, for, denying her genius and judgment, it is scarcely possible to divine what remains to characterize intellect. The stamina of immortality, if I may be allowed the phrase, is the perfectibility of human reason. For was man created perfect, or did a flood of knowledge break in upon him when he arrived at maturity, the precluded error? I should doubt whether his existence would be continued after the dissolution of the body. But in the present state of things, every difficulty in morals that escapes from human discussion and equally baffles the investigation of profound thinking and the lightning glance of genius is an argument on which I build my belief of the immortality of the soul. Reason is, consequentially, the simple power of improvement, or, more properly speaking, of discerning truth. Every individual is, in this respect, a world in itself. More or less may be conspicuous in one being than other, but the nature of reason must be the same in all, if it be an emanation of divinity, the tie that connects the creature with the creator. For can that soul be stamped with the heavenly image that is not perfected by the exercise of its own reason, yet outwardly ornamented with elaborate care and so adorned to delight man that with honor he may love, Vita Milton, the soul of woman is not allowed to have this distinction and man, ever placed between her and reason, she is always represented as only created to see through a gross medium and to take things on trust. But, dismissing these fanciful theories and considering woman as a whole, let it be what it will, instead of a part of man, the inquiry is whether she has reason or not. If she has, which for a moment I will take for granted, she was not created merely to be the solace of man, and the sexual should not destroy the human character. Into this error men have, probably, been led by viewing education in a false light, not considering it as the first step to form a being advancing gradually toward perfection. This word is not strictly just, but I cannot find it better, but only as a preparation for life. On this sensual error, for I must call it so, has the false system of female manners been reared, 
which robs the whole sex of its dignity and classes the brown and fair with the smiling flowers that only adorn the land. This has ever been the language of men, and the fear of departing from a supposed sexual character has made even women of superior sense adopt the same sentiments. Thus understanding, strictly speaking, has been denied to woman, and instinct, sublimated into wit and cunning, for the purposes of life, has been substituted in its stead. The power of generalizing ideas, of drawing comprehensive conclusions from individual observations, is the only acquirement for an immortal being that really deserves the name of knowledge. Merely to observe, without endeavoring to account for anything, may, in a very incomplete manner, serve as the common sense of life. But where is the store laid up that is to clothe the soul when it leaves the body? This power has not only been denied to women, the writers have insisted that it is inconsistent with few exceptions with their sexual character. Let men prove this, and I shall grant that woman only exists for man. I must, however, previously remark that the power of generalizing ideas, to any great extent, is not very common amongst men or women. But this exercise is the true cultivation of the understanding, and everything conspires to render the cultivation of the understanding more difficult in the female than the male world. I am naturally led by this assertion to the main subject of the present chapter, and shall now attempt to point out some of the causes that degrade the sex and prevent women from generalizing their observations. I shall not go back to the remote annals of antiquity to trace the history of woman. It is sufficient to allow that she has always been either a slave or a despot, and to remark that each of these situations equally retards the progress of reason. The grand source of female folly and vice has ever appeared to me to arise from narrowness of mind, and the very constitution of civil governments has put almost insuperable obstacles in the way to prevent the cultivation of female understanding. Yet virtue can be built on no other foundation. The same obstacles are thrown in the way of the rich, and the same consequences ensue. Necessity has been proverbially termed the mother of invention. The aphorism may be extended to virtue. It is an acquirement, and an acquirement to which pleasure must be sacrificed. And who sacrifices pleasure when it is within the grasp? Whose mind has not been opened and strengthened by adversity, or the pursuit of knowledge goaded on by necessity? Happy is it when people have the cares of life to struggle with, for these struggles prevent their becoming a prey to enervating vices, merely from idleness. But if from their birth men and women are placed in a torrid zone, with the meridian sun of pleasure darting directly upon them, how can they sufficiently brace their minds to discharge the duties of life, or even to relish the affections that carry them out of themselves? Pleasure is the business of a woman's life, according to the present modification of society, and while it continues to be so, little can be expected from such weak beings. Inheriting, in a lineal descent from the first fair defect in nature, the severity of beauty they have, to maintain their power, resign their natural rights, which the exercise of reason might have procured them, and chosen rather to be short-lived queens than labor to attain the sober pleasures that arise from equality. Exalted by their inferiority, this sounds like a contradiction, they constantly demand homage as women, though experience should teach them that the men who pride themselves upon paying this arbitrary insolent respect to the sex with the most scrupulous exactness are most inclined to tyrannize over and despise the very weakness they cherish. Often do they repeat Mr. Hume's sentiments when comparing the French and Athenian character he alludes to women. But what is more singular in this whimsical nation, say I to the Athenians, is that a frolic of yours during the Saturnalia, when the slaves are served by their masters, is seriously continued by them through the whole year, 
and through the whole course of their lives, accompanied, too, with some circumstances which still further augment the absurdity and ridicule. Your sport only elevates for a few days those whom fortune has thrown down, and whom she, too, in sport, may really elevate forever above you. But this nation gravely exalts those whom nature has subjected to them, and whose inferiority and infirmities are absolutely incurable. The women, though without virtue, are their masters and sovereigns. Ah, why do women, I write with affectionate solicitude, condescend to receive a degree of attention and respect from strangers, different from that reciprocation of civility which the dictates of humanity and the politeness of civilization authorize between man and man, and why do they not discover, when, in the noon of beauty's power, that they are treated like queens only to be deluded by hollow respect, till they are led to resign or not assume their natural prerogatives? Confined then in cages like the feathered race, they have nothing to do but to plume themselves and stalk with mock majesty from perch to perch, it is true they are provided with food and raiment, for which they neither toil nor spin, but health, liberty, and virtue are given in exchange. But where, amongst mankind, has been found sufficient strength of mind to enable a being to resign these adventitious prerogatives, one who, rising with the calm of dignity of reason above opinion, dare to be proud of the privileges inherent in man, and it is vain to expect it whilst hereditary power chokes the affections and nips reason in the bud. The passions of men have thus placed women on thrones, and till mankind become more reasonable, it is to be feared that women will avail themselves of the power which they attain with the least exertion, and which is the most indisputable. They will smile, yes, they will smile, though told that in beauty's empire is no mean, and woman, either slave or queen, is quickly scorned when not adored. But the adoration comes first, and the scorn is not anticipated. Louis the Fourteenth, in particular, spread factitious manners and caught in a specious way the whole nation in his toils. For establishing an artful chain of despotism, he made it the interest of the people at large, individually to respect his station and support his power. And women, whom he flattered by a puerile attention to the whole sex, obtained in his reign that prince-like distinction so fatal to reason and virtue. A king is always a king, and a woman always a woman, and a wit always a wit might be added for the vain fooleries of wits and beauties to obtain attention and make conquests are much upon a par. His authority and her sex ever stand between them and rational converse. With a lover, I grant she should be so, and her sensibility will naturally lead her to endeavor to excite emotion, not to gratify her vanity, but her heart. This I do not allow to be coquetry. It is the artless impulse of nature, I only exclaim against the sexual desire of conquest when the heart is out of the question. This desire is not confined to women. I have endeavored, says Lord Chesterfield, to gain the hearts of twenty women whose persons I would not have given a fig for. The libertine who, in a gust of passion, takes advantage of unsuspecting tenderness, is a saint when compared with this cold-hearted rascal for I like to use significant words. Yet only taught to please, women are always on the watch to please, and with true heroic ardor endeavor to gain hearts, merely to resign or spurn them when the victory is decided and conspicuous. I must ascend to the minute of the subject. I lament that women are systematically degraded by receiving the trivial attentions which men think it manly to pay to the sex, when, in fact, they are insultingly supporting their own superiority. It is not condescension to bow to an inferior. So ludicrous, in fact, 
do these ceremonies appear to me that I scarcely am able to govern my muscles when I see a man start with eager and serious solicitude to lift a handkerchief or shut a door when the lady could have done it herself had she only moved a pace or two. A wild wish has just flown from my heart to my head, and I will not stifle it, though it may excite a hoarse laugh. I do earnestly wish to see the distinction of sex confounded in society, unless where love animates the behavior. For this distinction is, I am firmly persuaded, the foundation of the weakness of character ascribed to woman. Is the cause why the understanding is neglected whilst accomplishments are acquired with sedulous care, and the same cause accounts for their preferring the graceful before the heroic virtues. Mankind, including every description, wish to be loved and respected for something, and the common herd will always take the nearest road to the completion of their wishes. The respect paid to wealth and beauty is the most certain and unequivocal and, of course, will always attract the vulgar eye of common minds. Abilities and virtues are absolutely necessary to raise men from the middle rank of life into notice, and the natural consequence is notorious. The middle rank contains most virtue and abilities. Men have thus, in one station, at least, an opportunity of exerting themselves with dignity and of rising by the exertions which really improve a rational creature. But the whole female sex are, till their character is formed, in the same condition as the rich, for they are born, I now speak of a state of civilization, with certain sexual privileges, and whilst they are gratuitously granted them, few will ever think of works of supererogation to obtain the esteem of a small number of superior people. When do we hear of women who, starting out of obscurity, boldly claim respect on account of their great abilities or daring virtues? Where are they to be found? To be observed, to be attended to, to be taken notice of with sympathy, complacency, and approbation are all the advantages which they seek. True, my male readers will probably exclaim, but let them, before they draw any conclusion, recollect that this was not written originally as descriptive of women, but of the rich. In Dr. Smith's Theory of Moral Sentiments, I have found a general character of people of rank and fortune that, in my opinion, might with the greatest propriety be applied to the female sex. I refer the sagacious reader to the whole comparison, but must be allowed to quote a passage to enforce an argument that I mean to insist on as the one most conclusive against a sexual character. For if, excepting warriors, no great men of any denomination have ever appeared amongst the nobility, may it not be fairly inferred that their local situation swallowed up the man and produced a character similar to that of women, who are localized, if I may be allowed the word, by the rank they are placed in by courtesy. Women, commonly called ladies, are not to be contradicted in company, are not allowed to exert any manual strength, and from them the negative virtues only are expected, when any virtues are expected, patience, docility, good humor, and flexibility, virtues incompatible with any vigorous exertion of intellect. Besides, by living more with each other, and to being seldom absolutely alone, they are more under the influence of sentiments than passions. Solitude and reflection are necessary to give to wishes the force of passions and enable the imagination to enlarge the object and make it the most desirable. The same may be said of the rich. They do not sufficiently deal in general ideas collected by impassionate thinking or calm investigation to acquire that strength of character on which great resolves are built. But hear what an acute observer says of the great. Do the great seem insensible of the easy price at which they may acquire the public admiration? Or do they seem to imagine that to them, as to other men, it must be the purchase either of sweat or of blood? 
By what important accomplishments is the young nobleman instructed to support the dignity of his rank and to render himself worthy of that superiority over his fellow citizens to which the virtue of his ancestors had raised them? Is it by knowledge, by industry, by patience, by self-denial, or by virtue of any kind? As all his words, as all his motions are attended to, he learns an habitual regard for every circumstance of ordinary behavior and studies to perform all those small duties with the most exact propriety. As he is conscious how much he has observed and how much mankind are disposed to favor all his inclinations, he acts upon the most indifferent occasions with that freedom and elevation which the thought of this naturally inspires. His air, his manner, his deportment all mark that elegant and graceful sense of his own superiority, which those who are born to an inferior station can hardly ever arrive at. These are the arts by which he proposes to make mankind more easily submit to his authority and to govern their inclinations according to his own pleasure. And in this he is seldom disappointed. These arts supported by rank and preeminence are upon ordinary occasions sufficient to govern the world. Louis the Fourteenth, during the greater part of his reign, was regarded not only in France but all over Europe as the most perfect model of a great prince. But what were the talents and virtues by which he acquired this great reputation? Was it by the scrupulous and inflexible justice of all his undertakings? by the immense dangers and difficulties with which they were attended, or by the unwearied and unrelenting application with which he pursued them? Was it by his extensive knowledge, by his exquisite judgment, or by his heroic valor? It was by none of these qualities, but he was, first of all, the most powerful prince in Europe, and consequently held the highest rank among kings. And then, says his historian, he surpassed all his courtiers in the gracefulness of his shape and the majestic beauty of his features. The sound of his voice, noble and affecting, gained those hearts which his presence intimidated. He had a step and a deportment which could suit only him and his rank, and which would have been ridiculous in any other person. The embarrassment which he occasioned to those who spoke to him flattered that secret satisfaction with which he felt his own superiority. These frivolous accomplishments, supported by his rank, and no doubt, too, by a degree of other talents and virtues, which seems, however, not to have been much above mediocrity, established this prince in the esteem of his own age, and have drawn even from posterity a good deal of respect for his memory. Compared with these, in his own times, and in his own presence, no other virtue, it seems, appeared to have any merit. Knowledge, industry, valor, and beneficence, trembling, were abashed, and lost all dignity before them. Woman also thus, in herself complete, by possessing all these frivolous accomplishments, so changes the nature of things. That what she wills to do or say seems wisest, virtuous, discreetest, best. All higher knowledge in her presence falls degraded, Wisdom in discourse with her loses discountenanced, and like folly shows, authority and reason on her weight. And all this is built on her loveliness. In the middle rank of life, to continue the comparison, men, in their youth, are prepared for professions, and marriage is not considered as the grand feature in their lives, whilst women, on the contrary, have no other scheme to sharpen their faculties. It is not business, extensive plans, or any of the excursive flights of ambition that engross their attention. No, their thoughts are not employed in rearing such noble structures. To rise in the world and have the liberty of running from pleasure to pleasure, they must marry advantageously, and to this object their time is sacrificed, and their persons often legally prostituted. A man, when he enters any profession, has his eye steadily fixed on some future advantage, and the mind gains great strength by having all its efforts directed to one point. And, full of his business, pleasure is considered as mere relaxation. 
whilst women seek for pleasure as the main purpose of existence. In fact, from the education which they receive from society, the love of pleasure may be said to govern them all. But does this prove that there is a sex in souls? It would be just as rational to declare that the courtiers in France, when a destructive system of despotism has formed their character, were not men, because liberty, virtue, and humanity were sacrificed to pleasure and vanity, fatal passions which have ever domineered over the whole race. The same love of pleasure, fostered by the whole tendency of their education, gives a trifling turn to the conduct of women in most circumstances. For instance, they are ever anxious about secondary things, and on the watch for adventures, instead of being occupied by duties. A man, when he undertakes a journey, has, in general, the end in view. A woman thinks more of the incidental occurrences, the strange things that may possibly occur on the road, the impression that she may make on her fellow travelers, and, above all, she is anxiously intent on the care of the finery that she carries with her, which is more than ever a part of herself, when going to figure on a new scene, when, to use an apt French turn of expression, she is going to produce a sensation. Can dignity of mind exist with such trivial cares? In short, women in general, as well as the rich of both sexes, have acquired all the follies and vices of civilization, and missed the useful fruit. It is not necessary for me always to premise that I speak of the condition of the whole sex, leaving exceptions out of the question. Their senses are inflamed, and their understandings neglected. Consequently, they become the prey of their senses, delicately termed sensibility, and are blown about by every momentary gust of feeling. They are, therefore, in a much worse condition than they would be in, were they in a state nearer to nature. Ever restless and anxious, their over-exercised sensibility not only renders them uncomfortable themselves, but troublesome, to use a soft phrase, to others. All their thoughts turn on things calculated to excite emotion and feeling when they should reason. Their conduct is unstable, and their opinions are wavering, not the wavering produced by deliberation or progressive views, but by contradictory emotions. By fits and starts they are warm in many pursuits, yet this warmth, never concentrated into perseverance, soon exhausts itself. Exhaled by its own heat, or meeting with some other fleeting passion, to which reason has never given any specific gravity, neutrality ensues. Miserable, indeed, must be that being whose cultivation of mind has only tended to inflame its passions. A distinction should be made between inflaming and strengthening them. The passions thus pampered, whilst the judgment is left unformed, what can be expected to ensue? Undoubtedly a mixture of madness and folly. End of section. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Vindication of the Rights of Woman by Mary Wollstonecraft From Chapter 4 Observations on the state of degradation to which woman is reduced by various causes. Part 2. This observation should not be confined to the fair sex. However, at present I only mean to apply it to them. Novels, music, poetry, and gallantry all tend to make women the creatures of sensation, and their character is thus formed during the time that they are acquiring accomplishments, the only improvement they are excited by their station in society to acquire. This overstretched sensibility naturally relaxes the other powers of the mind and prevents intellect from attaining that sovereignty which it ought to attain to render a rational creature useful to others and content with its own station. For the exercise of the understanding, as life advances, is the only method pointed out by nature to calm the passions. Satiety has a very different effect, and I have often been forcibly struck 
by an emphatical description of damnation, when the spirit is represented as continually hovering with abortive eagerness round the defiled body, unable to enjoy anything without the organs of sense. Yet, to their senses, are women made slaves, because it is by their sensibility that they obtain present power. And will moralists pretend to assert that this is the condition in which one half of the human race should be encouraged to remain with listless inactivity and stupid acquiescence? Kind instructors, what were we created for? To remain, it may be said, innocent, they mean in a state of childhood. We might as well never have been born unless it were necessary that we should be created to enable man to acquire the noble privilege of reason, the power of discerning good from evil, whilst we lie down in the dust from whence we were taken, never to rise again. It would be an endless task to trace the variety of meannesses, cares, and sorrows into which women are plunged by the prevailing opinion that they were created rather to feel than reason, and that all the power they obtain must be obtained by their charms and weakness. Fine by defect and amiably weak, and made by this amiable weakness entirely dependent, accepting what they gain by illicit sway on man, not only for protection, but advice. Is it surprising that, neglecting the duties that reason alone points out, and shrinking from trials calculated to strengthen their minds, they only exert themselves to give their defects a graceful covering, which may serve to heighten their charms. In the eyes of the voluptuary, though it sink them below the scale of moral excellence, Fragile in every sense of the word, they are obliged to look up to man for every comfort. In the most trifling dangers, they cling to their support with parasitical tenacity, piteously demanding succor. And their natural protector extends his arm or lifts up his voice to guard the lovely trembler. From what? perhaps the frown of an old cow, or the jump of a mouse. A rat would be a serious danger. In the name of reason and even common sense, what can save such beings from contempt, even though they be soft and fair? These fears, when not affected, may be very pretty, but they show a degree of imbecility that degrades a rational creature in a way women are not aware of, for love and esteem are very distinct things. I am fully persuaded that we should hear none of these infantine airs if girls were allowed to take sufficient exercise and not confined in close rooms till their muscles are relaxed and their powers of digestion destroyed. To carry the remark still further, if fear in girls instead of being cherished, perhaps, created, were treated in the same manner as cowardice in boys, we should quickly see women with more dignified aspects. It is true, they could not then with equal propriety be termed the sweet flowers that smile in the walk of man, but they would be more respectable members of society and discharge the important duties of life by the light of their own reason. Educate women like men, says Rousseau, and the more they resemble our sex, the less power will they have over us. This is the very point I aim at. I do not wish them to have power over men, but over themselves. In the same strain have I heard men argue against instructing the poor for many are the forms that aristocracy assumes. Teach them to read and write, say they, and you take them out of the station assigned them by nature. An eloquent Frenchman, 
has answered them, and I will borrow his sentiments. But they know not, when they make man a brute, that they may expect every instant to see him transformed into a ferocious beast. Without knowledge, there can be no morality. Ignorance is a frail base for virtue. Yet that is the condition for which woman was organized, has been insisted upon by the writers who have most vehemently argued in favor of the superiority of man, a superiority not in degree, but essence. Though, to soften the argument, they have labored to prove, with chivalrous generosity, that the sexes ought not to be compared. Man was made to reason woman to feel, and that together, flesh and spirit, they make the most perfect whole by blending happily reason and sensibility into one character. And what is sensibility? Quickness of sensation, quickness of perception, delicacy. Thus is it defined by Dr. Johnson, and the definition gives me no other idea than of the most exquisitely polished instinct. I discern not a trace of the image of God in either sensation or matter. Refined seventy times seven, they are still material. Intellect dwells not there, nor will fire ever make lead gold. I come round to my old argument. If woman be allowed to have an immortal soul, she must have, as the employment of life, an understanding to improve. And when, to render the present state more complete, though everything proves it to be but a fraction of a mighty sum, she is incited by present gratification to forget her grand destination. Nature is counteracted, or she was born only to procreate and rot or granting brutes of every description a soul, though not a reasonable one, the exercise of instinct and sensibility may be the step which they are to take in this life towards the attainment of reason in the next, so that through all eternity they will lag behind man who, why we cannot tell, had the power given him of attaining reason in his first mode of existence. When I treat of the peculiar duties of women, as I should treat of the peculiar duties of a citizen or father, it will be found that I do not mean to insinuate that they should be taken out of their families, speaking of the majority. He that hath wife and children, says Lord Bacon, hath given hostages to fortune, for they are impediments to great enterprises, either of virtue or mischief. Certainly the best works, and of greatest merit for the public, have proceeded from the unmarried or childless men. I say the same of women. But the welfare of society is not built on extraordinary exertions, and were it more reasonably organized, there would be still less need of great abilities or heroic virtues. In the regulation of a family, in the education of children, understanding, in an unsophisticated sense, is particularly required. Strength both of body and mind. Yet the men who, by their writings, have most earnestly labored to domesticate women, have endeavored by arguments dictated by a gross appetite that satiety had rendered fastidious to weaken their bodies and cramp their minds. But if even by these sinister methods they really persuaded women, by working on their feelings, to stay at home and fulfill the duties of a mother and mistress of a family, I should cautiously oppose opinions that led women to right conduct by prevailing on them to make the discharge of a duty the business of life, though reason were insulted. Yet, and I appeal to experience, if by neglecting the understanding they are as much, nay, 
more attached from these domestic duties than they could be by the most serious intellectual pursuit, though it may be observed that the mass of mankind will never vigorously pursue an intellectual object, I may be allowed to infer that reason is absolutely necessary to enable a woman to perform any duty properly, and I must again repeat that sensibility is not reason. The comparison with the rich still occurs to me, for when men neglect the duties of humanity, women will do the same. A common stream hurries them both along with thoughtless celerity. Riches and honors prevent a man from enlarging his understanding and enervate all his powers by reversing the order of nature, which has ever made true pleasure the reward of labor. Pleasure, enervating pleasure, is likewise within woman's reach without earning it, but till hereditary possessions are spread abroad, how can we expect men to be proud of virtue? And till they are, women will govern them by the most direct means, neglecting their dull domestic duties to catch the pleasure that is on the wing of time. The power of women, says some author, is her sensibility and men not aware of the consequence do all they can to make this power swallow up every other. Those who constantly employ their sensibility will have the most. For example, poets, painters, and composers. Yet, when the sensibility is thus increased at the expense of reason and even the imagination, why do philosophical men complain of their fickleness? The sexual attention of man particularly acts on female sensibility, and this sympathy has been exercised from their youth up. A husband cannot long pay those attentions with the passion necessary to excite lively emotions, and the heart accustomed to lively emotions turns to a new lover or pines in secret, the prey of virtue or prudence. I mean, when the heart has been really rendered susceptible and the taste formed, for I am apt to conclude from what I have seen in fashionable life, that vanity is oftener fostered than sensibility by the mode of education and the intercourse between the sexes which I have reprobated, and that coquetry more frequently proceeds from vanity than from that inconstancy which overstrained sensibility naturally produces. Another argument that has had a great weight with me must, I think, have some force with every considerate benevolent heart. Girls who have been thus weakly educated are often cruelly left by their parents without any provision, and, of course, are dependent on not only the reason, but the bounty of their brothers. These brothers are to view the fairest side of the question, good sort of men, and give as a favor what children of the same parents had an equal right to. In this equivocal, humiliating situation, a docile female may remain some time with a tolerable degree of comfort. But when the brother marries, a probable circumstance, from being considered as the mistress of the family, she is viewed with averted looks as an intruder, an unnecessary burden on the benevolence of the master of the house and his new partner. Who can recount the misery which many unfortunate beings, whose minds and bodies are equally weak, suffer in such situations, unable to work and ashamed to beg? The wife, a cold-hearted, narrow-minded woman, and this is not an unfair supposition, for the present mode of education does not tend to enlarge the heart any more than the understanding, is jealous of the little kindness which her husband shows to his relations, and her sensibility not rising to humanity, she is displeased at seeing the property of her children lavished on an helpless sister. 
These are matters of fact which have come under my eye again and again. The consequence is obvious. The wife has recourse to cunning to undermine the habitual affection which she is afraid openly to oppose, and neither tears nor caresses are spared till the spy is worked out of her home and thrown on the world unprepared for its difficulties, or sent as a great effort of generosity or from some regard to propriety with a small stipend and an uncultivated mind into joyless solitude. These two women may be much upon a par with respect to reason and humanity, and changing situations might have acted just the same selfish part. But had they been differently educated, the case would also have been very different. The wife would not have had that sensibility of which self is the center, and reason might have taught her not to expect and not even to be flattered by the affection of her husband if it led him to violate prior duties. She would wish not to love him merely because he loved her, but on account of his virtues. And the sister might have been able to struggle for herself instead of eating the bitter bread of dependence. I am indeed persuaded that the heart as well as the understanding is opened by cultivation and by, which may not appear so clear, strengthening the organs. I am not now talking of momentary flashes of sensibility, but of affections. And perhaps in the education of both sexes, the most difficult task is so to adjust instruction as not to narrow the understanding, whilst the heart is warmed by the generous juices of spring, just raised by the electric fermentation of the season, nor to dry up the feelings by employing the mind in investigations remote from life. With respect to women, when they receive a careful education, they are either made fine ladies, brimful of sensibility and teeming with capricious fancies, or mere notable women. The latter are often friendly, honest creatures, and have a shrewd kind of good sense, joined with worldly prudence, that often render them more useful members of society than the fine sentimental lady, though they possess neither greatness of mind nor taste. The intellectual world is shut against them. Take them out of their family or neighborhood, and they stand still. The mind finding no employment, for literature affords a fund of amusement, which they have never sought to relish, but frequently to despise. The sentiments and taste of more cultivated minds appear ridiculous, even in those whom chance and family connections have led them to love. But in mere acquaintance, they think it all affectation. A man of sense can only love such a woman on account of her sex, and respect her because she is a trusty servant. He lets her, to preserve his own peace, scold the servants and go to church in clothes made of the very best materials. A man of her own size of understanding would probably not agree so well with her, for he might wish to encroach on her prerogative and manage some domestic concerns himself. Yet women whose minds are not enlarged by cultivation or the natural selfishness of sensibility expanded by reflection are very unfit to manage a family. For by an undue stretch of power, they are always tyrannizing to support a superiority that only rests on the arbitrary distinction of fortune. The evil is sometimes more serious and domestics are deprived of innocent indulgences and made to work beyond their strength in order to enable the notable woman to keep a better table and outshine her neighbors in finery and parade. If she attend to her children, it is, in general, to dress them in a costly manner. And whether this attention arises from vanity or fondness, it is equally pernicious. Besides, how many women of this description pass their days 
or at least their evenings, discontentedly. Their husbands acknowledge that they are good managers and chaste wives, but leave home to seek for more agreeable, may I be allowed to use a significant French word, piquant society, and the patient drudge who fulfills her task like a blind horse in a mill is defrauded of her just reward, for the wages due to her are the caresses of her husband, and women who have so few resources in themselves do not very patiently bear this privation of a natural right. A fine lady, on the contrary, has been taught to look down with contempt on the vulgar employments of life. Though she has only been incited to acquire accomplishments that rise a degree above sense. For even corporeal accomplishments cannot be acquired with any degree of precision unless the understanding has been strengthened by exercise. Without a foundation of principles, taste is superficial, and grace must arise from something deeper than imitation. The imagination, however, is heated, and the feelings rendered fastidious, if not sophisticated, or a counterpoise of judgment is not acquired when the heart still remains artless, though it becomes too tender. These women are often amiable, and their hearts are really more sensible to general benevolence, more alive to the sentiments that civilize life than the square-elbowed family drudge. But wanting a due proportion of reflection and self-government, they only inspire love, and are the mistresses of their husbands whilst they have any hold on their affections, and the platonic friends of his male acquaintance. These are the fair defects in nature, the women who appear to be created not to enjoy the fellowship of man, but to save him from sinking into absolute brutality by rubbing off the rough angles of his character and by playful dalliance to give some dignity to the appetite that draws him to them. Gracious creator of the whole human race, hast thou created such a being as woman who can trace thy wisdom in thy works and feel that thou alone art by thy nature exalted above her for no better purpose? Can she believe that she was only made to submit to man her equal, a being who, like her, was sent into the world to acquire virtue? Can she consent to be occupied merely to please him, merely to adorn the earth when her soul is capable of rising to thee? And can she rest supinely dependent on man for reason, when she ought to mount with him the arduous steeps of knowledge. Yet, if love be the supreme good, let woman be only educated to inspire it, and let every charm be polished to intoxicate the senses. But if they are moral beings, let them have a chance to become intelligent, and let love to man be only a part of that glowing flame of universal love, which after encircling humanity, mounts in grateful incense to God. To fulfill domestic duties, much resolution is necessary, and a serious kind of perseverance that requires a more firm support than emotions, however lively and true to nature. To give an example of order, the soul of virtue, some austerity of behavior must be adopted scarcely to be expected from a being who, from its infancy, has been made the weathercock of its own sensations. Whoever rationally means to be useful must have a plan of conduct, and in the discharge of the simplest duty, we are often obliged to act contrary to the present impulse of tenderness or compassion. Severity is frequently the most certain as well as the most sublime proof of affection, and the want of this power over the feelings, and of that lofty, dignified affection, 
which makes a person prefer the future good of the beloved object to a present gratification, is the reason why so many fond mothers spoil their children and has made it questionable whether negligence or indulgence is most hurtful. But I am inclined to think that the latter has done most harm. End of the second section of Chapter 4 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California For LibriVox Fall 2006This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Vindication of the Rights of Woman by Mary Wollstonecraft From Chapter 4 Observations on the State of Degradation to Which Woman is Reduced by Various Causes Part 3 Mankind seem to agree that children should be left under the management of women during their childhood. Now, from all the observation that I have been able to make, women of sensibility are the most unfit for this task, because they will infallibly, carried away by their feelings, spoil a child's temper. The management of the temper, the first and most important branch of education, requires the sober, steady eye of reason, a plan of conduct equally distant from tyranny and indulgence. Yet these are the extremes that people of sensibility alternately fall into, always shooting beyond the mark. I have followed this train of reasoning much further, till I have concluded that a person of genius is the most improper person to be employed in education, public or private. Minds of this rare species see things too much in masses, and seldom, if ever, have a good temper. That habitual cheerfulness, termed good humor, is perhaps as seldom united with great mental powers as with strong feelings. And those people who follow with interest and admiration the flights of genius, or with cooler approbation suck in the instruction, which has been elaborately prepared for them by the profound thinker, ought not to be disgusted if they find the former choleric and the latter morose, because liveliness of fancy and a tenacious comprehension of mind are scarcely compatible with that pliant urbanity which leads a man at least to bend to the opinions and prejudices of others instead of roughly confronting them. But treating of education or manners, minds of a superior class are not to be considered. They may be left to chance. It is the multitude with moderate abilities who call for instruction and catch the color of the atmosphere they breathe. This respectable concourse, I contend, Men and women should not have their sensations heightened in the hotbed of luxurious indolence at the expense of their understanding. For unless there be a ballast of understanding, they will never become either virtuous or free. An aristocracy, founded on property or sterling talents, will ever sweep before it the alternately timid and ferocious slaves of feeling. Numberless are the arguments, to take another view of the subject, brought forward with a show of reason, because supposed to be deduced from nature that men have used morally and physically to degrade the sex. I must notice a few. The female understanding has often been spoken of with contempt, as arriving sooner at maturity than the male. I shall not answer this argument by alluding to the early proofs of reason, as well as genius, in Cowley, Milton, and Pope. Many other names might be added. But only appeal to experience to decide whether young men who are early introduced into company, and examples now abound, do not acquire the same precocity. So notorious is this fact that the bare mentioning of it must bring before people who at all mix in the world the idea of a number of swaggering apes of men whose understandings are narrowed by being brought into the society of men when they ought to have been spinning a top or twirling a hoop. It has also been asserted by some naturalists that men do not attain their full growth and strength till thirty but that women arrive at maturity by twenty. I apprehend that they reason on false ground, led astray by the male prejudice, which deems beauty the perfection of woman, mere beauty of features and complexion, the vulgar acceptation of the world, 
whilst male beauty is allowed to have some connection with the mind. Strength of body and that character of countenance, which the French term a physiognomy, women do not acquire before thirty any more than men. The little artless tricks of children, it is true, are particularly pleasing and attractive. Yet, when the pretty freshness of youth is worn off, these artless graces become studied airs, and disgust every person of taste. In the countenance of girls we only look for vivacity and bashful modesty, but the spring-tide of life over we look for soberer sense in the face, and for traces of passion, instead of the dimples of animal spirits, expecting to see individuality of character the only fastener of the affections. We then wish to converse, not to fondle, to give scope to our imaginations as well as to the sensations of our hearts. At twenty the beauty of both sexes is equal, but the libertinism of man leads him to make the distinction, and superannotated coquettes are commonly of the same opinion, for when they can no longer inspire love, they pay for the vigor and vivacity of youth. The French, who admit more of mind into their notions of beauty, give the preference to women of thirty. I mean to say that they allow women to be in their most perfect state, when vivacity gives place to reason, and to that majestic seriousness of character which marks maturity, or the resting point. In youth, till twenty the body shoots out, till thirty the solids are attaining a degree of density, and the flexible muscles, growing daily more rigid, give character to the countenance, that is, they trace the operations of the mind with the iron pen of fate, and tell us not only what powers are within, but how they have been employed. It is proper to observe that animals who arrive slowly at maturity are the longest lived, and of the noblest species. Men cannot, however, claim any natural superiority from the grandeur of longevity, for in this respect nature has not distinguished the male. Polygamy is another physical degradation and a plausible argument for a custom that blasts every domestic virtue is drawn from the well-attested fact that in the countries where it is established more females are born than males. This appears to be an indication of nature, and to nature apparently reasonable speculations must yield. A further conclusion obviously presents itself. If polygamy be necessary, woman must be inferior to man and made for him. With respect to the formation of the fetus in the womb, we are very ignorant, but it appears to me probable that an accidental physical cause may account for this phenomenon, and prove it not to be a law of nature. I have met with some pertinent observations on the subject in Forster's account of the Isles of the South Sea that will explain my meaning. After observing that of the two sexes amongst animals, the most vigorous and hottest constitution always prevails and produces its kind, he adds, if this be applied to the inhabitants of Africa, it is evident that the men there, accustomed to polygamy, are enervated by the use of so many women, and therefore less vigorous. The women, on the contrary, are of a hotter constitution, not only on account of their more irritable nerves, more sensitive organization, and more lively fancy, but likewise because they are deprived in their matrimony of that share of physical love which in a monogamous condition would all be theirs and thus, for the above reasons, the generality of children are born females. In the greater part of Europe it has been proved by the most accurate lists of mortality that the proportion of men to women is nearly equal, or, if any difference takes place, the males born are more numerous in the proportion of 105 to 100. The necessity of polygamy, therefore, does not appear. Yet when a man seduces a woman, it should, I think, be termed a left-handed marriage, and the man should be legally obliged to maintain the woman and her children, unless adultery, a natural divorcement, abrogated the law. And this law should remain in force as long as the weakness of women caused the word seduction to be used as an excuse for their frailty and want of principle, nay, while they depend on man for a subsistence, instead of earning it by the exercise of their own hands or heads. But these women should not in the full meaning of the relationship be termed wives, or the very purpose of marriage would be subverted, and all those endearing charities that flow from personal fidelity and give a sanctity to the tie, when neither love nor friendship unites the hearts, would melt into selfishness. The woman who is faithful to the father of her children demands respect, and should not be treated like a prostitute. Though I readily grant 
that if it be necessary for a man and woman to live together in order to bring up their offspring, nature never intended that a man should have more than one wife. Still, highly as I respect marriage, as the foundation of almost every social virtue, I cannot avoid feeling the most lively compassion for those unfortunate females who are broken off from society, and by one error torn from all those affections and relationships that improve the heart and mind. It does not frequently even deserve the name of error, for many innocent girls become the dupes of a sincere affectionate heart, and still more are, as it may emphatically be termed, ruined before they know the difference between virtue and vice. And thus prepared by their education for infamy, they become infamous. Asylums and Magdalens are not the proper remedies for these abuses. It is justice, not charity, that is wanting in the world. A woman who has lost her honor imagines that she cannot fall lower, and as for recovering her former station, it is impossible. No exertion can wash this stain away. Losing thus every spur, and having no other means of support, prostitution becomes her only refuge, and the character is quickly depraved by circumstances over which the poor wretch has little power, unless she possesses an uncommon portion of sense and loftiness of spirit. Necessity never makes prostitution the business of men's lives, though numberless are the women who are thus rendered systematically vicious. This, however, arises, in a great degree, from the state of idleness in which women are educated, who are always taught to look up to man for a maintenance, and to consider their persons as the proper return for his exertions to support them. Meretricious airs and the whole science of wantonness has then a more powerful stimulus than either appetite or vanity. And this remark gives force to the prevailing opinion, that with chastity all is lost that is respectable in a woman. Her character depends on the observance of one virtue, though the only passion fostered in her heart is love. Nay, the honor of a woman is not made even to depend on her will. When Richardson makes Clarissa tell Lovelace that he had robbed her of her honor, he must have had strange notions of honor and virtue. For miserable beyond all names of misery is the condition of a being who could be degraded without its own consent. This excess of strictness I have heard vindicated as a salutary error. I shall answer in the words of Leibniz. Errors are often useful, but it is commonly to remedy other errors. Most of the evils of life arise from a desire to present enjoyment that outruns itself. The obedience required of women in the marriage state comes under this description. The mind, naturally weakened by depending on authority, never exerts its own powers, and the obedient wife is thus rendered a weak, indolent mother. Or, supposing that this is not always the consequence, a future state of existence is scarcely taken into the reckoning when only negative virtues are cultivated. For in treating of morals, particularly when women are alluded to, writers have too often considered virtue in a very limited sense, and made the foundation of it solely worldly utility. Nay, a still more fragile base has been given to this stupendous fabric, and the wayward fluctuating feelings of men have been made the standard of virtue. Yes, virtue, as well as religion, has been subjected to the decisions of taste. It would almost provoke a smile of contempt if the vain absurdities of man did not strike us on all sides to observe how eager men are to degrade the sex from whom they pretend to receive the chief pleasure of life, and I have frequently, with full conviction, retorted Pope's sarcasm on them, or, to speak explicitly, it has appeared to me applicable to the whole human race. A love of pleasure or sway seems to divide mankind, and the husband who lords it in his little harem thinks only of his pleasure or his convenience. To such lengths, indeed, does an intemperate love of pleasure carry some prudent men, or worn-out libertines, who marry to have a safe companion, that they seduce their own wives. Hymen banishes modesty, and chaste love takes its flight. Love, considered as an animal appetite, cannot long feed on itself without expiring, and this extinction in its own flame may be termed the violent death of love but the wife who has thus been rendered licentious will probably endeavor to fill the void left by the loss of her husband's attentions, for she cannot contentedly become merely an upper servant after having been treated like a goddess. She is still handsome, and instead of transferring her fondness to her children, she only dreams of enjoying the sunshine of life. 
Besides, there are many husbands so devoid of sense and parental affection that during the first effervescence of voluptuous fondness they refuse to let their wives suckle their children. They are only to dress and live to please them, and love, even innocent love, soon sinks into lasciviousness when the exercise of a duty is sacrificed to its indulgence. Personal attachment is a very happy foundation for friendship. Yet, when even two virtuous young people marry, it would perhaps be happy if some circumstance checked their passion, if the recollection of some prior attachment or disappointed affection made it on one side, at least, rather a match founded on esteem. In that case, they would look beyond the present moment and try to render the whole of life respectable by forming a plan to regulate a friendship which only death ought to dissolve. Friendship is a serious affection, the most sublime of all affections, because it is founded on principle and cemented by time. The very reverse may be said of love. In a great degree, love and friendship cannot subsist in the same bosom. Even when inspired by different objects, they weaken or destroy each other, and for the same object can only be felt in succession. The vain fears and fond jealousies, the winds which fan the flame of love, when judiciously or artfully tempered, are both incompatible with the tender confidence and sincere respect of friendship. Love, such as the glowing pen of genius has traced, exists not on earth, or only resides in those exalted, fervid imaginations that have sketched such dangerous pictures. Dangerous because they not only afford a plausible excuse to the voluptuary who disguises sheer sensuality under a sentimental veil, but as they spread affectation and take from the dignity of virtue. Virtue, as the very word imports, should have an appearance of seriousness, if not austerity, and to endeavor to trick her out in the garb of pleasure, because the epithet has been used as another name for beauty, is to exalt her on a quicksand, a most insidious attempt to hasten her fall by apparent respect. Virtue and pleasure are not, in fact, so nearly allied in this life as some eloquent writers have labored to prove. Pleasure prepares the fading wreath and mixes the intoxicating cup. But the fruit which virtue gives is the recompense of toil, and gradually seen as it ripens only affords calm satisfaction. Nay, appearing to be the result of the natural tendency of things, it is scarcely observed. Bread, the common food of life, seldom thought of as a blessing, supports the constitution, and preserves health, still feasts to light the heart of man, though disease and even death lurk in the cup or dainty that elevates the spirits or tickles the palate. The lively heated imagination in the same style draws the picture of love as it draws every other picture with those glowing colors which the daring hand will steal from the rainbow that is directed by a mind condemned in a world like this to prove its noble origin by panting after unattainable perfection ever pursuing what it acknowledges to be a fleeting dream. An imagination of this vigorous cast can give existence to insubstantial forms, and stability to the shadowy reveries which the mind naturally falls into when realities are found vapid. It can then depict love with celestial charms, and dote on the grand ideal object. It can imagine a degree of mutual affection that shall refine the soul, and not expire when it has served as a scale too heavenly, and like devotion make it absorb every meaner affection and desire. In each other's arms, as in a temple, with its summit lost in the clouds, the world is to be shut out, and every thought and wish that do not nurture pure affection and permanent virtue. Permanent virtue, alas! Rousseau, respectable visionary, thy paradise would soon be violated by the entrance of some unexpected guest, like Milton's, it would only contain angels, or men sunk below the dignity of rational creatures. Happiness is not material, it cannot be seen or felt. Yet the eager pursuit of the good which every one shapes to his own fancy proclaims man the lord of this lower world, and to be an intelligential creature who is not to receive but acquire happiness. They, therefore, who complain of the delusions of passion, do not recollect that they are exclaiming against a strong proof of the immortality of the soul. But leaving superior minds to correct themselves, and pay dearly for their experience, it is necessary to observe that it is not against strong, persevering passions, but romantic, wavering feelings, that I wish to guard the female heart 
by exercising the understanding, for these paradisical reveries are oftener the effect of idleness than of a lively fancy. Women have seldom sufficient serious employment to silence their feelings. A round of little cares or vain pursuits, frittering away all strength of mind and organs, they become naturally only objects of sense. In short, the whole tenor of female education, the education of society, tends to render the best disposed, romantic and inconstant, and the remainder vain and mean. In the present state of society, this evil can scarcely be remedied, I am afraid, in the slightest degree. Should a more laudable ambition ever gain ground, they may be brought nearer to nature and reason, and become more virtuous and useful as they grow more respectable. But I will venture to assert that their reason will never acquire sufficient strength to enable it to regulate their conduct, whilst the making an appearance in the world is the first wish of the majority of mankind. To this weak wish the natural affections and the most useful virtues are sacrificed. Girls marry merely to better themselves, to borrow a significant vulgar phrase, and have such perfect power over their hearts as not to permit themselves to fall in love until a man with a superior fortune offers. On this subject I mean to enlarge in a future chapter. It is only necessary to drop a hint at present, because women are so often degraded by suffering the selfish prudence of age to chill the ardor of youth. From the same source flows an opinion that young girls ought to dedicate great part of their time to needlework, yet this employment contracts their faculties more than any other that could have been chosen for them, by confining their thoughts to their persons. Men order their clothes to be made, and have done with the subject. Women make their own clothes, necessary or ornamental, and are continually talking about them, and their thoughts follow their hands. It is not indeed the making of necessaries that weakens the mind, but the frippery of dress. For when a woman in the lower rank of life makes her husband's and children's clothes, she does her duty. This is part of her business. But when women work only to dress better than they could otherwise afford, it is worse than sheer loss of time. To render the poor virtuous, they must be employed, and women in the middle rank of life, did they not ape the fashions of the nobility, without catching their ease, might employ them, whilst they themselves managed their families, instructed their children, and exercised their own minds. Gardening, experimental philosophy, and literature would afford them subjects to think of, and matter for conversation, that in some degree would exercise their understandings. The conversation of French women, who are not so rigidly nailed to their chairs, to twist lappets and knot ribbons, is frequently superficial, but I contend that it is not half so insipid as that of those English women, whose time is spent in making caps, bonnets, and the whole mischief of trimmings, not to mention shopping, bargain hunting, etc., etc., and it is the decent, prudent women who are most degraded by these practices, for their motive is simply vanity. The wanton, who exercises her taste to render her person alluring, has something more in view. These observations all branch out of a general one, which I have before made, and which cannot be too often insisted upon, for, speaking of men, women, or professions, it will be found that the employment of the thoughts shapes the character both generally and individually. The thoughts of women ever hover around their persons, and is it surprising that their persons are reckoned most valuable? Yet some degree of liberty of mind is necessary even to form the person, and this may be one reason why some gentle wives have so few attractions besides that of sex. Add to this, sedentary employments render the majority of women sickly, and false notions of female excellence make them proud of this delicacy, though it be another fetter that by calling the attention continually to the body cramps the activity of the mind. Women of quality seldom do any of the manual part of their dress. Consequently, only their taste is exercised, and they acquire, by thinking less of the finery, when the business of their toilet is over, that ease which seldom appears in the deportment of women who dress merely for the sake of dressing. In fact, the observation with respect to the middle rank, the one in which talents thrive best, extends not to women, for those of the superior class by catching, at least a smattering of literature, and conversing more with men on general topics, acquire more knowledge than the women who ape their fashions and faults without sharing their advantages. With respect to virtue, to use the word in a comprehensive sense, 
I have seen most in low life. Many poor women maintain their children by the sweat of their brow, and keep together families that the vices of the fathers would have scattered abroad. But gentlewomen are too indolent to be actively virtuous, and are softened rather than refined by civilization. Indeed, the good sense which I have met with among the poor women who have had few advantages of education, and yet have acted heroically, strongly confirmed me in the opinion that trifling employments have rendered women a trifler. Men, taking her, I take her body, says Ranger, body, the mind is left to rust, so that while physical love enervates man, as being his favorite recreation, he will endeavor to enslave woman. And who can tell how many generations may be necessary to give vigor to the virtue and talents of the freed posterity of abject slaves? Supposing that women are voluntary slaves, slavery of any kind is unfavorable to human happiness and improvement. Knox's Essays In tracing the causes that, in my opinion, have degraded woman, I have confined my observations to such as universally act upon the morals and manners of the whole sex, and to me it appears clear that they all spring from want of understanding. Whether this arises from a physical or accidental weakness of faculties, time alone can determine, for I shall not lay any great stress upon the example of a few women, Sappho, Eloisa, Mrs. Macaulay, the Empress of Russia, Madame Dion, etc., these and many more may be reckoned exceptions, and are not all heroes as well as heroines exceptions to the general rules? I wish to see women neither heroines nor brutes, but reasonable creatures, who, from having received a masculine education, have acquired courage and resolution. I only contend that the men who have been placed in similar situations have acquired a similar character. I speak of bodies of men and that men of genius and talents have started out of a class in which women have never yet been placed. End of chapter 4Vindication of the Rights of Women by Mary Wollstonecraft Chapter 5, Part 1 Animadversions on some of the writers who have rendered women objects of pity, bordering on contempt. The opinions speciously supported in some modern publications on the female character and education, which have given the tone to most of the observations made in a more cursory manner on the sex, remain now to be examined. Section 5.1 I shall begin with Rousseau, and give a sketch of the character of women in his own words, interspersing comments and reflections. My comments, it is true, will all spring from a few simple principles, and might have been deduced from what I have already said, but the artificial structure has been raised with so much ingenuity that it seems necessary to attack it in a more circumstantial manner and make the application myself. Sophia, says Rousseau, should be as perfect a woman as Emilius is a man, and to render her so, it is necessary to examine the character which nature has given to the sex. He then proceeds to prove that women ought to be weak and passive, because she has less bodily strength than man, and from hence infers that she was formed to please, and to be subject to him and that it is her duty to render herself agreeable to her master, this being the grand end of her existence. Supposing woman to have been formed only to please, and be subject to man, the conclusion is just. She ought to sacrifice every other consideration to render herself agreeable to him, and let this brutal desire of self-preservation be the grand spring of all her actions, when it is proved to be the iron bed of fate, to fit which her character should be stretched or contracted, regardless of all moral or physical distinctions. But if, as I think may be demonstrated, the purposes of even this life, viewing the whole, are subverted by practical rules built upon this ignoble base, I may be allowed to doubt whether woman was created for man. And though the cry of irreligion, or even atheism, be raised against me, I will simply declare that were an angel from heaven to tell me that Moses is beautiful, 
poetical cosmogony, and the account of the fall of man were literally true. I could not believe what my reason told me was derogatory to the character of the Supreme Being, and having no fear of the devil before mine eyes, I venture to call this a suggestion of reason, instead of resting my weakness on the broad shoulders of the first seducer of my frail sex. It being once demonstrated, continues Rousseau, that man and woman are not, nor ought to be, constituted alike in temperament and character, it follows, of course, that they should not be educated in the same manner. In pursuing the directions of nature, they ought indeed to act in concert, but they should not be engaged in the same employments. The end of their pursuits should be the same, but the means they should take to accomplish them, and of consequence their tastes and inclinations, should be different. Rousseau's Emilius, Volume 3, page 176 Girls are, from their earliest infancy, fond of dress. Not content with being pretty, they are desirous of being thought so. We see, by all their little airs, that this thought engages their attention, and they are hardly capable of understanding what is said to them before they are to be governed by talking to them of what people will think of their behaviour. The same motive, however, indiscreetly made use of with boys, has not the same effect provided they are let to pursue their amusements at pleasure, they care very little what people think of them. Time and pains are necessary to subject boys to this motive. Whencesoever girls derive this first lesson, it is a very good one. As the body is born, in a manner before the soul, our first concern should be to cultivate the former. This order is common to both sexes, but the object of that cultivation is different. In the one sex, it is the development of corporeal powers, in the other, that of personal charms. Not that either the quality of strength or beauty ought to be confined exclusively to one sex, but only that the order of the cultivation of both is in that respect reversed. Women certainly require as much strength as to enable them to move and act gracefully, and men as much address as to qualify them to act with ease. Children of both sexes have a great many amusements in common, and so they ought. Have they not also many such when they are grown up? Each sex also has its peculiar taste to distinguish in this particular. Boys love sports of noise and activity, to beat the drum, to whip the top, and to drag about their little carts. Girls, on the other hand, are fonder of things of show and ornament, such as mirrors, trinkets, and dolls. The doll is the peculiar amusement of the females." from whence we see their taste plainly adapted to their destination. The physical part of the art of pleasing lies in dress, and this is all which children are capacitated to cultivate of that art. Here, then, we see a primary propensity firmly established, which you need only to pursue and regulate. The little creature will doubtless be very desirous to know how to dress up her doll, to make its sleeve knots, its flounces, its headdress, etc., she is obliged to have so much recourse to the people about her, for their assistance in these articles, that it would be much more agreeable to her to owe them all to her own industry. Hence we have a good reason for these first lessons which are usually taught these young females, in which we do not appear to be setting them a task, but obliging them, by instructing them in what is immediately useful to themselves. And in fact, almost all of them learn with reluctance to read and write, but very readily apply themselves to the use of their needles. They imagine themselves already grown up, and think with pleasure that such qualifications will enable them to decorate themselves. End quote. This is certainly only an education of the body, but Rousseau is not the only man who has indirectly said that merely the person of a young woman, without any mind, unless animal spirits come under that description, is very pleasing. To render it weak, and what some may call beautiful, the understanding is neglected, and girls forced to sit still, play with dolls, and listen to foolish conversations. The effect of habit is insisted upon as an undoubted indication of nature. I know it was Rousseau's opinion that the first years of youth should be employed to form the body, though in educating Amelius he deviates from this plan. Yet the difference between strengthening the body, on which strength of mind in a very great measure depends, and only giving it an easy motion, is very wide. Rousseau's observations, it is proper to remark, were made in a country where the art of pleasing was refined only to extract the grossness of vice. 
he did not go back to nature, or his ruling appetite disturbed the operations of reason, else he would not have drawn these crude inferences. In France, boys and girls, particularly the latter, are only educated to please, to manage their persons, and regulate their exterior behaviour and their minds are corrupted at a very early age by the worldly and pious cautions they receive to guard them against immodesty. I speak of pastimes, the very confessions which mere children are obliged to make, and the questions asked by the holy men I assert these facts on good authority were sufficient to impress a sexual character, and the education of society was a school of coquetry and art. At the age of ten or eleven, nay, often much sooner, girls began to coquette, and talked, unreproved, of establishing themselves in the world by marriage. In short, they were made women, almost from their very birth, and compliments were listened to instead of instruction. These, weakening the mind, nature was supposed to have acted like a stepmother when she formed this afterthought of creation. Not allowing them understanding, however, it was but consistent to subject them to authority, independent of reason, and to prepare them for this subjection. He gives the following advice, quote, Girls ought to be active and diligent, nor is that all. They should also be early subjected to restraint. This misfortune, if it really be one, is inseparable from their sex, nor do they ever throw it off but to suffer more cruel evils. They must be subject all their lives to the most constant and severe restraint, which is that of decorum. It is therefore necessary to accustom them early to such confinement that it may not afterward cost them too dear, and to the suppression of their caprices, that they may the more readily submit to the will of others. If, indeed, they are fond of being always at work, they should be sometimes compelled to lay it aside. Dissipation, levity, and inconstancy are faults that readily spring up from their first propensities, when corrupted or perverted by too much indulgence. To prevent this abuse, we should learn them, above all things, to lay a due restraint on themselves. The life of a modest woman is reduced, by our absurd institutions, to a perpetual conflict within herself. Not but it is just that this sex should partake of the sufferings which arise from those evils it has caused us. End quote. And why is the life of a modest woman a perpetual conflict? I should answer that this very system of education makes it so. Modesty, temperance, and self-denial are the sober offspring of reason, but when sensibility is nurtured at the expense of understanding, such weak beings must be restrained by arbitrary means, and be subjected to continual conflicts, but give their activity of mind wider range, and nobler passions and motives will govern their appetites and sentiments. Quote, the common attachment and regard of a mother Nay, mere habit will make her beloved by her children if she does nothing to incur their hate. Even the restraint she lays them under, if well directed, will increase their affection instead of lessening it, because a state of dependence being natural to the sex, they perceive themselves formed for obedience. End quote. This is begging the question. For servitude not only debases the individual, but its effects seem to be transmitted to posterity. Considering the length of time that women have been dependent, is it surprising that some of them hug their chains and fawn like the spaniel? These dogs, observes a naturalist, at first kept their ears erect, but custom has superseded nature, and a token of fear is become a beauty. Quote, For the same reason, adds Rousseau, women have or ought to have but little liberty. They are apt to indulge themselves excessively in what is allowed them. Addicted in everything to extremes, they are even more transported at their diversions than boys. End quote. The answer to this is very simple. Slaves and mobs have always indulged themselves in the same excesses when once they broke loose from authority. The bent bow recoils with violence when the hand is suddenly relaxed that forcibly held it, and sensibility, the plaything of outward circumstances, must be subjected to authority or moderated by reason. There results, he continues, from this habitual restraint, a tractableness which the women have occasion for during their whole lives, as they constantly remain either under subjection to the men, or to the opinions of mankind, and are never permitted to set themselves above these opinions. The first, 
and most important qualification in a woman is good nature or sweetness of temper formed to obey a being so imperfect as man often full of vices and always full of faults she ought to learn betimes even to suffer injustice and to bear the insults of a husband without complaint it is not for his sake but her own that she should be of a mild disposition the perverseness and ill-nature of the women only serve to aggravate their own misfortunes and the misconduct of their husbands they might plainly perceive that such are not the arms by which they gain the superiority End quote. formed to live with such an imperfect being as man they ought to learn from the exercise of their faculties the necessity of forbearance but all the sacred rights of humanity are violated by insisting on blind obedience or the most sacred rights belong only to man the being who patiently endures injustice and silently bears insults will soon become unjust or unable to discern right from wrong besides i deny the fact this is not the true way to form or meliorate the temper for as a sex men have better tempers than women because they are occupied by pursuits that interest the head as well as the heart and the steadiness of the head gives a healthy temperature to the heart people of sensibility have seldom good tempers the formation of the temper is the cool work of reason when as life advances she mixes with happy art jarring elements i never knew a weak or ignorant person who had a good temper though that constitutional good humour and that docility which fear stamps on the behaviour often obtains the name i say behaviour for genuine meekness never reached the heart or mind unless as the effect of reflection and that simple restraint produces a number of peccant humours in domestic life many sensible men will allow who find some of these gentle irritable creatures very troublesome companions each sex he further argues should preserve its peculiar tone and manner a meek husband may make a wife impertinent but mildness of disposition on the woman's side will always bring a man back to reason at least if he be not absolutely a brute and will sooner or later triumph over him End quote. true the mildness of reason but abject fear always inspires contempt and tears are only eloquent when they flow down fair cheeks of what materials can that heart be composed which can melt when insulted and instead of revolting at injustice kiss the rod is it unfair to infer that her virtue is built on narrow views and selfishness who can caress a man with true feminine softness the very moment when he treats her tyrannically nature never dictated such insincerity and though prudence of this sort be termed a virtue morality becomes vague when any part is supposed to rest on falsehood these are mere expedients and expedients are only useful for the moment let the husband beware of trusting too implicitly to this servile obedience for if his wife can with winning sweetness caress him when angry and when she ought to be angry unless contempt had stifled a natural effervescence she may do the same after parting with a lover these are all preparations for adultery or should the fear of the world or of hell restrain her desire of pleasing other men when she can no longer please her husband what substitute can be found by a being who was only formed by nature and art to please man what can make her amends for this privation or where is she to seek for a fresh employment where find sufficient strength of mind to determine to begin the search when her habits are fixed and vanity has long ruled her chaotic mind but this partial moralist recommends cunning systematically and plausibly Quote, daughters should always be submissive their mothers however should not be inexorable to make a young person tractable she ought not to be made unhappy to make her modest she ought not to be rendered stupid on the contrary i should not be displeased at her being permitted to use some art not to elude punishment in case of disobedience but to exempt herself from the necessity of obeying it is not necessary to make her dependence burdensome but only to let her feel it subtlety is a talent natural to the sex and as i am persuaded all our natural inclinations are right and good in themselves 
I am of the opinion that this should be cultivated as well as the others. It is requisite for us only to prevent its abuse. End quote. Whatever is, is right, he then proceeds triumphantly to infer. Granted, yet perhaps no aphorism ever contained a more paradoxical assertion. It is a solemn truth with respect to God. He, reverentially, I speak, sees the whole at once, and saw its just proportions in the womb of time. But man, who can only inspect disjointed parts, finds many things wrong, and it is a part of the system, and therefore right, that he should endeavour to alter what appears to him to be so, even while he bows to the wisdom of his Creator, and respects the darkness which he labours to disperse. The inference that follows is just, supposing the principle to be sound. The superiority of address, peculiar to the female sex, is a very equitable indemnification for their inferiority in point of strength. Without this, women would not be the companion of man, but his slave. It is by her superior art and ingenuity that she preserves her equality, and governs him while she affects to obey. Woman has everything against her, as well our faults as her timidity and weakness. She has nothing in her favour but her subtlety and her beauty. Is it not very reasonable, therefore, she should cultivate both? End quote. Greatness of mind can never dwell with cunning or address, for I shall not boggle about words when their direct signification is insincerity and falsehood, but content myself with observing that if any class of mankind be so created that it must necessarily be educated by rules not strictly deducible from truth, virtue is an affair of convention. How could Rousseau dare to assert, after giving this advice, that in the grand end of existence the object of both sexes should be the same, when he well knew that the mind formed by its pursuits is expanded by great views swallowing up little ones, or that it becomes itself little. Men have superior strength of body, but were it not for mistaken notions of beauty, women would acquire sufficient to enable them to earn their own subsistence, the true definition of independence, and to bear those bodily inconveniences and exertions that are requisite to strengthen the mind. Let us, then, by being allowed to take the same exercise as boys, not only during infancy but youth, arrive at perfection of body, that we may know how far the natural superiority of man extends. For what reason or virtue can be expected from a creature when the seed-time of life is neglected? None. Did not the winds of heaven casually scatter many useful seeds in the fallow ground? Quote, Beauty cannot be acquired by dress, and coquetry is an art not so early and speedily attained. While girls are yet young, however, they are in a capacity to study agreeable gesture, a pleasing modulation of voice, an easy carriage and behavior, as well as to take the advantage of gracefully adapting their looks and attitudes to time, place, and occasion. Their application, therefore, should not be solely confined to the arts of industry and the needle, when they come to display other talents, whose utility is already apparent. For my part, I would have a young Englishwoman cultivate her agreeable talents, in order to please her future husband, with as much care and assiduity as a young Circassian cultivates hers, to fit her for the harem of an eastern Bashaw. End quote. To render women completely insignificant, he adds, quote, The tongues of women are very voluble. They speak earlier, more readily, and more agreeably than the men. They are accused of also speaking much more. But so it ought to be, and I should be very ready to convert this reproach into a compliment. Their lips and eyes have the same activity, and for the same reason. A man speaks of what he knows, a woman of what pleases her. The one requires knowledge. The other, taste. The principal object of a man's discourse should be what is useful, that of a woman's, what is agreeable. There ought to be nothing in common between their different conversation, but truth. We ought not, therefore, to restrain the prattle of girls, in the same manner as we should that of boys, with that severe question, to what purpose are you talking, but by another, 
which is no less difficult to answer, how will your discourse be received? In infancy, while they are as yet incapable to discern good from evil, they ought to observe it as a law, never to say anything disagreeable to those whom they are speaking to. What will render the practice of this rule also the more difficult is that it must ever be subordinate to the former, of never speaking falsely or telling an untruth. End quote. To govern the tongue in this manner must require great address indeed, and it is too much practised both by men and women. Out of the abundance of the heart how few speak, so few that I, who love simplicity, would gladly give up politeness for a quarter of the virtue that has been sacrificed to an equivocal quality, which at best should be only the polish of virtue. But to complete the sketch. Quote, it is easy to be conceived that if male children are not in a capacity to form any true notions of religion, those ideas must be greatly above the conception of females. It is for this very reason I would begin to speak to them the earlier on this subject, for if we were to wait till they were in a capacity to discuss methodically such profound questions, we should run a risk of never speaking to them on this subject as long as they lived. Reason in women is a practical reason capacitating them artfully to discover the means of attaining a known end, but which would never enable them to discover that end itself. The social relations of the sexes are indeed truly admirable. From their union there results a moral person, of which women may be termed the eyes, and man the hand, with this dependence on each other, that it is from the man that the woman is to learn what she is to see, and it is of the woman that man is to learn what he ought to do. If woman could recur to the first principles of things as well as man, and man was capacitated to enter into their minutiae as well as women, always independent of each other, they would live in perpetual discord, and their union could not subsist. But in the present harmony, which naturally subsists between them, their different faculties tend to one common end. It is difficult to say which of them conduces the most to it, each follows the impulse of the other, each is obedient, and both are masters. As the conduct of a woman is subservient to the public opinion, her faith in matters of religion should for that very reason be subject to authority. Every daughter ought to be of the same religion as her mother, and every wife to be of the same religion as her husband, for though such religion should be false, that docility which induces the mother and daughter to submit to the order of nature takes away in the sight of God, the criminality of their error. Footnote. What is to be the consequence if the mother's and husband's opinion should chance not to agree? An ignorant person cannot be reasoned out of an error, and when persuaded to give up one prejudice for another, the mind is unsettled. Indeed, the husband may not have any religion to teach her, though in such a situation she will be in great want of a support to her virtue, independent of worldly considerations. The quote continues, As they are not in a capacity to judge for themselves, they ought to abide by the decision of their fathers and husbands as confidently as by that of the church. As authority ought to regulate the religion of the woman, it is not so needful to explain to them the reasons for their belief as to lay down precisely the tenets they are to believe. For the creed which presents only obscure ideas to the mind is the source of fanaticism, and that which presents absurdities leads to infidelity. End quote. Absolute, uncontroverted authority, it seems, must subsist somewhere. But is this not a direct and exclusive appropriation of reason? The rights of humanity have thus been confined to the male line from Adam downwards, Rousseau would carry his male aristocracies still further, for he insinuates that he should not blame those who contend for leaving woman in a state of the most profound ignorance, if it were not necessary, in order to preserve her chastity, and justify the man's choice in the eyes of the world, to give her a little knowledge of men, and the customs produced by human passions, else she might propagate at home without being rendered less voluptuous and innocent by the exercise of her understanding, excepting indeed during the first year of her marriage, where she might employ it to dress, like Sophia, quote, 
Her dress is extremely modest in appearance, and yet very coquettish in fact. She does not make a display of her charms. She conceals them. But in concealing them she knows how to affect your imagination. Every one who sees her will say, There is a modest and discreet girl. But while you are near her, your eyes and affections wander all over her person, so that you cannot withdraw them, and you will conclude that every part of her dress, simple as it seems, was only put in its proper order to be taken to pieces by the imagination. End quote. Is this modesty? Is this a preparation for immortality? Again, what opinion are we to form of a system of education when the author says of his heroine that with her doing things well is but a secondary concern, her principal concern is to do them neatly? Secondary, in fact, are all her virtues and qualities. For respecting religion, he makes her parents thus address her accustomed to submission, your husband will instruct you in good time. After thus cramping a woman's mind, if in order to keep it fair he has not made it quite a blank, he advises her to reflect that a reflecting man may not yawn in her company when he is tired of caressing her. What has she to reflect about who must obey? And would it not be a refinement on cruelty only to open her mind to make the darkness and misery of her fate visible? Yet these are his sensible remarks. How consistent with what I have already been obliged to quote, to give a fair view of the subject, the reader may determine. Quote, they who pass their whole lives in working for their daily bread have no ideas beyond their business or their interest, and all their understanding seems to lie in their fingers' ends. This ignorance is neither prejudicial to their integrity nor their morals. It is often of service to them. Sometimes, by means of reflection, we are led to compound with our duty, and we conclude by substituting a jargon of words in the room of things. Our own conscience is the most enlightened philosopher. There is no need of being acquainted with Tully's offices to make a man of probity, and perhaps the most virtuous woman in the world is the least acquainted with the definition of virtue. But it is no less true that an improved understanding only can render society agreeable, and it is a melancholy thing for a father of a family, who is fond of home, to be obliged to be always wrapped up in himself, and to have nobody about him to whom he can impart his sentiments. Besides, how should a woman void of reflection be capable of educating her children? How should she discern what is proper for them? How should she incline them to those virtues she is unacquainted with, or to that merit of which she has no idea? She can only soothe or chide them, render them insolent or timid. She will make them formal coxcombs or ignorant blockheads, but will never make them sensible or amiable. End quote. How indeed should she, when her husband is not always at hand to lend her his reason, when they both together make but one moral being? A blind will, eyes without hands, would go a very little way, and perchance his abstract reason, that should concentrate the scattered beams of her practical reason, may be employed in judging the flavour of the wine, discanting on the sauces most proper for turtle, or more profoundly intent at a card-table, he may be generalising his ideas, as he bets away his fortune, leaving all the minutiae of education to his helpmate, or chance. But granting that women ought to be beautiful, innocent, and silly, to render her a more alluring and indulgent companion, what is her understanding sacrificed for? And why is all this preparation necessary only, according to Rousseau's own account, to make her the mistress of her husband a very short time? For no man ever insisted more on the transient nature of love. Thus speaks the philosopher, quote, Sensual pleasures are transient. The habitual state of the affections always loses by their gratification. The imagination, which decks the object of our desires, is lost in its fruition. Excepting the Supreme Being, who is self-existent, there is nothing beautiful but what is ideal. End quote. But he returns to his unintelligible paradoxes again, while he thus addresses Sophia. Quote, Emilius, in becoming your husband, is become your master, 
and claims your obedience. Such is the order of nature. When a man is married, however, to such a wife as Sophia, it is proper he should be directed by her. This is also agreeable to the order of nature. It is therefore to give you as much authority over his heart as his sex gives him over your person, that I have made you the arbiter of his pleasures. It may cost you, perhaps, some disagreeable self-denial, but you will be certain of maintaining your empire over him, if you can preserve it over yourself. What I have already observed also shows me that this difficult attempt does not surpass your courage. Would you have your husband constantly at your feet? Keep him at some distance from your person. You will long maintain the authority of love, if you know but how to render your favors rare and valuable. It is thus you may employ even the arts of coquetry in the service of virtue, and those of love in that of reason. End quote. I shall close my extracts with a just description of a comfortable couple. Quote, and yet you must not imagine that even such management will always suffice. Whatever precaution be taken, enjoyment will by degrees take off the edge of passion. But when love hath lasted as long as possible, a pleasing habitude supplies its place, and the attachment of a mutual confidence succeeds to the transports of passion. Children often form a more agreeable and permanent connection between married people than even love itself. When you cease to be the mistress of Emilius, you will continue to be his wife and friend. You will be the mother of his children. End quote. Rousseau's Emilius Children, he truly observes, form a much more permanent connection between married people than love. Beauty, he declares, will not be valued, or even seen, after a couple have lived six months together. Artificial graces and coquetry will likewise pall on the senses. Why then does he say that a girl should be educated for her husband with the same care as for an eastern harem? I now appeal from the reveries of fancy and refined licentiousness to the good sense of mankind, whether, if the object of education be to prepare women to become chaste wives and sensible mothers, the method so plausibly recommended in the foregoing sketch, be the best one calculated to produce those ends? Will it be allowed that the surest way to make a wife chaste is to teach her to practice the wanton arts of a mistress, termed virtuous coquetry by the sensualist who can no longer relish the artless charms of sincerity, or taste the pleasure arising from a tender intimacy when confidence is unchecked by suspicion and rendered interesting by sense? The man who can be contented to live with a pretty, useful companion without a mind has lost in voluptuous gratifications a taste for more refined employments. He has never felt the calm satisfaction that refreshes the parched heart, like the silent dew of heaven, of being beloved by one who could understand him. In the society of his wife he is still alone, unless when the man is sunk in the brute. The charm of life, says a grave philosophical reasoner, is sympathy. Nothing pleases us more than to observe in other men a fellow feeling with all the emotions of our own breast. But according to the tenor of reasoning by which women are kept from the tree of knowledge, the important years of youth, the usefulness of age, and the rational hopes of futurity, are all to be sacrificed to render woman an object of desire for a short time. Besides, how could Rousseau expect them to be virtuous and constant, when reason is neither allowed to be the foundation of their virtue, nor truth the object of their enquiries? But all Rousseau's errors arose from sensibility, and sensibility to their charms women are very ready to forgive. When he should have reasoned, he became impassioned and reflection inflamed his imagination instead of enlightening his understanding. Even his virtues also led him farther astray, for born with a warm constitution and lively fancy, nature carried him toward the other sex with such eager fondness that he soon became lascivious. Had he given way to these desires, the fire would have extinguished itself in a natural manner. But virtue, and a romantic kind of delicacy, made him practice self-denial. Yet when fear, 
delicacy or virtue restrained him, he debauched his imagination, and reflecting on the sensations to which fancy gave force, he traced them in the most glowing colours, and sunk them deep into his soul. He then sought for solitude not to sleep with the man of nature, or calmly investigate the causes of things, under the shade where Sir Isaac Newton indulged contemplation, but merely to indulge his feelings. And so warmly has he planted what he forcibly felt, that, interesting the heart and inflaming the imagination of readers, in proportion to the strength of their fancy, they imagine that their understanding is convinced, when they only sympathize with a poetic writer, who skillfully exhibits the objects of sense, most voluptuously shadowed, or gracefully veiled, and thus making us feel, whilst dreaming that we reason, erroneous conclusions are left in the mind. Why was Rousseau's life divided between ecstasy and misery? Can any other answer be given than this, that the effervescence of his imagination produced both? But had his fancy been allowed to cool, it is possible that he might have acquired more strength of mind. Still, if the purpose of life be to educate the intellectual part of man, all with respect to him was right. Yet had death not led to a nobler scene of action, it is probable that he would have enjoyed more equal happiness on earth, and have felt the calm sensations of the man of nature, instead of being prepared for another stage of existence by nourishing the passions which agitate the civilized man. But peace to his manes! I war not with his ashes, but his opinions. I war only with the sensibility that led him to degrade woman by making her slave of love. Quote, Cursed vassalage, first idolized till love's hot fire be o'er, then slaves to those who courted us before. End quote. Dryden. The pernicious tendency of those books in which the writers insidiously degrade the sex whilst they are prostrate before their personal charms cannot be too often or too severely exposed. Let us, my dear contemporaries, arise above such narrow prejudices. If wisdom is desirable on its own account, if virtue, to deserve the name, must be founded on knowledge, let us endeavour to strengthen our minds by reflection, till our heads become a balance for our hearts. Let us not confine all our thoughts to the petty occurrences of the day, nor our knowledge to an acquaintance with our lovers' or husbands' hearts, but let the practice of every duty be subordinate to the grand one of improving our minds, and preparing our affections for a more exalted state. Beware, then, my friends, of suffering the heart to be moved by every trivial incident. The reed is shaken by a breeze, and annually dies, but the oak stands firm, and for ages braves the storm. Were we indeed only created to flutter our hour out and die? Why, let us then indulge sensibility, and laugh at the severity of reason. Yet, alas, even then we should want strength of body and mind, and life would be lost in feverish pleasures or wearisome languor. But the system of education which I earnestly wish to see exploded seems to presuppose what ought never to be taken for granted, that virtue shields us from the casualties of life, and that fortune, slipping off her bandage, will smile on a well-educated female, and bring in her hand an Emilius or a Telemachus whilst on the contrary, the reward which virtue promises to her votaries is confined, it is clear, to their own bosoms, and often must they contend with the most vexatious worldly cares, and bear with the vices and humours of relations for whom they can never feel a friendship. There have been many women in the world who, instead of being supported by the reason and virtue of their fathers and brothers, have strengthened their own minds by struggling with their vices and follies, yet have never met with a hero, in the shape of a husband, who, paying the debt that mankind owed them, might chance to bring back their reason to its natural dependent state, and restore the usurped prerogative of rising above opinion to man. End of chapter 5, part 1
Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri. Vindication of the Rights of Woman by Mary Wollstonecraft. Chapter 5, Part 2, Section 5.2. Dr. Fordyce's sermons have long made a part of a young woman's library. Nay, girls at school are allowed to read them, but I should instantly dismiss them from my pupils if I wished to strengthen her understanding by leading her to form sound principles on a broad basis, or were I only anxious to cultivate her taste, though they must be allowed to contain many sensible observations. Dr. Fordyce may have had a very laudable end in view, but these discourses are written in such an affected style that were it only on that account, and I had nothing to object against his mellifluous precepts, I should not allow girls to peruse them, unless I designed to hunt every spark of nature out of their composition, melting every human quality into female weakness and artificial grace. I say artificial, for true grace arises from some kind of independence of mind. Children, careless of pleasing, and only anxious to amuse themselves, are often very graceful, and the nobility, who have mostly lived with inferiors, and always had the command of money, acquire a graceful ease of deportment, which should rather be termed habitual grace of body than that superior gracefulness which is truly the expression of the mind. This mental grace, not noticed by vulgar eyes, often flashes across a rough countenance, and irradiating every feature shows simplicity and independence of mind. It is then we read characters of immortality in the eye, and see the soul in every gesture, though when at rest neither the face nor limbs may have much beauty to recommend them, or the behavior anything peculiar to attract universal attention. The mass of mankind, however, look for more tangible beauty, yet simplicity is in general admired, when people do not consider what they admire, and can there be simplicity without sincerity? But to have done with remarks that are in some measure desultory, though naturally excited by the subject. In declamatory periods, Dr. Fordyce spins out Rousseau's eloquence, and in most sentimental rant details his opinions respecting the female character, and the behavior which woman ought to assume to render her lovely. He shall speak for himself, for thus he makes nature address man. Behold these smiling innocents, whom I have graced with my fairest gifts, and committed to your protection. Behold them with love and respect. Treat them with tenderness and honor. They are timid, and want to be defended. They are frail. Oh, do not take advantage of their weakness. Let their fears and blushes endear them. Let their confidence in you never be abused. But is it possible that any of you can be such barbarians, so supremely wicked as to abuse it? Can you find it in your hearts to despoil the gentle, trusting creatures of their treasure, or do anything to strip them of their native robe of virtue? Cursed be the impious hand that would dare to violate the unblemished form of chastity. Thou wretch, thou ruffian, forbear, nor venture to provoke heaven's fiercest vengeance. End quote. I know not any comment that can be made seriously on this curious passage, and I could produce many similar ones, some so very sentimental that I have heard rational men use the word indecent when they mentioned them with disgust. Throughout there is a display of cold, artificial feelings, and that parade of sensibility which boys and girls should be taught to despise as the sure mark of a little, vain mind. Florid appeals are made to heaven, and to the beauteous innocence, the fairest images of heaven here below, whilst sober sense is left far behind. This is not the language of the heart, nor will it ever reach it, though the ear may be tickled. I shall be told, perhaps, that the public have been pleased with these volumes. True, and Hervey's meditations are still read, though he equally sinned against sense and taste. I particularly object to the lover-like phrases of pumped-up passion, which are everywhere interspersed. If women ever be allowed to walk without leading-strings, why must they be cajoled into virtue by artful flattery and sexual compliments? Speak to them the language of truth and soberness, and away with the lullaby strains of condescending endearment. 
let them be taught to respect themselves as rational creatures, and not led to have a passion for their own insipid persons. It moves my gall to hear a preacher discanting on dress and needlework, and still more to hear him address the British fair, the fairest of the fair, as if they had only feelings. Even recommending piety he uses the following argument, quote, Never, perhaps, does a fine woman strike more deeply than when, composed into pious recollection, and possessed with the noblest considerations, she assumes, without knowing it, superior dignity and new graces, so that the beauties of holiness seem to radiate about her, and the bystanders are almost induced to fancy her already worshipping amongst her kindred angels." End quote. Why are women to be thus bred up with a desire of conquest? The very epithet used in this sense gives me a sickly qualm. Does religion and virtue offer no stronger motives, no brighter reward? Must they always be debased by being made to consider the sex of their companions? Must they be taught always to be pleasing? And when leveling their small artillery at the heart of man, is it necessary to tell them that a little sense is sufficient to render their attention incredibly soothing? Quote, as a small degree of knowledge entertains in a woman, so from a woman, though for a different reason, a small expression of kindness delights, particularly if she have beauty. End quote. I should have supposed for the same reason. Why are girls to be told that they resemble angels, but to sink them below women? or that a gentle, innocent female is an object that comes nearer to the idea which we have formed of angels than any other. Yet they are told at the same time that they are only like angels when they are young and beautiful. Consequently, it is their persons, not their virtues, that procure them this homage. Idle, empty words! What can such delusive flattery lead to but vanity and folly? The lover, it is true, has a poetic license to exalt his mistress, his reason is the bubble of his passion, and he does not utter a falsehood when he borrows the language of adoration. His imagination may raise the idol of his heart, unblamed, above humanity, and happy would it be for women if they were only flattered by the men who loved them, I mean, who loved the individual, not the sex. But should a grave preacher interlard his discourses with such fooleries? In sermons or novels, however, Voluptuousness is always true to its text. Men are allowed by moralists to cultivate, as nature directs, different qualities, and assume the different characters that the same passions, modified almost to infinity, give to each individual. A virtuous man may have a choleric or a sanguine constitution, be gay or grave, unreproved, be firm till almost overbearing, or weakly submissive, have no will or opinion of his own. But all women are to be leveled, by meekness and docility, into one character of yielding softness and gentle compliance. I will use the preacher's own words. Quote, Let it be observed that in your sex manly exercises are never graceful, that in them a tone and figure, as well as an air and deportment of the masculine kind, are always forbidding and that men of sensibility desire in every woman soft features and a flowing voice, a form not robust, and demeanour delicate and gentle. End quote. Is not the following portrait the portrait of a house-slave? I am astonished at the folly of many women, who are still reproaching their husbands for leaving them alone, for preferring this or that company to theirs, for treating them with this and the other mark of disregard or indifference, when to speak the truth they have themselves in a great measure to blame. Not that I would justify the men in anything wrong on their part, but had you behaved to them with more respectful observance, and more equal tenderness, studying their humours, overlooking their mistakes, submitting to their opinions in matters indifferent, passing by little instances of unevenness, caprice, or passion, giving soft answers to hasty words, complaining as seldom as possible, and making it your daily care to relieve their anxieties and prevent their wishes, to enliven the hour of dullness, and call up the ideas of felicity. Had you pursued this conduct, 
I doubt not but you would have maintained and even increased their esteem, so far as to have secured every degree of influence that could conduce to their virtue, or your mutual satisfaction, and your house might at this day have been the abode of domestic bliss. End quote. Such a woman ought to be an angel, or she is an ass, for I discern not a trace of the human character, neither reason nor passion, in this domestic drudge, whose being is absorbed in that of a tyrant's. Still, Dr. Fordyce must have very little acquaintance with the human heart, if he really supposed that such conduct would bring back wandering love, instead of exciting contempt. No, beauty, gentleness, etc., etc., may gain a heart. But esteem, the only lasting affection, can alone be obtained by virtue supported by reason. It is respect for the understanding that keeps alive tenderness for the person. As these volumes are so frequently put into the hands of young people, I have taken more notice of them than, strictly speaking, they deserve. But as they have contributed to vitiate the taste and enervate the understanding of many of my fellow creatures, I could not pass them silently over. Section 5.3 such paternal solitude pervades Dr. Gregory's legacy to his daughters, that I enter on the task of criticism with affectionate respect. But as this little volume has many attractions to recommend it to the notice of the most respectable part of my sex, I cannot silently pass over arguments that so speciously support opinions which, I think, have had the most baneful effect on the morals and manners of the female world. His easy familiar style is particularly suited to the tenor of his advice, and the melancholy tenderness which his respect for the memory of a beloved wife diffuses through the whole work renders it very interesting. Yet there is a degree of concise elegance conspicuous in many passages that disturbs this sympathy, and we pop on the author when we only expected to meet the father. Besides, having two objects in view, he seldom adhered steadily to either, for, wishing to make his daughters amiable, and fearing lest unhappiness should be only the consequence of instilling sentiments that might draw them out of the track of common life, without enabling them to act with consonant independence and dignity, he checks the natural flow of his thoughts, and neither advises one thing nor the other. In the preface he tells them a mournful truth, quote, that they will hear at least once in their lives the genuine sentiments of a man who has no interest in deceiving them. End quote. Hapless woman, what can be expected from thee when the beings on whom thou art said naturally to depend for reason and support have all an interest in deceiving thee? This is the root of the evil that has shed a corroding mildew on all thy virtues, and blighting in the bud thy open faculties has rendered thee the weak thing thou art. It is this separate interest, this insidious state of warfare, that undermines morality and divides mankind. If love has made some women wretched, how many more has the cold, unmeaning intercourse of gallantry rendered vain and useless? Yet this heartless attention to the sex is reckoned so manly, so polite, that till society is very differently organized, I fear this vestige of Gothic manners will not be done away by a more reasonable and affectionate mode of conduct. Besides, to strip it of its imaginary dignity, I must observe that in the most civilized European states, this lip service prevails in a very great degree, accompanied with extreme dissoluteness of morals. In Portugal, the country that I particularly allude to, it takes place of the most serious moral obligations, for a man is seldom assassinated when in the company of a woman. The savage hand of rapine is unnerved by this chivalrous spirit, and if the stroke of vengeance cannot be stayed, the lady is entreated to pardon the rudeness, and depart in peace, though sprinkled, perhaps, with her husband's or brother's blood. I shall pass over his strictures on religion, because I mean to discuss that subject in a separate chapter. The remarks relative to behavior, though many of them very sensible, I entirely disapprove of, because it appears to me to be beginning, as it were, at the wrong end. A cultivated understanding and an affectionate heart will never want starched rules of decorum, something more substantial than seemliness will be the result. And without understanding, 
the behaviour here recommended would be rank affectation. Decorum, indeed, is the one thing needful. Decorum is to supplant nature, and banish all simplicity and variety of character out of the female world. Yet what good end can all this superficial counsel produce? It is, however, much easier to point out this or that mode of behaviour than to set the reason to work. But when the mind has been stored with useful knowledge, and strengthened by being employed, the regulation of the behaviour may safely be left to its guidance. Why, for instance, should the following caution be given, when art of every kind must contaminate the mind, and why entangle the grand motives of action, which reason and religion equally combine to enforce, with pitiful worldly shifts and sleight-of-hand tricks, to gain the applause of gaping tasteless fools? Quote, be even cautious in displaying your good sense. Footnote. Let women once acquire good sense, and if it deserve the name it will teach them, or of what use it will be how to employ it. The quote continues. It will be thought you assume a superiority over the rest of the company. But if you happen to have any learning, keep it a profound secret, especially from the men, who generally look with a jealous and malignant eye on a woman of great parts and a cultivated understanding. If men of real merit, as he afterwards observes, are superior to this meanness, where is the necessity that the behaviour of the whole sex should be modulated to please fools, or men who, having little claim to respect as individuals, choose to keep close in their phalanx? Men, indeed, who insist on their common superiority, having only this sexual superiority, are certainly very excusable. There would be no end to rules for behaviour, if it be proper always to adopt the tone of the company, for thus, for ever varying the key, a flat would often pass for a natural note. Surely it would have been wiser to have advised women to improve themselves till they rose above the fumes of vanity, and then to let the public opinion come round. For where are rules of accommodation to stop? The narrow path of truth and virtue inclines neither to the right nor left. It is a straightforward business, and those who are earnestly pursuing their road may bound over many decorous prejudices, without leaving modesty behind. Make the heart clean, and give the head employment, and I will venture to predict that there will be nothing offensive in the behaviour. The air of fashion, which so many young people are so eager to attain, always strikes me like the studied attitudes of some modern prince, copied with tasteless servility after the antiques. The soul is left out, and none of the parts are tied together by what may be properly termed character. This varnish of fashion, which seldom sticks very close to sense, may dazzle the weak, but leave nature to itself, and it will seldom disgust the wise. Besides, when a woman has sufficient sense not to pretend to anything which she does not understand in some degree, there is no need of determining to hide her talents under a bushel. Let things take their natural course, and all will be well. It is this system of dissimulation throughout the volume that I despise. Women always seem to be this and that, yet virtue might apostrophize them, in the words of Hamlet, quote, Seems? I know not seems, have that within that passeth show. End quote. Still, the same tone occurs, for in another place, after recommending without sufficiently discriminating delicacy, he adds, quote, The men will complain of your reserve. They will assure you that a franker behaviour will make you more amiable. But trust me, they are not sincere when they tell you so. I acknowledge that on some occasions it might render you more agreeable as companions, but it would make you less amiable as women, an important distinction which many of your sex are not aware of." End quote. This desire of being always women is the very consciousness that degrades the sex. Excepting with a lover, I must repeat with emphasis a former observation. It would be well if they were only agreeable or rational companions. But in this respect his advice is even inconsistent with a passage which I mean to quote with the most marked approbation. Quote, the sentiment that a woman may allow all innocent freedoms, provided her virtue is secure, is both grossly indelicate and dangerous. 
and has proved fatal to many of your sex. End quote. With this opinion I perfectly coincide. A man or a woman of any feeling must always wish to convince a beloved object that it is the caresses of the individual, not the sex, that is received and returned with pleasure, and that the heart, rather than the senses, is moved. Without this natural delicacy, love becomes a selfish personal gratification that soon degrades the character. I carry this sentiment still further. Affection, when love is out of the question, authorizes many personal endearments, that, naturally flowing from an innocent heart, give life to the behavior. But the personal intercourse of appetite, gallantry, or vanity, is despicable. When a man squeezes the hand of a pretty woman handing her to a carriage whom he has never seen before, she will consider such an impertinent freedom in the light of an insult, if she have any true delicacy, instead of being flattered by this unmeaning homage to beauty. These are the privileges of friendship, or the momentary homage which the heart pays to virtue, when it flashes suddenly on the notice. Mere animal spirits have no claim to the kindnesses of affection. Wishing to feed the affections with what is now the food of vanity, I would fain persuade my sex to act from simpler principles. Let them merit love, and they will obtain it, though they may never be told that the power of a fine woman over the hearts of men, of men of the finest parts, is even beyond what she conceives. I have already noticed the narrow cautions with respect to duplicity, female softness, delicacy of constitution, for these are the changes which he rings round without ceasing, in a more decorous manner, it is true, than Rousseau, but it all comes home to the same point, and whoever is at the trouble to analyze these sentiments will find the first principles not quite so delicate as the superstructure. The subject of amusements is treated in too cursory a manner, but with the same spirit. When I treat of friendship, love, and marriage, it will be found that we materially differ in opinion. I shall not then forestall what I have to observe on these important subjects, but confine my remarks to the general tenor of them, to that cautious family prudence, to those confined views of partial unenlightened affection, which exclude pleasure and improvement, by vainly wishing to ward off sorrow and error, and by thus guarding the heart and mind destroy also all their energy. It is far better to be often deceived than never to trust, to be disappointed in love than never to love, to lose a husband's fondness than to forfeit his esteem. Happy would it be for the world, and for individuals of course, if all this unavailing solicitude to attain worldly happiness on a confined plan were turned into an anxious desire to improve the understanding. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy gettings get understanding. How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity, and hate knowledge, saith wisdom to the daughters of men. End of chapter 5, part 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri Vindication of the Rights of Woman by Mary Wollstonecraft Chapter 5, Part 3 Section 5.4 I do not mean to allude to all the writers who have written on the subject of female manners. It would in fact be only beating over the old ground, for they have in general written in the same strain, but attacking the boasted prerogative of man the prerogative that may emphatically be called the iron scepter of tyranny, the original sin of tyrants, I declare, against all power built on prejudices, however hoary, if the submission demanded be founded on justice, there is no appealing to a higher power, for God is justice itself. Let us then, as children of the same parent, if not bastardized by being the younger born, reason together, and learn to submit to the authority of reason when her voice is distinctly heard. But if it be proved that this throne of prerogative only rests on a chaotic mass of prejudices, that have no inherent principle of order to keep them together, 
or on an elephant, tortoise, or even the mighty shoulders of a son of the earth, they may escape, who dare to brave the consequence without any breach of duty, without sinning against the order of things. Whilst reason raises man above the brutal herd, and death is big with promises, they alone are subject to blind authority who have no reliance on their own strength. They are free who will be free. Quote, he is the free man whom truth makes free. End quote. From Cooper. The being who can govern itself has nothing to fear in life. But if anything is dearer than its own respect, the price must be paid to the last farthing. Virtue, like everything valuable, must be loved for herself alone, or she will not take up her abode with us. She will not impart that peace which passeth understanding, when she is merely made the stilts of reputation, and respected with pharisaical exactness, because honesty is the best policy. That the plan of life which enables us to carry some knowledge and virtue into another world is the one best calculated to ensure content in this cannot be denied. Yet few people act according to this principle, though it be universally allowed that it admits not of dispute. Present pleasure, or present power, carry before it these sober convictions, and it is for the day, not for life, that man bargains with happiness. How few, how very few, have sufficient foresight or resolution to endure a small evil at the moment, to avoid a greater hereafter. Women in particular, whose virtue is built on mutual prejudices, I mean to use a word that comprehends more than chastity, the sexual virtue, seldom attains to this greatness of mind, so that, becoming the slave of her own feelings, she is easily subjugated by those of others. Thus degraded, her reason, her misty reason, is employed rather to burnish than to snap her chains. Indignantly have I heard women argue in the same track as men, and adopt the sentiments that brutalize them with all the pertinacity of ignorance. I must illustrate my assertion by a few examples. Mrs. Piozzi, who often repeated by rote what she did not understand, comes forward with Johnsonian periods. Quote, Seek not for happiness in singularity, and dread a refinement of wisdom as a deviation into folly. End quote. Thus she dogmatically addresses a new married man, and to elucidate this pompous exordium she adds, quote, I said that the person of your lady would not grow more pleasing to you, but pray let her never suspect that it grows less so, that a woman will pardon an affront to her understanding much sooner than one to her person is well known, nor will any of us contradict the assertion. All our attainments, all our arts, are employed to gain and keep the heart of man. And what mortification can exceed the disappointment if the end be not obtained? There is no reproof, however pointed, no punishment, however severe, that a woman of spirit will not prefer to neglect. And if she can endure it without complaint, it only proves that she means to make herself amends by the attention of others for the slights of her husband. End quote. These are true masculine sentiments. Quote, all our arts are employed to gain and keep the heart of man. And what is the inference? If her person, and was there ever a person, though formed with Medician symmetry that was not slighted, be neglected, she will make herself amends by endeavouring to please other men. Noble morality! But thus is the understanding of the whole sex affronted, and their virtue deprived of the common basis of virtue. A woman must know that her person cannot be as pleasing to her husband as it was to her lover, and if she be offended with him for being a human creature, she may as well whine about the loss of his heart as about any other foolish thing. And this very want of discernment, or unreasonable anger, proves that he could not change his fondness for her person into affection for her virtues, or respect for her understanding. Whilst women avow, and act up to such opinions, their understandings at least deserve the contempt and obloquy that men, who never insult their persons, have pointedly leveled at the female mind. And it is the sentiments of these polite men, who do not wish to be encumbered with mind, that vain women thoughtlessly adopt. 
yet they should know that insulted reason alone can spread that sacred reserve about the persons which renders human affections, for human affections have always some base alloy, as permanent as it is consistent with the grand end of existence, the attainment of virtue. The Baroness du Steele speaks the same language as the lady just cited, with more enthusiasm. Her eulogium on Rousseau was accidentally put into my hands, and her sentiments, the sentiments of too many of my sex, may serve as the text for a few comments. Quote, Though Rousseau, she observes, has endeavoured to prevent women from interfering in public affairs, and acting a brilliant part in the theatre of politics, yet in speaking of them, how much has he done it to their satisfaction? If he wished to deprive them of some rights foreign to their sex, how has he for ever restored to them all those to which it has a claim? And in attempting to diminish their influence over the deliberations of men, how sacredly has he established the empire they have over their happiness? In aiding them to descend from a usurped throne, he has firmly seated them upon that to which they were destined by nature. And though he be full of indignation against them when they endeavour to resemble men, yet when they come before him, with all the charms, weaknesses, virtues, and errors of their sex, his respect for their persons amounts almost to adoration. End quote. True, for never was there a sensualist who paid more fervent adoration at the shrine of beauty. So in doubt, indeed, was his respect for the person, that excepting the virtue of chastity, for obvious reasons, he only wished to see it embellished by charms, weaknesses, and errors. He was afraid lest the austerity of reason should disturb the soft playfulness of love. The master wished to have a meretricious slave to fondle, entirely dependent on his reason and bounty. He did not want a companion, whom he should be compelled to esteem, or a friend, to whom he could confide the care of his children's education, should death deprive them of their father, before he had fulfilled the sacred task. He denies woman reason, shuts her out from knowledge, and turns her aside from truth. Yet his pardon is granted, because, quote, he admits the passion of love. It would require some ingenuity to show why women were to be under such an obligation to him for thus admitting love, when it is clear that he admits it only for the relaxation of men, and to perpetuate the species. But he talked with passion, and that powerful spell worked on the sensibility of a young encomiast. Quote, what signifies it, pursues this rhapsodist, to women, that his reason disputes with them the empire, when his heart is devotedly theirs? End quote. It is not empire, but equality that they should contend for. Yet if they wished only to lengthen out their sway, they should not entirely trust to their persons. For though beauty may gain a heart, it cannot keep it, even while the beauty is in full bloom, unless the mind lend, at least, some graces. When women are once sufficiently enlightened to discover their real interest on a grand scale, they will, I am persuaded, be very ready to resign all the prerogatives of love that are not mutual, speaking of them as lasting prerogatives, for the calm satisfaction of friendship, and the tender confidence of habitual esteem. Before marriage they will not assume any insolent airs, nor afterward abjectly submit. But endeavouring to act like reasonable creatures, in both situations, they will not be tumbled from a throne to a stool. Madame Gently has written several entertaining books for children, and her letters on education afford many useful hints that sensible parents will certainly avail themselves of, but her views are narrow, and her prejudices as unreasonable as strong. I shall pass over her vehement argument in favour of the eternity of future punishments, because I blush to think that a human being should ever argue vehemently in such a cause, and only make a few remarks on her absurd manner of making the parental authority supplant reason, for everywhere does she inculcate not only blind submission to parents, but to the opinion of the world. A person is not to act in this or that way, though convinced they are right in doing so, because some equivocal circumstances may lead the world to suspect that they acted from different motives. This is sacrificing the substance for a shadow. Let people but watch their own hearts, 
and act as rightly as far as they can judge, and they may patiently wait till the opinion of the world comes round. It is best to be directed by a simple motive, for justice has too often been sacrificed to propriety, another word for convenience. She tells the story of a young man, engaged by his father's express desire, to a girl of fortune. Before the marriage could take place, she is deprived of her fortune, and thrown friendless on the world. The father practices the most infamous arts to separate his son from her, and when the son detects his villainy, and, following the dictates of honour, marries the girl, nothing but misery ensues, because, forsooth, he married without his father's consent. On what ground can religion or morality rest when justice is thus set at defiance? In the same style she represents an accomplished young woman, as ready to marry anybody that her mamma pleased to recommend, and as actually marrying the young man of her own choice, without feeling any emotions of passion, because that a well-educated girl had not time to be in love. Is it possible to have much respect for a system of education that thus insults reason and nature? Many similar opinions occur in her writings, mixed with sentiments that do honour to her head and heart. Yet so much superstition is mixed with her religion, and so much worldly wisdom with her morality, that I should not let a young person read her works, unless I could afterwards converse on the subjects, and point out the contradictions. Mrs. Chapone's letters are written with such good sense, and unaffected humility, and contain so many useful observations, that I only mention them to pay the worthy writer this tribute of respect. I cannot, it is true, always coincide in opinion with her, but I always respect her. The very word respect brings Mrs. Macaulay to my remembrance, the woman of the greatest abilities, undoubtedly, that this country has ever produced, and yet this woman has been suffered to die without sufficient respect being paid to her memory. Posterity, however, will be more just, and remember that Catherine Macaulay was an example of intellectual acquirements supposed to be incompatible with the weakness of her sex. In her style of writing, indeed, no sex appears, for it is like the sense it conveys, strong and clear. I will not call hers a masculine understanding, because I admit not of such an arrogant assumption of reason, but I contend that it was a sound one, and that her judgment— the matured fruit of profound thinking, was a proof that a woman can acquire judgment, in the full extent of the word. Possessing more penetration than sagacity, more understanding than fancy, she writes with sober energy and argumentative closeness, yet sympathy and benevolence give an interest to her sentiments, and that vital heat to arguments which forces the reader to weigh them. Coinciding in opinion with Mrs. Macaulay relative to many branches of education, I refer to her valuable work, instead of quoting her sentiments to support my own. When I first thought of writing these strictures, I anticipated Mrs. Macaulay's approbation with a little of that sanguine ardour which it has been the business of my life to depress, but soon heard, with the sickly calm of disappointed hope, and the still seriousness of regret, that she was no more. End of chapter 5, part 3「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri. Vindication of the Rights of Women by Mary Wollstonecroft. Chapter 5, Part 4. Section 5.5. .5. Taking a view of the different works which have been written on education, Lord Chesterfield's letters must not be silently passed over. Not that I mean to analyze his unmanly, immoral system, or even to cull any of the useful shrewd remarks which occur in his frivolous correspondence. No, I only mean to make a few reflections on the avowed tendency of them, the art of acquiring an early knowledge of the world. An art, I will venture to assert, that preys secretly, like the worm in the bud, on the expanding powers, and turns to poison the generous juices which should mount with vigour in the youthful frame, inspiring warm affections and great resolves. For everything, saith the wise man, there is reason, 
and who would look for the fruits of the autumn during the genial months of spring? But this is mere declamation, and I mean to reason with those worldly-wise instructors who, instead of cultivating the judgment, instill prejudices, and render hard the heart that gradual experience would only have cooled. An early acquaintance with human infirmities, or what is termed knowledge of the world, is the surest way, in my opinion, to contract the heart and damp the natural youthful ardour which produces not only great talents, but great virtues. For the vain attempt to bring forth the fruit of experience, before the sapling has thrown out its leaves, only exhausts its strength, and prevents its assuming a natural form, just as the form and strength of subsiding metals are injured when the attraction of cohesion is disturbed. Tell me, you who have studied the human mind, is it not a strange way to fix principles by showing young people that they are seldom stable? And how can they be fortified by habits when they are proved to be fallacious by example? Why is the ardour of youth thus to be damped, and the luxuriancy of fancy cut to the quick? This dry caution may, it is true, guard a character from worldly mischances, but will infallibly preclude excellence in either virtue or knowledge. The stumbling-block thrown across every path by suspicion will prevent any vigorous exertions of genius or benevolence, and life will be stripped of its most alluring charm long before its calm evening, when man should retire to contemplation for comfort and support. A young man who has bred up with domestic friends, and led to store his mind with as much speculative knowledge as can be acquired by reading, and the natural reflections which youthful ebullitions of animal spirits and instinctive feelings inspire, will enter the world with worn and erroneous expectations. But this appears to be the course of nature, and in morals, as well as in works of taste, we should be observant of her sacred indications, and not presume to lead when we ought obsequiously to follow. In the world few people act from principle. Present feelings and early habits are the grand springs. But how would the former be deadened, and the latter rendered iron-corroding fetters, if the world were shown to young people just as it is, when no knowledge of mankind or their own hearts, slowly obtained by experience, rendered them forbearing? Their fellow-creatures would not then be viewed as frail beings, like themselves, condemned to struggle with human infirmities, and sometimes displaying the light and sometimes the dark side of their character, extorting alternate feelings of love and disgust, but guarded against as beasts of prey, till every enlarged social feeling, in a word, humanity, was eradicated. In life, on the contrary, as we gradually discover the imperfections of our nature, we discover virtues, and various circumstances attach us to our fellow-creatures, when we mix with them, and view the same objects that are never thought of in acquiring a hasty, unnatural knowledge of the world. We see a folly swell into a vice, by almost imperceptible degrees, and pity while we blame. But if the hideous monster burst suddenly on our sight, fear and disgust rendering us more severe than man ought to be, might lead us with blind zeal to usurp the character of omnipotence, and denounce damnation on our fellow-mortals, forgetting that we cannot read the heart, and that we have seeds of the same vices lurking in our own. I have already remarked that we expect more from instruction than mere instruction can produce, for instead of preparing young people to encounter the evils of life with dignity, and to acquire wisdom and virtue by the exercise of their own faculties, precepts are heaped upon precepts, and blind obedience required when conviction should be brought home to reason. Suppose, for instance, that a young person in the first ardour of friendship deifies the beloved object. What harm can arise from this mistaken enthusiastic attachment? Perhaps it is necessary for virtue first to appear in a human form to impress youthful hearts. The ideal model, which a more matured and exalted mind looks up to, and shapes for itself, would elude their sight. He who loves not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God? asks the wisest of men. It is natural for youth to adorn the first object of its affection with every good quality, and the emulation produced by ignorance, or, to speak with more propriety, by inexperience, brings forward the mind capable of forming such an affection. And when in the lapse of time perfection is found not to be within the reach of mortals, virtue abstractly is thought beautiful, and wisdom sublime. Admiration then gives space to friendship, properly so called because it is cemented by esteem, and the being walks alone, only dependent on heaven for that emulous panting after perfection which ever glows in a noble mind. 
But this knowledge a man must gain by the exertion of his own faculties, and this is surely the blessed fruit of disappointed hope, for he who delighteth to diffuse happiness and show mercy to the weak creatures who are learning to know him never implanted a good propensity to be tormenting ignis fatuus. Our trees are now allowed to spread with wide luxuriance, nor do we expect by force to combine the majestic marks of time with youthful graces, but wait patiently till they have struck deep their root, and braved many a storm. Is the mind, then, which in proportion to its dignity advances more slowly toward perfection, to be treated with less respect? To argue from analogy, everything around us is in a progressive state, and when an unwelcome knowledge of life produces almost a satiety of life, and we discover by the natural course of things that all that is done under the sun is vanity, we are drawing near the awful close of the drama. The days of activity and hope are over, and the opportunities which the first stage of existence has afforded of advancing in the scale of intelligence must soon be summed up. A knowledge at this period of the futility of life, or earlier, if obtained by experience, is very useful, because it is natural. But when a frail being is shown the follies and vices of man, that he may be taught prudently to guard against the common casualties of life by sacrificing his heart, surely it is not speaking harshly to call it the wisdom of this world, contrasted with the nobler fruit of piety and experience. I will venture a paradox, and deliver my opinion without reserve. If men were only born to form a circle of life and death, it would be wise to take every step that foresight could suggest to render life happy. Moderation in every pursuit would then be supreme wisdom, and the prudent voluptuary might enjoy a degree of content, though he neither cultivated his understanding nor kept his heart pure. Prudence, supposing we were mortal, would be true wisdom, or to be more explicit, would procure the greatest portion of happiness considering the whole of life, but knowledge beyond the conveniences of life would be a curse. Why should we injure our health by close study? The exalted pleasure which intellectual pursuits afford would scarcely be equivalent to the hours of languor that follow, especially if it be necessary to take into the reckoning the doubts and disappointments that cloud our researches. Vanity and vexation close every enquiry, for the cause which we particularly wish to discover flies like the horizon before us as we advance. The ignorant, on the contrary, resemble children, and suppose that if they could walk straight forward they should at last arrive where the earth and clouds meet. Yet disappointed as we are in our researches, the mind gains strength by the exercise, sufficient perhaps to comprehend the answers which, in another step of existence, it may receive to the anxious questions it asked, when the understanding with feeble wing was fluttering round the visible effects to dive into the hidden cause. The passions also, the winds of life, would be useless, if not injurious, did the substance which composes our thinking being, after we have thought in vain, only become the support of vegetable life, and invigorate a cabbage or blush in a rose. The appetites would answer every earthly purpose, and produce more moderate and permanent happiness, but the powers of the soul that are of little use here, and probably disturb our animal enjoyments, even while conscious dignity makes us glory in possessing them, prove that life is merely an education, a state of infancy, of which the only hopes worth cherishing should not be sacrificed. I mean, therefore, to infer that we ought to have a precise idea of what we wish to attain by education, for the immortality of the soul is contradicted by the actions of many people who firmly profess the belief. If you mean to secure ease and prosperity on earth as the first consideration, and leave futurity to provide for itself, you act prudently in giving your child an early insight into the weaknesses of his nature. You may not, it is true, make an inkle of him, but do not imagine that he will stick to more than the letter of the law, who has very early imbibed a mean opinion of human nature, nor will he think it necessary to rise much above the common standard. He may avoid gross vices, because honesty is the best policy, but he will never aim at attaining great virtues. The example of writers and artists will illustrate this remark. I must, therefore, venture to doubt whether what has been thought an axiom in morals may not have been a dogmatical assertion made by men who have coolly seen mankind through the medium of books, and say, in direct contradiction to them, that the regulation of the passions is not always wisdom. On the contrary, it should seem that one reason why men have superior judgment and more fortitude than women is undoubtedly this, 
that they give a freer scope to the grand passions, and by more frequently going astray, enlarge their minds. If then, by the exercise of their own reason, they fix on some stable principle, they have probably to thank the force of their passions, nourished by false views of life, and permitted to overleap the boundary that secures content. But if in the dawn of life we could soberly survey the scenes before us as in perspective, and see everything in its true colours, how could the passions gain sufficient strength to unfold the faculties? Let me now, as from an eminence, survey the world stripped of all its false delusive charms. The clear atmosphere enables me to see each object in its true point of view, while my heart is still. I am calm as the prospect, in a morning when the mists, slowly dispersing, silently unveil the beauties of nature, refreshed by rest. In what light will the world now appear? I rub my eyes and think, perchance, that I am just awaking from a lively dream. I see the sons and daughters of men pursuing shadows, and anxiously wasting their powers to feed passions which have no adequate object. If the very excess of these blind impulses, pampered by that lying yet constantly trusted guide the imagination, did not, by preparing them for some other state, render short-sighted mortals wiser without their own concurrence, or what comes to the same thing, when they were pursuing some imaginary present good. After viewing objects in this light, it would not be very fanciful to imagine that this world was a stage on which a pantomime is daily performed for the amusement of superior beings. How would they be diverted to see the ambitious man consuming himself by running after a phantom, and pursuing the bubble fame in the cannon's mouth that was to blow him to nothing, for when consciousness is lost, it matters not whether we mount in a whirlwind or descend in rain. And should they compassionately invigorate his sight, and show him the thorny path which led to eminence that like a quicksand sinks as he ascends, disappointing his hopes when almost within his grasp, would he not leave to others the honour of amusing them, and labour to secure the present moment, though from the constitution of his nature he would not find it very easy to catch the flying stream? Such slaves are we to hope and fear." But vain as the ambitious man's pursuit would be, he is often striving for something more substantial than fame. That, indeed, would be the veriest meteor, the wildest fire that could lure a man to ruin. What, renounce the most trifling gratification to be applauded when he should be no more? Wherefore this struggle, whether man is mortal or immortal, if that noble passion did not really raise the being above his fellows? And love, what diverting scenes would it produce? Pantaloon's tricks must yield to more egregious folly. To see a mortal adorn an object with imaginary charms, and then fall down and worship the idol which he himself had set up! How ridiculous! But what serious consequences ensue to rob man of that portion of happiness which the deity, by calling him into existence, has, or on what can his attributes rest, indubitably promised? Would not all the purposes of life have been much better fulfilled if he had only felt what has been termed physical love? And would not the sight of the object, not seen through the medium of the imagination, soon reduce the passion to an appetite, if reflection, the noble distinction of man, did not give it force, and make it an instrument to raise him above this earthly dross by teaching him to love the centre of all perfection, whose wisdom appears clearer and clearer in the works of nature, in proportion as reason is illuminated and exalted by contemplation, and by acquiring that love of order which the struggles of passion produce. The habit of reflection, and the knowledge attained by fostering any passion, might be shown to be equally useful, though the object might be proved equally fallacious, for they would all appear in the same light if they were not magnified by the governing passion implanted in us by the author of all good, to call forth and strengthen the faculties of each individual, and enable it to attain all the experience that an infant can obtain, who does certain things it cannot tell why. I descend from my height, and mixing with my fellow creatures, feel myself hurried along the common stream. Ambition, love, hope, and fear exert their wonted power, though we be convinced by reason that their present and most attractive promises are only lying dreams. But had the cold hand of circumspection damped each generous feeling before it had left any permanent character, or fixed some habit, what could be expected but selfish prudence and reason just rising above instinct? 
Who that has read Dean Swift's disgusting description of the Yahoos, an incipient one of Wynnum's with a philosophical eye, can avoid seeing the futility of degrading the passions or making man rest in contentment? The youth should act, for had he the experience of a grey head, he would be fitter for death than life, though his virtues, rather residing in his head than his heart, could produce nothing great, and his understanding prepared for this world would not, by its noble flights, prove that it had a title to a better. Besides, it is not possible to give a young person a just view of life. He must have struggled with his own passions before he can estimate the force of the temptation which betrayed his brother into vice. Those who are entering life, and those who are departing, see the world from such very different points of view that they can seldom think alike, unless the unfledged reason of the former never attempted a solitary flight. When we hear of some daring crime, it comes full upon us in the deepest shade of turpitude and raises indignation, but the eye that gradually saw the darkness thicken must observe it with more compassionate forbearance. The world cannot be seen by an unmoved spectator. We must mix in the throng and feel as men feel before we can judge of their feelings. If we mean, in short, to live in the world to grow wiser and better, and not merely to enjoy the good things of life, we must attain a knowledge of others at the same time that we become acquainted with ourselves. Knowledge acquired any other way only hardens the heart and perplexes the understanding. I may be told that the knowledge thus acquired is sometimes purchased at too dear a rate. I can only answer that I very much doubt whether any knowledge can be attained without labor and sorrow, and those who wish to spare their children both should not complain if they are neither wise nor virtuous. They only aimed at making them prudent, and prudence, early in life, is but the cautious craft of ignorant self-love. I have observed that young people to whose education particular attention has been paid have in general been very superficial and conceited, and far from pleasing in any respect, because they had neither the unsuspecting warmth of youth nor the cool depth of age. I cannot help imputing this unnatural appearance principally to that hasty, premature instruction which leads them presumptuously to repeat all the crude notions they have taken upon trust, so that the careful education which they received makes them all their lives the slaves of prejudices. Mental, as well as bodily exertion, is at first irksome, so much so that the many would fain let others both work and think for them. An observation which I have often made will illustrate my meaning. When, in a circle of strangers or acquaintances, a person of moderate abilities asserts an opinion with heat, I will venture to affirm, for I have traced this fact home very often, that it is a prejudice. These echoes have a high respect for the understanding of some relation or friend, and without fully comprehending the opinions which they are so eager to retail, they maintain them with a degree of obstinacy that would surprise even the person who concocted them. I know that a kind of fashion now prevails of respecting prejudices, and when any one dares to face them, though actuated by humanity and armed by reason, he is superciliously asked whether his ancestors were fools. No, I should reply, opinions at first of every description were all probably considered, and therefore founded on some reason. Yet not unfrequently, of course, it was rather a local expedient than a fundamental principle that would be reasonable at all times. But moss-covered opinions assume the disproportioned form of prejudices when they are indolently adopted only because age has given them a venerable aspect, though the reason on which they were built ceases to be a reason, or cannot be traced. Why are we to love prejudices merely because they are prejudices? A prejudice is a fond, obstinate persuasion, for which we can give no reason. For the moment a reason can be given for an opinion, it ceases to be a prejudice, though it may be an error in judgment. And are we then advised to cherish opinions only to set reason at defiance? This mode of arguing, if arguing it may be called, reminds me of what is vulgarly termed a woman's reason, for women sometimes declare that they love or believe certain things because they love or believe them. It is impossible to converse with people to any purpose who, in this style, only use affirmatives and negatives. Before you can bring them to a point to start fairly from, you must go back to the simple principles that were antecedent to the prejudices broached by power, and it is ten to one but you are stopped by the philosophical assertion that certain principles are as practically false as they are abstractly true. Nay, it may be inferred that reason has whispered some doubts, 
for it generally happens that people assert their opinions with the greatest heat when they begin to waver, striving to drive out their own doubts by convincing their opponent. They grow angry when those gnawing doubts are thrown back to prey on themselves. The fact is that men expect from education what education cannot give. A sagacious parent or tutor may strengthen the body and sharpen the instruments by which the child is to gather knowledge, but the honey must be the reward of the individual's own industry. It is almost as absurd to attempt to make a youth wise in the experience of another, as to expect the body to grow strong by the exercise which is only talked of or seen. Many of those children whose conduct has been most narrowly watched become the weakest men, because their instructors only instill certain notions into their minds that have no other foundation than their authority, and if they are loved or respected, the mind is cramped in its exertions and wavering in its advances. The business of education in this case is only to conduct the shooting tendrils to a proper pole, yet after laying precept upon precept without allowing a child to acquire judgment itself, Parents expect them to act in the same manner by this borrowed fallacious light as if they had illuminated it themselves, and be, when they enter life, what their parents are at the close. They do not consider that the tree, and even the human body, does not strengthen its fibres till it has reached its full growth. There appears to be something analogous in the mind. The senses and the imagination give a form to the character during childhood and youth, and the understanding, as life advances, gives firmness to the first fair purposes of sensibility, till virtue, arising rather from the clear conviction of reason than the impulse of the heart, morality is made to rest on a rock against which the storms of passion vainly beat. I hope I shall not be misunderstood when I say that religion will not have this condensing energy, unless it be founded on reason. If it be merely the refuge of weakness or wild fanaticism, and not a governing principle of conduct drawn from self-knowledge and a rational opinion respecting the attributes of God, what can it be expected to produce? The religion which consists in warming the affections and exalting the imagination is only the poetical part, and may afford the individual pleasure without rendering it a more moral being. It may be a substitute for worldly pursuits, yet narrow instead of enlarging the heart, but virtue must be loved as in itself sublime and excellent, and not for the advantages it procures or the evils it averts, if any great degree of excellence be expected. Men will not become moral when they only build airy castles in a future world to compensate for the disappointments which they meet with in this, if they turn their thoughts from relative duties to religious reveries. Most prospects in life are marred by the shuffling worldly wisdom of men, who, forgetting that they cannot serve God and mammon, endeavor to blend contradictory things. If you wish to make your son rich, pursue one course. If you are only anxious to make him virtuous, you must take another, but do not imagine that you can bound from one road to the other without losing your way. End of chapter 5 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Betsy Bush. Marquette, Michigan, April 2006. Vindication of the Rights of Women by Mary Wollstonecraft. Chapter 6. The Effect Which an Early Association of Ideas Has Upon the Character. Educated in the enervating style recommended by the writers on whom I have been animadverting, and not having a chance from their a subordinate state in society to recover their lost ground, is it surprising that women everywhere appear a defect in nature? Is it surprising when we consider what a determinant effect an early association of ideas has on the character that they neglect their understandings and turn all their attention to their persons. The great advantages which naturally result from storing the mind with knowledge are obvious from the following considerations. The association of our ideas is either habitual or instantaneous, and the latter mode seems rather to depend on the original temperature of the mind than on the will. When the ideas and matters of fact are once taken in, they lie by their use, 
till some fortuitous circumstance makes the information dart into the mind with illustrative force. That has been received at very different periods of our lives. Like the lightning's flash are many recollections, one idea assimilating and explaining another, with astonishing rapidity. I do not now allude to that quick perception of truth, which is so intuitive that it baffles research, and makes us at a loss to determine whether it is reminiscence or ratiocination, lost sight of in its celerity, that opens the dark cloud. Over those instantaneous associations we have little power. For when the mind is once enlarged by excursive flights or profound reflection, the raw materials will in some degree arrange themselves. The understanding, it is true, may keep us from going out of drawing when we group our thoughts, or transcribe from the imagination the warm sketches of fancy. But the animal spirits, the individual character, give the coloring. Over this subtle electric fluid, footnote, I have sometimes been inclined to laugh at materialists, asked whether, as the most powerful effects in nature are apparently produced by fluids, the magnetic, etc., the passions might not be fine, volatile fluids that embraced humanity, keeping the more refractory elementary parts together, or whether they were simply a liquid fire that pervaded the more sluggish materials, giving them life and heat. End footnote. Over this subtle electric fluid, how little power do we possess, and over it how little power can reason obtain? These fine, intractable spirits appear to be the essence of genius, and beaming in its eagle eye, produce in the most eminent degree the happy energy of associating thoughts that surprise, delight, and instruct. These are the glowing minds that concentrate pictures for their fellow creatures, forcing them to view with interest the objects reflected from the impassioned imagination which they passed over in nature. I must be allowed to explain myself. The generality of people cannot see or feel poetically. They want fancy, and therefore fly from solitude in search of sensible objects. But when an author lends them his eyes, they can see as he saw, and be amused by images they could not select, though lying before them. Education thus only supplies the man of genius with knowledge to give variety and contrast to his associations. But there is an habitual association of ideas that grows with our growth, which has a great effect on the moral character of mankind, and by which a turn is given to the mind that commonly remains throughout life. So ductile is the understanding, and yet so stubborn, that the associations which depend on adventitious circumstances during the period that the body takes to arrive at maturity, can seldom be disentangled by reason. One idea calls up another, its old associate and memory, faithful to the first impressions, particularly when the intellectual powers are not employed to cool our sensations, retraces them with mechanical exactness. This habitual slavery to first impressions has a more baneful effect on the female than the male character, because business and other dry employments of the understanding tend to deaden the feelings and break associations that do violence to reason. But females who are made women of when they are mere children, and brought back to childhood when they ought to leave the go-cart forever, have not sufficient strength of mind to efface the superinductions of art that have smothered nature. Everything that they see or hear serves to fix impressions, call forth emotions, and associate ideas that give a sexual character to the mind. False notions of beauty and delicacy stop the growth of their limbs and produce a sickly soreness rather than delicacy of organs. And thus weakened by being employed in unfolding instead of examining the first associations, forcing on them by every surrounding object, how can they attain the vigor necessary to enable them to throw off their factuous character? Where find strength to recur to reason and rise superior to a system of oppression 
that blasts the fair promises of spring. This cruel association of ideas, which everything conspires to twist into all their habits of thinking, or, to speak with more precision, of feeling, receives new force when they begin to act a little for themselves. For they then perceive that it is only through their address to excite emotions in men that pleasure and power are to be obtained. Besides, all the books professedly written for their instruction, which make the first impression on their minds, all inculcate the same opinions. Educated in worse than Egyptian bondage, it is unreasonable as well as cruel to upbraid them with faults that can scarcely be avoided, unless a degree of native vigor be supposed, that falls to the lot of very few amongst mankind. For instance, the severest sarcasms have been leveled against the sex, and they have been ridiculed for repeating a set of phrases learnt by rote, when nothing could be more natural, considering the education they receive, and that their highest praise is to obey, unargued, the will of man. And they are not allowed to have reason sufficient to govern their own conduct. Why, all they learn must be learned by rote. And when all their ingenuity is called forth to adjust their dress, a passion for a scarlet coat is so natural that it never surprised me, and, allowing Pope's summary of their character to be just, that every woman is at heart a rake, why should they be bitterly censured for seeking a congenial mind, and preferring a rake to a man of sense? Rakes know how to work on their sensibility, whilst the modest merit of reasonable men has, of course, less effect on their feelings, and they cannot reach the heart by the way of the understanding, because they have few sentiments in common. It seems a little absurd to expect women to be more reasonable than men in their likings, and still to deny them the uncontrolled use of reason. When do men fall in love with sense? When do they, with their superior powers and advantages, turn from the person to the mind? And how can they then expect women, who are only taught to observe behavior, and acquire manners rather than morals, to despise what they have been all their lives laboring to attain? Where are they suddenly to find judgment enough to weigh patiently the sense of an awkward virtuous man, when his manners, of which they are made critical judges, are rebuffing, and his conversation cold and dull, because it does not consist of pretty repartees, or well-turned compliments. In order to admire or esteem anything for a continuance, we must at least have our curiosity excited by knowing, in some degree, what we admire. For we are unable to estimate the value of qualities and virtues above our comprehension. Such a respect, when it is felt, may be very sublime, and the confused consciousness of humility may render the dependent creature an interesting object, in some points of view, but human love must have grosser ingredients, and the person, very naturally, will come in for its share, and an ample share it mostly has. Love is, in a great degree, an arbitrary passion, and will reign, like some other stalking mischiefs, by its own authority, without deigning to reason. And it may also be easily distinguished from esteem, the foundation of friendship, because it is often excited by evanescent beauties and graces, though to give an energy to the sentiment, something more solid must deepen their impression, and set the imagination to work, to make the most fair the first good. Common passions are excited by common qualities. Men look for beauty and the simper of good-humored docility. Women are captivated by easy manners. A gentlemanlike man seldom fails to please them, and their thirsty ears eagerly drink the insinuating nothings of politeness, whilst they turn from the unintelligible sounds of the charmer. Reason, charm he never so wisely. With respect to the superficial accomplishments, the rake certainly has the advantage, and of these females can form an opinion, for it is their own ground. Rendered gay and giddy by the whole tenor of their lives, the very aspect of wisdom, 
or the severe graces of virtue must have a lugubrious appearance to them, and produce a kind of restraint from which they, and love, supportive child, naturally revolt. Without taste, excepting of the lighter kind, for taste is the offspring of judgment, how can they discover that true beauty and grace must arise from the play of the mind? And how can they be expected to relish in a lover what they do not, or very imperfectly, possess themselves? The sympathy that unites hearts, and invites to confidence, in them is so very faint that it cannot take fire, and thus mount to passion. No, I repeat it, the love cherished by such minds must have grosser fuel. The inference is obvious. Till women are led to exercise their understandings, they should not be satirized for their attachment to rakes, nor even for being rakes at heart when it appears to be the inevitable consequence of their education. They who live to please must find their enjoyments, their happiness, in pleasure. It is a trite yet true remark, that we never do anything well, unless we love it for its own sake. Supposing, however, for a moment, that women were, in some future revolution of time, to become what I sincerely wish them to be, even love would acquire more serious dignity and be purified in its own fires, and virtue giving true delicacy to their affections, they would turn with disgust from a rake. Reasoning, then, as well as feeling, the only province of woman, at present, they might easily guard against exterior graces, and quickly learn to despise the sensibility that had been excited and hackneyed in the ways of women, whose trade was vice, and allurements wanton airs. They would recollect that the flame, one must use appropriate expressions, which they wished to light up, had been exhausted by lust, and that the sated appetite, losing all relish for pure and simple pleasures, could only be roused by licentious arts of variety. What satisfaction could a woman of delicacy promise herself, in a union with such a man, when the very artlessness of her affection might appear insipid? Thus does Dryden describe the situation. Where love is duty on the female side, On theirs mere sensual gust, And sought with surly pride. But one grand truth women have yet to learn, Though much it imports them to act accordingly, In the choice of a husband They should not be led astray By the qualities of a lover. For a lover, the husband, Even supposing him to be wise and virtuous, Cannot long remain. Were women more rationally educated, could they take a more comprehensive view of things, they would be contented to love but once in their lives, and after marriage calmly let passion subside into friendship, into that tender intimacy which is the best refuge from care, yet is built on such pure, still affections that idle jealousies would not be allowed to disturb the discharge of the sober duties of life nor to engross the thoughts that ought to be otherwise employed. This is a state in which many men live, but few, very few women. And the difference may easily be accounted for without recurring to a sexual character. Men, for whom we are told women are made, have too much occupied the thoughts of women, and this association has so entangled love with all their motives of action and to harp a little on an old string, having been solely employed either to prepare themselves to excite love, or actually putting their lessons in practice, they cannot live without love. But when a sense of duty or fear of shame obliges them to restrain this pampered desire of pleasing beyond certain lengths, too far for delicacy, it is true, though far from criminality, they obstinately determine to love. I speak of their passion, their husbands to the end of the chapter, and then acting the part which they foolishly extracted from their lovers, they become abject wooers and fond slaves. Men of wit and fancy are often rakes, and fancy is the food of love. Such men will inspire passion. Half the sex, in its present infantine state, would pine for a loveless, a man so witty, so graceful, and so valiant, 
And can they deserve blame for acting according to principles so constantly inculcated? They want a lover and protector, and behold him kneeling before them, bravery prostrate to beauty. The virtues of a husband are thus thrown by love into the background, and gay hopes, or lively emotions, banish reflection till the day of reckoning comes, and come it surely will, to turn the sprightly lover into a surly suspicious tyrant, who contemptuously insults the very weakness he fostered. Or, supposing the rake reformed, he cannot quickly get rid of old habits. When a man of abilities is first carried away by his passions, it is necessary that sentiment and taste varnish the enormities of vice, and give a zest to brutal indulgences. But when the gloss of novelty is worn off, and pleasure palls upon the sense, lasciviousness becomes barefaced, and enjoyment only the desperate effort of weakness flying from reflection as from a legion of devils. O oh, virtue, thou art not an empty name. All that life can give, thou givest. If much comfort cannot be expected from the friendship of a reformed rake of superior abilities, what is the consequence when he lacketh sense, as well as principles? Verily misery, in its most hideous shape. When the habits of weak people are consolidated by time, a reformation is barely possible, and actually makes the beings miserable who have not sufficient mind to be amused by innocent pleasure. Like the tradesman who retires from the hurry of business, nature presents to him only a universal blank, and the restless thoughts prey on the damped spirits. Their reformation, as well as his retirement, actually makes them wretched, because it deprives them of all employment, by quenching the hopes and fears that set in motion their sluggish minds. If such by the force of habit, if such be the bondage of folly, how carefully ought we to guard the mind from storing up vicious associations, and equally careful should we be to cultivate the understanding, to save the poor white from the weak dependent state of even harmless ignorance. For it is the right use of reason alone which makes us independent of everything, excepting the unclouded reason, whose service is perfect freedom. End of chapter 6「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Samantha Hayes. Vindication of the Rights of Women by Mary Volstonecraft. Chapter 7. Modesty, Comprehensively Considered and Not as a Sexual Virtue. Modesty, sacred offspring of sensibility and reason true delicacy of mind, may I unblame presume to investigate thy nature, and trace to its covert the mild charm, that mellowing each harsh feature of a character renders that would otherwise only inspire cold admiration, lovely. Thou that smoothest the wrinkles of wisdom, and softenest the tone of a more sublime virtue till they all melt into humanity, thou that speddest the eternal cloud that surrounding love heightens every beauty in half shades, breathing those coy sweets that steal into the heart and charm the senses, modulate for me the language of pervasion, reason, till I rouse my sex from the flowery bed on which they supinely sleep life away. In speaking of the association of our ideas, I have noticed two distinct modes, and in defining modesty, it appears to me equally proper to discriminate that purity of mind, which is the effect of chastity, from the simplicity of character that leads us to form a just opinion of ourselves, equally distant from vanity or presumption, though by no means incompatible with a lofty consciousness of our own dignity. Modesty in the latter signification of the term is that soberness of mind which teaches a man not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think and should be distinguished from humility, because humility is a kind of self-abasement. A modest man often conceives a great plan, and tenaciously adheres to it, conscious of its own strength. 
till success gives it a sanction that determines its character. Milton was not arrogant when he suffered a suggestion of judgment to escape him that proved a prophecy. Nor was General Washington when he accepted the command of the armed forces. The latter has always been characterized as a modest man. But he had been merely humble. He would probably have shrunk back irresolute, afraid of trusting to himself the direction of an enterprise on which so much depended. A modest man is steady, a humble man timid, a vain one presumptuous. This is the judgment which from the observations of many characters has led me to form. Jesus Christ was modest, Moses was humble, Peter vain. Thus discriminating modesty from humility, in one case I do not mean to confound it with the bashfulness of others. Bashfulness, in fact, is so distinct from modesty that the most bashful lass, or raw country lout, often becomes the most impudent. For their bashfulness, being merely the instinctive timidity of ignorance, custom soon changes it into assurance. Footnote. Such is the country maiden's fright, when first a red coat is in sight. Behind the door she hides her face, next time at distance eyes the lace. She now can all his terror stand, nor from his squeeze withdraw her hands. She plays familiar in his arms, and every soldier hath his charms. From tent to tent she spreads her flame, for customs conquer fear and shame. The shameless behavior of the prostitutes who infest the streets of London, raising alternate emotions of pity and disgust, may serve to illustrate this remark. They trample on virgin bashfulness with a sort of bravado, and glorifying in their shame, become more audaciously lewd than men, however deprived, to whom the sexual quality has not been gratuitously granted ever appear to be. But these poor ignorant wretches never had the modesty to lose. When they consign themselves to infamy, for modesty is a virtue, not a quality. They were only bashful, shamefaced innocence, and losing their innocence, their shamefacedness was rudely brushed off. A virtue would have left some vestiges in the mind had it been sacrificed to passion to make us respect the grand rune, purity of mind, or that genuine delicacy which is only the virtuous support of chastity, is near akin to that refinement of humanity which never resides in any but cultivated minds. It is something nobler than innocence. It is the delicacy of reflection, and not the coyness of ignorance. The reserve of reason, which like habitual cleanliness is seldom seen in any great degree, unless the soul is active, may easily be distinguished from rustic shyness or wanton skittishness. And so far from being incompatible with knowledge, it is the fairest fruit. What a gross idea of modesty had the writer of the following remark. The lady who asked the question whether women may be instructed in the modern system of botany consistently with female delicacy was accused of ridiculous prudery. Nevertheless, if she had proposed the question to me, I should certainly have answered, they cannot. Thus, is the fair book of knowledge to be shut with an everlasting seal? On reading similar passages, I have reverently lifted up my eyes and heart to him who liveth for ever and ever, and said, O oh, my father, hast thou, by the very constitution of her nature, forbid thy child to seek thee in the fair form of truth? And can her soul be sullied by the knowledge that awfully calls her to thee? I have then philosophically pursued these reflections till I inferred that those women who have the most improved their reason must have the most modesty, though a dignified sedateness of deportment may have succeeded the playful bewitching bashfulness of youth. Footnote. Modesty is the graceful calm virtue of maturity, bashfulness, the charm of vivacious youth. And thus I have argued, to render chastity the virtue from which unsophisticated modesty will naturally flow. The attention should be called away from employments which only exercise the sensibility, and the heart made to beat time to humanity rather than throb with love. The woman who has dedicated a considerable portion of her time to pursuits purely intellectual, and those whose affections have been exercised by humane plans of usefulness, must have more purity of mind as a natural consequence than the ignorant beings whose time and thoughts have been occupied by gay pleasures or schemes to conquer hearts. The regulation of the behavior is not modesty, though those who study the rules of decorum are in general termed modest women.
Make the heart clean, let it expand, and feel for all that is human, instead of being narrowed by selfish passions. And let the mind frequently contemplate subjects that exercise the understanding. Without the heating of the imagination, an artless modesty will give the finishing touches to the picture. She who can discern the dawn of immorality in the streaks that shoot athwart the misty night of ignorance, promising a clearer day, will respect as the sacred temple the body that enshrines such an improvable soul. True love, likewise, spreads this kind of mysterious sanctity round the beloved object, making the lover most modest when in her presence, so reserved in affection, that receiving or returning personal endearments it wishes not only to shun the human eye as a kind of profanation, but to diffuse an encircling cloudy obscurity to shut out even the saucy sparkling sunbeams. Yet, that affection does not deserve the epitaph of chaste, which does not receive a sublime gloom of tender melancholy that allows the mind for a moment to stand still and enjoy the present satisfaction when a consciousness of the divine presence is felt for this must ever be the food of joy as i have always been fond of tracing to its sources in nature any prevailing custom i have frequently thought that it was a sentiment of affection for whatever had touched the person of an absent or lost friend which gave the birth to respect for the relics so much abused by selfish priests devotion or love may be allowed to hollow the garments as well as the person for the lover must want fancy who has not a sort of sacred respect for the glove or slipper of his mistress he could not confound them with vulgar things of the same kind this fine sentiment perhaps would not bear to be analyzed by the experimental philosopher but of such stuff is human rapture made up a shadowy phantom glides before us obscuring every other object Yet, when the soft cloud is grasped, the form melts into common air, leaving a solitary void or sweet perfume, stolen from the violet, that memory long holds dear. But I have tripped unawares on fairy ground, feeling the balmy gale of spring stealing on me through November frowns. As a sex, women are more chaste than men, and modesty is the effect of chastity. They must deserve to have this virtue ascribed to them in rather an appropriate sense. Yet, I must be allowed to add an hesitating if, for I doubt whether chastity will produce modesty, though it may propriety of conduct, when it is merely a respect for the opinion of the world, and when contrary to the love-lorn tales of novelists employed the thoughts. Nay, from experience and reason, I should be led to expect to meet with more modesty amongst men than women, simply because men exercise their understandings more than women. But with respect to propriety of behavior, excepting one class of females, women have evidently the advantage. What can be more disgusting than the impudent dross of gallantry, thought so manly, which makes many men stare insultingly at every female they meet? Is this respect for the sex? This loose behavior shows such habitual depravity such weakness of mind that it is vain to expect much public or private virtue till both men and women grow more modest till men curbing a sensual fondness for the sex or an affection of manly assurance more properly speaking impudence treat each other with respect unless appetite or passion gives the tone peculiar to it to the behavior i mean even personal respect the modest respect of humanity and fellow feeling not the libidinous mockery of gallantry nor the insolent condescension of protectorship to carry the observation still further modesty must heartily disclaim and refuse to dwell with that debauchery of mind which leads a man coolly to bring forward without a blush indecent allusions or obscene witticisms in the presence of a fellow creature women are now out of the question and for them it is brutality Respect for man, as man is the foundation of every noble sentiment. How much more modest is the libertine who obeys the call of appetite or fancy than the lewd joker who sets off the table in a roar? This is one of the many instances in which the sexual distinction respecting modesty has proved fatal to virtue and happiness. It is, however, carried still further, and women, weak women, made by her education the slave of sensibility is required on the most trying occasions to resist that sensibility can anything says knox be more absurd than keeping women in a state of ignorance and yet so vehemently to insist on their resisting temptation 
Thus, when virtue or honor make it proper to check a passion, the burden is thrown on the weaker shoulders contrary to reason and true modesty, which at least should render the self-denial mutual to say nothing of the generosity of bravery, supposed to be a manly virtue. In the same strain runs Rousseau's and Dr. Gregory's advice respecting modesty, strangely miscalled. For they both desire a wife to leave it in doubt whether sensibility or weakness led her to her husband's arms. The woman is immodest who can let the shadow of such a doubt remain on her husband's mind a moment. But to state the subject in a different light, the want of modesty, which I principally deplore as subversive of morality, arises from the state of warfare so strenuously supported by voluptuous men as the very essence of modesty, though, in fact, it's bane, because it is a refinement on sensual desire that men fall into who have not sufficient virtue to relish the innocent pleasures of love. A man of delicacy carries his notions of modesty still further, for neither weakness nor sensibility will gratify him. He looks for affection. Again, men boast of their triumphs over women. What do they boast of? Truly the creature of sensibility was surprised by her sensibility into folly, into vice, and the dreadful reckoning falls heavily on her own weak head when reason wakes. For where art thou to find comfort, forlorn and disconsolate one? He who ought to have directed thy reason and supported thy weakness has betrayed thee, in a dream of passion without consented to wander through the flowery lawn and heedlessly stepping over the precipice to which thy guide instead of guarding lured thee thou startest from thy dream to face a sneering frowning world and to find thyself alone in a waste for he that triumph in thy weakness is now pursuing new conquests but for thee there is no redemption on this side of the grave and what resources hast thou in an enervated mind to raise a sinking heart footnote the poor moth fluttering round the candle burns its wings but if the sexes be really to live in a state of warfare if nature has pointed it out let men act nobly or let pride whisper to them that a victory is mean when they merely vanquish sensibility the real conquest is that over affection not be taken by surprise when like helosia a woman gives up all the world deliberately for love i do not now consider the wisdom or virtue of such a sacrifice I only contend that it was a sacrifice to affection, and not merely to sensibility, though she had her share, and I must be allowed to call her a modest woman, before I dismiss this part of the subject by saying, that till men are more chaste, women will be immodest. Where, indeed, could modest women find husbands for whom they would not continually turn with disgust? Modesty must be equally cultivated by both sexes or it will ever remain a sickly hothouse plant, whilst the affection of it, the fig leaf borrowed by wantonness, may give zest to voluptuous enjoyments. Men will probably still insist that women ought to have more modesty than man, but it is not dispassionate reasoners who will most earnestly oppose my opinion. No, they are the men of fancy, the favorites of the sex, who outwardly respect and inwardly despise the weak creatures whom they thus sport with. They could not submit to resign the highest sensual gratification, nor even to relish the epicurism of virtue, self-denial. To take another view of the subject, confining my remarks to women, the ridiculous falsities which are told to children from mistaken notions of modesty tend very early to inflame their imaginations and set their little minds to work, respecting subjects which nature never intended they should think of till the body arrived at some degree of maturity. Then the passions naturally begin to take place of the senses as an instrument to unfold the understanding and form the moral character. In nurseries and boarding schools, I fear, girls are first spoiled, particularly in the latter. A number of girls sleep in the same room and wash together, and though I should be sorry to contaminate an innocent creature's mind by instilling false delicacy or those indecent prudish notions which early cautions respecting the other sex naturally engendered i should be very anxious to prevent their acquiring indelicate or immodest habits and as many girls have learned very indelicate tricks from ignorant servants the mixing of them thus indiscriminately together is very improper to say the truth women are in general too familiar with each other 
which leads to that gross degree of familiarity that so frequently renders the marriage state unhappy. Why in the name of decency are sisters, female intimates, or ladies and their waiting women, to be so grossly familiar as to forget the respect which one human creature owes to another? That squeamish delicacy which shrinks from the most disgusting offices when affection or humanity leads us to watch as a sick pillow is despicable. But why women in health should be more familiar with each other than men are, when they boast of their superior delicacy, is a solecism in manner which I could never solve. In order to preserve health and beauty, I should earnestly recommend frequent ablutions to dignify my advice, that it may not offend the fastidious ear, and, by example, girls ought to be taught to wash and dress alone without any distinction of rank, and if custom should make them require some little assistance, let them not require it till that part of the business is over, which ought to be never done before a fellow creature, because it is an insult to the majesty of human nature, not on the score of modesty, but decency, for the care which some modest women take, making at the same time a display of that care, not to let their legs be seen, is as childish as immodest. Footnote. I remember to have met with a sentence in a book of education that made me smile. It would be needless to caution you against putting your hand by chance under your neck handkerchief. A modest woman never did so. I could proceed still further, till I am animadvertent on some still more indelicate customs, which men never fall into. Secrets are told where silence ought to reign, and that regard to cleanliness, which some religious sects have perhaps carried too far, especially the SNS amongst the Jews, by making that an insult to God, which is only an insult to humanity, is violated in a brutal manner. How can delicate women obtrude on notice that part of the animal economy which is so very disgusting? And it is not very rational to conclude that women who have not been taught to respect the nature of their own sex, in these particulars, will not long respect the mere difference of sex in their husbands. After their maidenish bashfulness is once lost, I, in fact, have generally observed that women fall into old habits and treat their husbands as they did their sisters or female acquaintances. Besides, women from necessity, because their minds are not cultivated, have recourse very often to what familiarity term bodily wit, and their intimacies are the same kind. In short, with respect to both mind and body, they are too intimate. That decent personal reserve, which is the foundation of dignity of character, must be kept between women, or their minds will never gain strength or modesty. On this account also, I object to many females being shut up together in nurseries, schools, or convents. I cannot recollect without indignation the jokes and hoyden tricks which knots of young women indulge themselves in when in my youth accident threw me an awkward rustic in their way. They were almost on a par with the double meanings, which shake the convenial table when the glass is circulated freely. But it is vain to attempt to keep the heart pure unless the head is furnished with ideas, and set to work to compare them, in order to acquire judgment by generalizing simple ones, and modesty by making the understanding damp the sensibility. It may be thought that I lay too great a stress on personal reserve, but it is ever the handmaid of modesty, so that where I name the grace that ought to adorn beauty, I should instantly exclaim cleanliness, neatness, and personal reserve. It is the obvious, I suppose, that the reserve I mean has nothing sexual in it, and that it is equally necessary in both sexes. So necessary, indeed, it is reserve and cleanliness which indolent women too often neglect, that I will venture to affirm that when two or three women live in the same house, the one will be the most respected by the male part of the family who resides with them, leaving love entirely out of the question, who pays this kind of habitual respect to her person. When domestic friends meet in the morning, there will naturally prevail an affectionate seriousness, especially if each look forward to the discharge of daily duties, and it may be reckoned fanciful, but this sentiment has frequently risen spontaneous in my mind. I have been pleased after breathing the sweet bracing morning air to see the same kind of freshness in the countenances I particularly loved. I was glad to see them braced, as it were, for the day, and ready to run their course with the sun. The greetings of affection in the morning are by these means more respectful than the familiar tenderness which frequently prolongs the evening talk. Nay, I have often felt hurt, not to say disgusted, when a friend has appeared, whom I parted with full dress the evening before, 
with her clothes huddled on because she chose to indulge herself in the bed to the last moment. Domestic affections can only be kept alive by these neglected attentions. Yet, if men and women took half as much pains to dress habitually neat as they do to ornament, or rather to disfigure their persons, much would be done towards the attainment of purity of mind. But only women dress to gratify men of gallantry, for the lover is always best pleased with a simple garb that sits close to the shape. There is an impertinence in ornaments that rebuffs affection, because love always clings round the idea of home. As a sex, women are habitually indolent, and everything tends to make them so. I do not forget the starts of an activity which sensibility produces, but as these flights of feeling only increase the evil, they are not to be confounded with the slow, orderly walk of reason. So great in reality is their mental and bodily indolence that till their body can be strengthened and their understanding enlarged by active exertions, there is little reason to expect that modesty will take place of bashfulness. They may find it prudent to assume its semblance, but the fair veil will only be worn on gala days. Perhaps there is not a virtue that mixes so kindly with every other as modesty. It is the pale moonbeam that renders more interesting virtue it often softens giving mild grandeur to the contracted horizon. Nothing can be more beautiful than the poetical fiction which makes Diana with her silver crescent the goddess of chastity. I have sometimes thought that wandering with the sedate step in some lovely recesses, a modest dame of antiquity must have felt a glow of conscious dignity when, after contemplating the soft, shadowy landscape, she has invited with a placid fervor the mild reflection of her sister's beams to turn her chaste bosom. A Christian has still nobler motives to incite her to preserve her chastity and acquire modesty, for her body has been called the temple of the living God, and the God who requires more modesty than of men. His eye searches the heart, and let her remember that if she hopeth to find favor in the sight of purity itself, her chastity must be founded on modesty, and not on worldly prudence, or verily a good reputation will be her only reward. For that awful intercourse, that sacred communion which virtue establishes between man and his maker, must give rise to the wish of being pure as he is pure. After foregoing remarks, it is almost superfluous to add that I consider all those feminine airs of maturity which succeed bashfulness, to which truth is sacrificed, to secure the heart of a husband, or rather to force him to be still a lover when nature would, had she not been interrupted in her operations, have made love give place to friendship as a modest. The tenderness which a man will feel for the mother of his children is an excellent substitute for the ardor of unsatisfied passion. But to prolong that ardor is indelicate, not to say immodest, for women who feign an unnatural coldness of constitution. Women as well as men ought to have the common appetites and passions of their nature. They are only brutal when unchecked by reason. But the obligation to check them is a duty of mankind, not a sexual duty. Nature, in these respects, may safely be left to herself. Let women only acquire knowledge and humanity, and love will teach them modesty. There is no need of falsehoods. Disgusting is futile. For studied rules of behavior only impose on shallow observers, a man of sense soon sees through and despises the affection. The behavior of young people to each other, as men and women, is the last thing that should be thought of in education. In fact, behavior in most circumstances is now so much thought of that simplicity of character is rarely to be seen. Yet, if men were only anxious to cultivate each virtue and let it take root firmly in the mind, the grace resulting from it, its natural exterior mark, would soon strip affection of its flaunting plumes, because felicious as unstable is the conduct that is not founded upon truth. Footnote. The behavior of many newly married women has often disgusted me. They seem anxious never to let their husbands forget the privilege of marriage, and to find no pleasure in his society unless he is acting the lover. Short indeed must be the reign of love when the flame is thus constantly blown up without its receiving any solid fuel. Would ye, O oh my sisters, really possess modesty, ye must remember that the possession of virtue of any denomination is incompatible with ignorance and vanity. Ye must acquire that soberness of mind which the exercise of duties and the pursuit of knowledge alone inspire, or ye will still remain in a doubtful dependent situation and only be loved whilst ye is fair. The downcast eye, the rosy blush, the retiring grace are all proper in their season, 
But modesty, being the child of reason, cannot long exist with the sensibility that is not tempered by reflection. Besides, when love, even innocent love, is the whole employ of your lives, your hearts will be too soft to afford modesty that tranquil retreat where she delights to dwell in the close union of humanity. End of chapter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cory Samuel. A Vindication of the Rights of Woman by Mary Wollstonecraft. Chapter 8. Morality Undermined by Sexual Notions of the Importance of a Good Reputation. It has long since occurred to me that advice respecting behaviour and all the various modes of preserving a good reputation, which have been so strenuously inculcated on the female world, were specious poisons that encrusting morality eat away the substance, and that this measuring of shadows produced a false calculation, because their length depends so much on the height of the sun and other adventitious circumstances. From whence arises the easy, fallacious behaviour of a courtier? From this situation, undoubtedly, for standing in need of dependence, he is obliged to learn the art of denying without giving offence, and of evasively feeding hope with the chameleon's food. Thus does politeness sport with truth, and eating away the sincerity and humanity natural to man produce the fine gentleman. Women in the same way acquire, from a supposed necessity, an equally artificial mode of behaviour. Yet truth is not with impunity to be sported with, for the practice dissembler at last becomes the dupe of his own arts, loses that sagacity which has been justly termed common sense, namely a quick perception of common truths, which are constantly received as such by the unsophisticated mind, though it might not have had sufficient energy to discover them itself when obscured by local prejudices. The greater number of people take their opinions on trust, to avoid the trouble of exercising their own minds, and these indolent beings naturally adhere to the letter, rather than to the spirit of a law, divine or human. Women, says some author, I cannot recollect who, mind not what only heaven sees. Why, indeed, should they? It is the eye of man that they have been taught to dread, and if they can lull their Argus to sleep, they seldom think of heaven, or themselves, because their reputation is safe, and it is reputation, not chastity, and all its fair train, that they are employed to keep free from spot, not as a virtue, but to preserve their station in the world. To prove the truth of this remark, I need only advert to the intrigues of married women, particularly in high life, and in countries where women are suitably married, according to their respective ranks, by their parents. If an innocent girl become a prey to love, she is degraded for ever, though her mind was not polluted by the arts which married women, under the convenient cloak of marriage, practice. Nor has she violated any duty, but the duty of respecting herself. The married woman, on the contrary, breaks a most sacred engagement and becomes a cruel mother when she is a false and faithless wife. If her husband has still an affection for her, the arts which she must practice to deceive him will render her the most contemptible of human beings. And, at any rate, the contrivances necessary to preserve appearances will keep her mind in that childish or vicious tumult which destroys all its energy. Besides, in time, like those who habitually take cordials to raise their spirits, she will want an intrigue to give life to her thoughts, having lost all relish for pleasures that are not highly seasoned by hope or fear. Sometimes married women act still more audaciously. I will mention an instance. A woman of quality, notorious for her gallantries, though, as she still lived with her husband, 
nobody chose to place her in the class where she ought to have been placed, made a point of treating, with the most insulting contempt, a poor, timid creature, abashed by a sense of her former weakness, whom a neighbouring gentleman had seduced, and afterwards married. This woman had actually confounded virtue with reputation, and, I do believe, valued herself on the propriety of her behaviour before marriage, though, when once settled to the satisfaction of her family, she and her lord were equally faithless, so that the half-alive heir to an immense estate came from heaven knows where. To view this subject in another light. I have known a number of women who, if they did not love their husbands, loved nobody else, giving themselves entirely up to vanity and dissipation, neglecting every domestic duty, nay, even squandering away all the money which should have been saved for their helpless younger children, yet have plumed themselves on their unsullied reputation, as if the whole compass of their duty as wives and mothers was only to preserve it, whilst other indolent women, neglecting every personal duty, have thought that they deserved their husband's affection, because they acted, in this respect, with propriety. Weak minds are always fond of resting in the ceremonials of duty, but morality offers much simpler motives, and it were to be wished that superficial moralists had said less respecting behaviour and outward observances, for unless virtue of any kind is built on knowledge, it will only produce a kind of insipid decency. Respect for the opinion of the world has, however, been termed the principal duty of woman in the most express words, for Rousseau declares that reputation is no less indispensable than chastity. A man, adds he, secure in his own good conduct, depends only on himself, and may brave the public opinion. But a woman, in behaving well, performs but half her duty, as what is thought of her is as important to her as what she really is. It follows hence that the system of a woman's education should, in this respect, be directly contrary to that of ours. Opinion is the grave of virtue among the men, but its throne among women. It is strictly logical to infer that the virtue that rests on opinion is merely worldly, and that it is the virtue of a being to whom reason has been denied. But. Even with respect to the opinion of the world, I am convinced that this class of reasoners are mistaken. This regard for reputation, independent of its being one of the natural rewards of virtue, however, took its rise from a cause which I have already deplored as the grand source of female depravity, the impossibility of regaining respectability by a return to virtue though men preserve theirs during the indulgence of vice. It was natural for women, then, to endeavour to preserve what once lost was lost for ever, till this care, swallowing up every other care, reputation for chastity, became the one thing needful to the sex. But vain is the scrupulosity of ignorance, for neither religion nor virtue, when they reside in the heart, require such a puerile attention to mere ceremonies, because the behaviour must, upon the whole, be proper when the motive is pure. To support my opinion, I can produce very respectable authority, and the authority of a cool reasoner ought to have weight to enforce consideration, though not to establish a sentiment. Speaking of the general laws of morality, Dr. Smith observes, that by some very extraordinary and unlucky circumstance, a good man may come to be suspected of a crime of which he was altogether incapable, and upon that account be most unjustly exposed for the remaining part of his life to the horror and aversion of mankind. By an accident of this kind, he may be said to lose his all, notwithstanding his integrity and justice, in the same manner as a cautious man notwithstanding his utmost circumspection, 
may be ruined by an earthquake or an inundation. Accidents of the first kind, however, are perhaps still more rare and still more contrary to the common course of things than those of the second, and it still remains true that the practice of truth, justice and humanity is a certain and almost infallible method of acquiring what those virtues chiefly aim at, the confidence and love of those we live with. A person may be easily misrepresented with regard to a particular action, but it is scarcely possible that he should be so with regard to the general tenor of his conduct. An innocent man may be believed to have done wrong. This, however, will rarely happen. On the contrary, the established opinion of the innocence of his manners will often lead us to absolve him where he really has been in the fault, notwithstanding very strong presumptions. I perfectly coincide in opinion with this writer, for I verily believe that few of either sex were ever despised for certain vices without deserving to be despised. I speak not of the calumny of the moment, which hangs over a character, like one of the dense fogs of November over this metropolis, till it gradually subsides before the common light of day. I only contend that the daily conduct of the majority prevails to stamp their character with the impression of truth. Quietly does the clear light, shining day after day, refute the ignorant surmise or malicious tale which has thrown dirt on a pure character. A false light distorted for a short time its shadow, reputation, but it seldom fails to become just when the cloud is dispersed that produced the mistake in vision. Many people, undoubtedly in several respects, obtain a better reputation than, strictly speaking, they deserve, for unremitting industry will mostly reach its goal in all races. They who only strive for this paltry prize, like the Pharisees, who prayed at the corner of streets to be seen of men, verily obtain the reward they seek, for the heart of man cannot be read by man. Still the fair fame that is naturally reflected by good actions, when the man is only employed to direct his steps aright, regardless of the lookers-on, is, in general, not only more true, but more sure. There are, it is true, trials, when the good man must appeal to God from the injustice of man, and amidst the whining candour or hissing of envy, erect a pavilion in his own mind to retire to, till the rumour be overpassed. Nay, the darts of undeserved censure may pierce an innocent, tender bosom through with many sorrows, but these are all exceptions to general rules. And it is according to these common laws that human behaviour ought to be regulated. The eccentric orbit of the comet never influences astronomical calculations, respecting the invariable order established in the motion of the principal bodies of the solar system. I will then venture to affirm that after a man has arrived at maturity, the general outline of his character in the world is just, allowing for the before-mentioned exceptions to the rule. I do not say that a prudent, worldly-wise man with only negative virtues and qualities may not sometimes obtain a smoother reputation than a wiser or a better man. So far from it, that I am apt to conclude from experience that where the virtue of two people is nearly equal, the most negative character will be liked best by the world at large, whilst the other may have more friends in private life. But the hills and dales, clouds and sunshine, conspicuous in the virtues of great men, set off each other, and though they afford envious weakness a fairer mark to shoot at, the real character will still work its way to light, though bespattered by weak affection or ingenious malice. With respect to that anxiety to preserve a reputation hardly earned, which leads sagacious people to analyse it, I shall not make the obvious comment. But I am afraid that morality is very insidiously undermined, in the female world, by the attention being turned to the show instead of the substance. A simple thing 
is thus made strangely complicated. Nay, sometimes virtue and its shadow are set at variance. We should never, perhaps, have heard of Lucretia, had she died to preserve her chastity instead of her reputation. If we really deserve our own good opinion, we shall commonly be respected in the world. But if we pant after higher improvement and higher attainments, it is not sufficient to view ourselves as we suppose that we are viewed by others, though this has been ingeniously argued as the foundation of our moral sentiments. Because each bystander may have his own prejudices, besides the prejudices of his age or country, we should rather endeavour to view ourselves as we suppose that being views us, who seeth each thought ripen into action, and whose judgment never swerves from the eternal rule of right. Righteous are all his judgments, just as merciful. The humble mind that seeketh to find favour in his sight, and calmly examines its conduct when only his presence is felt, will seldom form a very erroneous opinion of its own virtues. During the still hour of self-collection, the angry brow of offended justice will be fearfully deprecated, or the tie which draws man to the deity will be recognised in the pure sentiment of reverential adoration that swells the heart without exciting any tumultuous emotions. In these solemn moments, man discovers the germ of those vices, which, like the java tree, shed a pestiferous vapour around, death is in the shade, and he perceives them without abhorrence, because he feels himself drawn by some cord of love to all his fellow creatures, for whose follies he is anxious to find every extenuation in their nature, in himself. If I, he may thus argue, who exercise my own mind, and have been refined by tribulation, find the serpent's egg in some fold of my heart, and crush it with difficulty, shall not I pity those who are stamped with less vigour, or who have heedlessly nurtured the insidious reptile, till it poisoned the vital stream it sucked? Can I, conscious of my secret sins, throw off my fellow creatures, and calmly see them drop into the chasm of perdition that yawns to receive them. No, no, the agonised heart will cry with suffocating impatience, I too am a man, and have vices, hid perhaps from human eye, that bend me to the dust before God, and loudly tell me, when all is mute, that we are formed of the same earth, and breathe the same element. Humanity thus rises naturally out of humility, and twists the cords of love that in various convolutions entangle the heart. This sympathy extends still further, till a man well pleased observes force in arguments that do not carry conviction to his own bosom, and he gladly places in the fairest light to himself the shows of reason that have led others astray, rejoiced to find some reason in all the errors of man, though before convinced that he who rules the day makes his sun to shine on all. Yet, shaking hands thus, as it were, with corruption, one foot on earth, the other with bold strides mounts to heaven, and claims kindred with superior natures. Virtues, unobserved by men, drop their balmy fragrance at this cool hour and the thirsty land, refreshed by the pure streams of comfort that suddenly gush out, is crowned with smiling verdure. This is the living green, on which that eye may look with complacency that is too pure to behold iniquity. But my spirits flag, and I must silently indulge the reverie these reflections lead to. Unable to describe the sentiments that have calmed my soul, when watching the rising sun, a soft shower drizzling through the leaves of neighbouring trees seemed to fall on my languid yet tranquil spirits, to cool the heart that had been heated by the passions which reason laboured to tame. The leading principles 
which run through all my disquisitions, would render it unnecessary to enlarge on this subject if a constant attention to keep the varnish of the character fresh and in good condition were not often inculcated as the sum total of female duty, if rules to regulate the behaviour and to preserve the reputation did not too frequently supersede moral obligations. But, with respect to reputation, the attention is confined to a single virtue, chastity. If the honour of a woman, as it is absurdly called, is safe, she may neglect every social duty, nay, ruin her family by gaming and extravagance, yet still present a shameless front, for truly she is an honourable woman. Mrs. Macaulay has justly observed that there is but one fault which a woman of honour may not commit with impunity. She then justly and humanely adds, This has given rise to the trite and foolish observation that the first fault against chastity in woman has a radical power to deprave the character. But no such frail beings come out of the hands of nature. The human mind is built of nobler materials than to be so easily corrupted, and with all their disadvantages of situation and education, women seldom become entirely abandoned, till they are thrown into a state of desperation by the venomous rancour of their own sex. But, in proportion as this regard for the reputation of chastity is prized by women, it is despised by men and the two extremes are equally destructive to morality. Men are certainly more under the influence of their appetites than women, and their appetites are more depraved by unbridled indulgence and the fastidious contrivances of satiety. Luxury has introduced a refinement in eating that destroys the constitution, and a degree of gluttony which is so beastly that a perception of seemliness of behaviour must be worn out before one being could eat immoderately in the presence of another and afterwards complain of the oppression that his intemperance naturally produced. Some women, particularly French women, have also lost a sense of decency in this respect, for they will talk very calmly of an indigestion. It were to be wished that idleness was not allowed to generate on the rank soil of wealth those swarms of summer insects that feed on putrefaction, we should not then be disgusted by the sight of such brutal excesses. There is one rule relative to behaviour that, I think, ought to regulate every other, and it is simply to cherish such a habitual respect for mankind as may prevent us from disgusting a fellow creature for the sake of a present indulgence. The shameful indolence of many married women and others a little advanced in life, frequently leads them to sin against delicacy. For, though convinced that the person is the band of union between the sexes, yet how often do they, from sheer indolence, or to enjoy some trifling indulgence, disgust? The depravity of the appetite, which brings the sexes together, has had a still more fatal effect. Nature must ever be the standard of taste, the gauge of appetite, yet how grossly is nature insulted by the voluptuary. Leaving the refinements of love out of the question, nature, by making the gratification of an appetite in this respect, as well as every other, a natural and imperious law to preserve the species, exalts the appetite, and mixes a little mind and affection with a sensual gust. The feelings of a parent, mingling with an instinct merely animal, give it dignity, and the man and woman often meeting on account of the child, a mutual interest and affection is excited by the exercise of a common sympathy. Women then having necessarily some duty to fulfil more noble than to adorn their persons, would not contentedly be the slaves of casual appetite which is now the situation of a very considerable number who are, literally speaking, standing dishes to which every glutton may have access. I may be told that great as this enormity is 
it only affects a devoted part of the sex, devoted for the salvation of the rest. But, false as every assertion might easily be proved, that recommends the sanctioning a small evil to produce a greater good, the mischief does not stop here, for the moral character and peace of mind of the chaster part of the sex is undermined by the conduct of the very women to whom they allow no refuge from guilt, whom they inexorably consign to the exercise of arts that lure their husbands from them, debauch their sons, and force them, let not modest women start to assume, in some degree, the same character themselves. For I will venture to assert that all the causes of female weakness, as well as depravity, which I have already enlarged on, branch out of one grand cause, want of chastity in men. This intemperance, so prevalent, depraves the appetite to such degree that a wanton stimulus is necessary to rouse it. But the parental design of nature is forgotten, and the mere person, and that, for a moment, alone engrosses the thoughts. So voluptuous, indeed, often grows the lustful prowler that he refines on female softness. To satisfy this genius of men, women are made systematically voluptuous, and though they may not all carry their libertinism to the same height, yet this heartless intercourse with the sex which they allow themselves depraves both sexes, because the taste of men is vitiated, and women of all classes naturally square their behaviour to gratify the taste by which they obtain pleasure and power. Women becoming, consequently, weaker, in mind and body, than they ought to be, were one of the grand ends of their being taken into the account, that of bearing and nursing children, have not sufficient strength to discharge the first duty of a mother, and sacrificing to lasciviousness the parental affection that ennobles instinct, either destroy the embryo in the womb, or cast it off when born. Nature in every thing demands respect, and those who violate her laws seldom violate them with impunity. The weak, enervated women, who particularly catch the attention of libertines, are unfit to be mothers, though they may conceive, so that the rich sensualist, who has rioted among women, spreading depravity and misery, when he wishes to perpetuate his name, receives from his wife only a half-formed being that inherits both its father's and mother's weakness. Contrasting the humanity of the present age with the barbarism of antiquity, great stress has been laid on the savage custom of exposing the children whom their parents could not maintain, whilst the man of sensibility, who thus, perhaps, complains by his promiscuous amours, produces a most destructive barrenness and contagious flagitiousness of manners. Surely nature never intended that women, by satisfying an appetite, should frustrate the very purpose for which it was implanted. I have before observed that men ought to maintain the women whom they have seduced. This would be one means of reforming female manners, and stopping an abuse that has an equally fatal effect on population and morals. Another, no less obvious, would be to turn the attention of woman to the real virtue of chastity. For to little respect has that woman a claim, on the score of modesty, though her reputation may be white as the driven snow, who smiles on the libertine, while she spurns the victims of his lawless appetites and their own folly. Besides, she has a taint of the same folly, pure as she esteems herself, when she studiously adorns her person only to be seen by men, to excite respectful sighs and all the idle homage of what is called innocent gallantry. Did women really respect virtue for its own sake, they would not seek for a compensation in vanity, for the self-denial which they are obliged to practice to preserve their reputation, nor would they associate with men who set reputation at defiance. 
the two sexes mutually corrupt and improve each other. This I believe to be an indisputable truth, extending it to every virtue. Chastity, modesty, public spirit, and all the noble train of virtues, on which social virtue and happiness are built, should be understood and cultivated by all mankind, or they will be cultivated to little effect. And, instead of furnishing the vicious or idle with a pretext for violating some sacred duty by terming it a sexual one, it would be wiser to show that nature has not made any difference, for that the unchaste man doubly defeats the purpose of nature by rendering women barren and destroying his own constitution, though he avoids the shame that pursues the crime in the other sex. These are the physical consequences. The moral are still more alarming, for virtue is only a nominal distinction when the duties of citizens, husbands, wives, fathers, mothers and directors of family become merely the selfish ties of convenience. Why then do philosophers look for public spirit? Public spirit must be nurtured by private virtue, or it will resemble the factitious sentiment which makes women careful to preserve their reputation and men their honour. A sentiment that often exists unsupported by virtue, unsupported by that sublime morality which makes the habitual breach of one duty a breach of the whole moral law. End of chapter 8「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.」Vindication of the Rights of Women by Mary Wollstonecraft Chapter 9 Of the Pernicious Effects Which Arise from the Unnatural Distinctions Established in Society From the respect paid to property flow, as from a poisoned fountain, most of the evils and vices which render this world such a dreary scene to the contemplative mind. For it is in the most polished society that noisome reptiles and venomous serpents lurk under the rank herbage, and there is voluptuousness pampered by the still sultry air which relaxes every good disposition before it ripens into virtue. One class presses on another, for all are aiming to procure respect on account of their property and property, once gained, will procure the respect due only to talents and virtue. Men neglect the duties incumbent on man, yet are treated like demigods. Religion is also separated from morality by a ceremonial veil, yet men wonder that the world is almost, literally speaking, a den of sharpers or oppressors. There is a homely proverb, which speaks the shrewd truth, that whoever the devil finds idle he will employ. And what but the habitual idleness can hereditary wealth and titles produce? For man is so constituted that he can only attain a proper use of his faculties by exercising them, and will not exercise them unless necessity, of some kind, first set the wheels in motion. Virtue, likewise, can only be acquired by the discharge of relative duties, but the importance of these sacred duties will scarcely be felt by the being who is cajoled out of his humanity by the flattery of sycophants. There must be more equality established in society, or morality will never gain ground, and this virtuous equality will not rest firmly even when founded on a rock if one half of mankind are chained to its bottom by fate, for they will be continually undermining it through ignorance or pride. It is vain to expect virtue from women till they are, in some degree, independent of men. Nay, it is vain to expect that strength of natural affection which would make them good wives and good mothers. Whilst they are absolutely dependent on their husbands, they will be cunning, mean, and selfish, and the men who can be gratified by the fawning fondness of spaniel-like affection have not much delicacy, for love is not to be bought in any sense of the word. Its silken wings are instantly shriveled up when anything beside a return in kind is sought. Yet whilst wealth enervates men, and women live, as it were, by their personal charms, how can we expect them to discharge those ennobling duties which equally require exertion and self-denial? Hereditary property sophisticates the mind, and the unfortunate victims to it, if I may so express myself, swathed from their birth, 
seldom exert the locomotive faculty of body or mind, and, thus viewing everything through one medium and that a false one, they are unable to discern in what true merit and happiness consist. False indeed must be the light when the drapery of situation hides man and makes him stalk in masquerade, dragging from one scene of dissipation to another the nerveless limbs that hang with stupid listlessness, and rolling round the vacant eye which plainly tells us that there is no mind at home. I mean, therefore, to infer that the society is not properly organized, which does not compel men and women to discharge their respective duties, by making it the only way to acquire that countenance from their fellow creatures which every human being wishes some way to attain. The respect, consequently, which is paid to wealth and mere personal charms, is a true northeast blast that blights the tender blossoms of affection and virtue. Nature has wisely attached affections to duties, to sweeten toil, and to give that vigor to the exertions of reason which only the heart can give. But, the affection which is put on merely because it is the appropriated insignia of a certain character, when its duties are not fulfilled, is one of the empty compliments which vice and folly are obliged to pay to virtue and the real nature of things. To illustrate my opinion, I need only observe that when a woman is admired for her beauty, and suffers herself to be so far intoxicated by the admiration she receives as to neglect to discharge the indispensable duty of a mother, she sins against herself by neglecting to cultivate an affection that would equally tend to make her useful and happy. True happiness, I mean all the contentment and virtuous satisfaction that can be snatched in this imperfect state, must arise from well-regulated affections, and an affection includes a duty. Men are not aware of the misery they cause, and the vicious weakness they cherish, by only inciting women to render themselves pleasing, they do not consider that they thus make natural and artificial duties clash, by sacrificing the comfort and respectability of a woman's life to voluptuous notions of beauty, when in nature they all harmonize. Cold would be the heart of a husband, were he not rendered unnatural by early debauchery, who did not feel more delight at seeing his child suckled by its mother than the most artful wanton tricks could ever raise. Yet this natural way of cementing the matrimonial tie, and twisting esteem with fonder recollections, wealth leads women to spurn. To preserve their beauty, and wear the flowery crown of the day that gives them a kind of right to reign for a short time over the sex, they neglect to stamp impressions on their husbands' hearts that would be remembered with more tenderness when the snow on the head began to chill the bosom than even their virgin charms. The maternal solicitude of a reasonable, affectionate woman is very interesting, and to the chastened dignity with, with which a mother returns the caresses that she and her child receive from a father who has been fulfilling the serious duties of his station is not only a respectable, but a beautiful sight. So singular indeed are my feelings, and I have endeavored not to catch factitious ones, that after be having been fatigued with the sight of insipid grandeur and the slavish ceremonies that with cumbrous pomp supplied the place of domestic affections, I have turned to some other scene to relieve my eye, by resting it on the refreshing green everywhere scattered by nature. I have then viewed with pleasure a woman nursing her children and discharging the duties of her station with, perhaps, merely a servant made to take off her hands the servile part of the household business. I have seen her prepare herself and her children, with only the luxury of cleanliness, to receive her husband, who, returning home, weary home in the evening, found smiling babes and a clean hearth. My heart has loitered in the midst of the group, and has even throbbed with sympathetic emotion when the scraping of the well-known foot has raised a pleasing tumult. Whilst my benevolence has been gratified by contemplating this artless picture, I have thought that a couple of this description, equally necessary and independent of each other, because each fulfilled the respective duties of their station, possessed all that life could give, raised sufficiently above abject poverty not to be obliged to weigh the consequence of every farthing they spend, and having sufficient to prevent their attending to a frigid system of economy which narrows both heart and mind. I declare, so vulgar are my conceptions that I know not what is wanted to render this the happiest as well as the most respectable situation in the world, but for a taste of literature, to throw a little variety and interest in so, into social converse, and some superfluous money to give to the needy and to buy books. For it is not pleasant when the heart is opened by compassion, and the head active in arranging plans of usefulness, 
to have a prim urchin continually twitching back the elbow to prevent the hand from drawing out an almost empty purse, whispering at the same time some prudential maxim about the priority of justice. Destructive, however, as riches and inherited honors are to the human character, women are more debased and cramped, if possible by them, than men, because men may still, in some degree, unfold their faculties by becoming soldiers and statesmen. As soldiers, I grant, they can now only gather, for the most part, vainglorious laurels, whilst they adjust to a hair the European balance, taking a special care that no bleak northern nook or sound incline the beam. But the days of true heroism are over, when a citizen fought for his country like a Fabricius or a Washington, and then returned to his farm to let virtuous fervor run in a more placid, but not a less salutary stream. No, our British heroes are oftener sent from the gaming table than from the plough, and their passions have been rather inflamed by hanging with dumb suspense on the turn of a die, than sublimated by panting after the adventurous march of virtue in the historic page. The statesman, it is true, might with more propriety quit the faro bank or card table to guide the helm, for he has still but to shuffle and trick. The whole system of British politics, if system it may courteously be called, consisting in multiplying dependents and contriving taxes which grind the poor to pamper the rich, thus a war, or any wild goose chase, is, as the vulgar use the phrase, a lucky turn-up of patronage for the minister, whose chief merit is the art of keeping himself in place. It is not necessary, then, that he should have bowels for the poor, so he can secure for his family the odd trick, or should show some of respect for what is termed with ignorant ostentation an Englishman's birthright, be expedient to bubble the gruff mastiff that he has had to lead by the nose, he can make an empty show very safely by giving his single voice and suffering his light squadron to file off to the other side. And when a question of humanity is agitated, he may dip a sop in the milk of human kindness, to silence Cerberus, and talk of the interest which his heart takes in an attempt to make the earth no longer cry for vengeance as it sucks in its children's blood, though his cold hand may at the very moment rivet their chains by sanctioning the abominable traffic. A minister is no longer a minister than while he can carry a point, which he is determined to carry. Yet it is not necessary that a minister should feel like a man when a bold push might shake his seat. But to have done with these episodical observations, let me return to the more specious slavery which chains the very soul of woman, keeping her forever under the bondage of ignorance. The preposterous distinctions of rank, which render a civilization a curse, by dividing the world between voluptuous tyrants and cunning envious dependents, corrupt almost equally every class of people, because respectability is not attached to the discharge of the relative duties of life, but to the station, and when the duties are not fulfilled, the affections cannot gain sufficient strength to fortify the virtue of which they are the natural reward. Still, there are some loopholes out of which a man may creep, and dare to think and act for himself. But for a woman it is a Herculean task, because she has difficulties peculiar to her sex to overcome, which require almost superhuman powers. A truly benevolent legislator always endeavors to make it the interest of each individual to be virtuous, and thus private virtue becoming the cement of public happiness, an orderly whole is consolidated by the tendency of all the parts toward a common center. But the private or public virtue of woman is very problematical, for Rousseau and a numerous list of male writers insist that she should all her life be subjected to a severe restraint, that of propriety. Why subject her to propriety, blind propriety, if she be capable of acting from a nobler spring, if she be an heir of immortality? Is sugar always to be produced by vital blood? Is one half of the human species, like the poor African slaves, to be subject to prejudices that brutalize them, when principles would be a surer guard only to sweeten the cup of man? Is this not indirectly to deny women reason? For a gift is a mockery if it be unfit for use. Women are in common with men rendered weak and luxurious by the relaxing pleasures which wealth procures, but added to this, they are made slaves to their persons, and must render them alluring, that man may lend them his reason to guide their tottering steps aright. Or, should they be ambitious, they must govern their tyrants by sinister tricks, for without rights there cannot be any incumbent duties. The laws respecting woman, which I mean to discuss in a future part, make an absurd unit of a man and his wife, 
and then, by the easy transition of only considering him as responsible, she is reduced to a mere cipher. The being who discharges the duties of its station is independent, and speaking of women at large, their first duty is to themselves as rational creatures, and the next, in point of importance, as citizens, is that which includes so many of a mother. The rank in life which dispenses with their fulfilling this duty necessarily degrades them by making them mere dolls. Or, should they turn to something more important than merely fitting drapery upon a smooth block, their minds are only occupied by some soft platonic attachment, or the actual manage of an intrigue may keep their caught thoughts in motion, for when they neglect domestic duties, they have it not in their power to take the field and march and countermarch like soldiers, or wrangle in the senate to keep their faculties from rusting. I know that as proof of the inferiority of the sex, Rousseau has exultingly claimed, how can they leave the nursery for the camp? And the camp has, by some moralists, been termed the school of the most heroic virtues, though, I think, it was puzzle a keen casuist to prove the reasonableness of the greater number of wars that have dubbed heroes. I do not mean to consider this question critically, because, having frequently viewed these freaks of ambition as the first natural mode of civilization, when the ground must be torn up and the woods cleared by fire and sword, I do not choose to call them pests. But surely the present system of war has little connection with the virtue of any denomination, being rather the school of finesse and effeminacy than of fortitude. Yet, if defensive war, the only justifiable war in the present advanced state of society, where virtue can show its face and ripen amidst the rigors which purify the air on the mountain's top, were alone to be adopted as just and glorious, the true heroism of antiquity might again animate female bosoms. But fair and softly, gentle reader, male or female, do not alarm thyself. For though I have contrasted the character of a modern soldier with that of a civilized woman, I am not going to advise them to turn their distaff into a musket, though I sincerely wish to see the bayonet converted into a pruning hook. I only recreated an imagination fatigued by contemplating the vices and follies which all proceed from a feculent stream of wealth that has muddied the pure rills of natural affection, by supposing that society will some time or other be so constituted that man must necessarily fulfill the duties of a citizen or be despised, and that while he was employed in any of the departments of civil life, his wife, also an active citizen, should be equally intent to manage her family, educate her children, and assist her neighbors. But, to render her really virtuous and useful, she must not, if she discharge her civil duties, want, individually, the protection of civil laws. She must not be dependent on her husband's bounty for her subsistence during his life, or support after his death. For how can a being be generous who has nothing of its own, or virtuous who is not free? The wife, in the present state of things, who is faithful to her husband, and neither suckles nor educates her children, scarcely deserves the name of a wife, and has no right to that of a citizen. But take away natural rights, and there is, of course, an end of duties. Women, thus infallibly, become only the wanton solace of men, when they are so weak in mind and body that they cannot exert themselves, unless to pursue some frothy pleasure or to invent some frivolous fashion. What can be a more melancholy sight to a thinking mind than to look into the numerous carriages that drive helter-skelter about this metropolis in a morning, full of pale-faced creatures who are flying from themselves. I have often wished, with Dr. Johnson, to place some of them in a little shop, with half a dozen children looking up to their languid countenances for support. I am much mistaken if some latent vigor would not soon give health and spirit to their eyes, and some lines drawn by the exercise of reason on the blank cheeks which before were only undulated by dimples, might restore lost dignity to their character, or rather enable it to attain the true dignity of its nature. Virtue is not to be acquired even by speculation, much less by the negative supineness that wealth naturally generates. Besides, when poverty is more disgraceful than even vice, is not morality cut to the quick? Still, to avoid misconstruction, though I consider that women in the common walks of life are called to fulfill the duties of wives and mothers, 
By religion and reason I cannot help lamenting that women of a superior caste have not a road open by which they can pursue the more extensive plans of usefulness and independence. I may excite laughter by dropping a hint, which I mean to pursue some future time, for I really think that women ought to have representatives, instead of being arbitrarily governed without having any direct share allowed them in the deliberations of government. But as the whole system of representation is now, in this country, only a convenient handle for despotism, they need not complain, for they are as well represented as a numerous class of hard-working mechanics, who pay for the support of royalty, when they can scarcely stop their children's mouths with bread. How are they represented, whose very sweat supports the splendid stud of an heir apparent, or who varnishes the chariot of some female favorite who looks down in shame? Taxes on the very necessaries of life enable an endless tribe of idle princes and princesses to pass with stupid pomp before a gaping crowd, who almost worship the very parade which costs them so dear. This is mere Gothic grandeur, something like the barbarous useless parade of having sentinels on horseback at Whitehall, which I could never view without a mixture of contempt and indignation. How strangely must the mind be sophisticated when this sort of state impresses it! But till these monuments of folly are leveled by virtue, similar follies will leaven the whole mass. For the same character, in some degree, will prevail in the aggregate of society, and the refinements of luxury, or the vicious repinings of envious poverty, will equally banish virtue from society, considered as the characteristic of that society, or only allow it to appear as one of the stripes of the harlequin coat, worn by the civilized man. In the superior ranks of life, every duty is done by deputies, as if duties could ever be waived, and the vain pleasures which consequent idleness forces the rich to pursue appear so enticing to the next rank that the numerous scramblers for wealth sacrifice everything to tread on their heels. The most sacred trusts are then considered as sinecures, because they were procured by interest, and only sought to enable a man to keep good company. Women, in particular, all want to be ladies, which is simply to have nothing to do, but listlessly to go they scarcely care where, for they cannot tell what. But what have women to do in society? I may be asked, but to loiter with easy grace, surely you would not condemn them all to suckle fools and chronicle small beer. No, women might certainly study the art of healing, and be physicians as well as nurses. And midwifery decency seems to allot to them, though I am afraid the word midwife in our dictionaries will soon give place to the accoucheur, and one proof of the former delicacy of the sex be effaced from the language. They might also study politics, and settle their benevolence on the broadest basis, for the reading of history will scarcely be more useful than the perusal of romances, if read as mere biography, if the character of the times, the political improvements, arts, etc., be not observed. In short, if it be not considered as the history of man, and not of particular men, who filled a niche in the temple of fame, and dropped into the black rolling stream of time that silently sweeps all before it, into the shapeless void called eternity. For shape can it be called, that shape hath none. Business of various kinds they might likewise pursue, if they were educated in a more orderly manner, which might save many from common and legal prostitution. Women would not then marry for a support, as men accept of places under government, and to neglect the implied duties, nor would it an attempt to earn their own subsistence, a most laudable one, sink them almost to the level of those poor abandoned creatures who live by prostitution. For are not milliners and mantua-makers reckoned the next class? The few employments open to women, so far from being liberal, are menial, and when a superior education enables them to take charge of the education of children as governesses, they are not treated like the tutors of sons, though even clerical tutors are not always treated in a manner calculated to render them respectable in the eyes of their pupils, to say nothing of the private comfort of the individual. But as women educated like gentlewomen are never designed for the humiliating situation which necessity sometimes forces them to fill, these situations are considered in the light of a degradation, and they know little of the human heart who need to be told that nothing so painfully sharpens the sensibility as such a fall in life. Some of these women might be restrained from marrying by a proper spirit or delicacy, and others may not have had it in their power to escape in this pitiful way from servitude. 
Is not that government, then, very defective, and very unmindful of the happiness of one half of its members, that does not provide for honest, independent women by encouraging them to fill respectable stations? But in order to render their private virtue a public benefit, they must have a civil existence in the state, married or single, else we shall continually see some worthy women whose sensibility has been rendered painfully acute by undeserved contempt droop like the lily broken down by a plowshare. It is a melancholy truth, yet such is the blessed effects of civilization. The most respectable women are the most oppressed, and, unless they have understandings far superior to the common run of understandings, taking in both sexes, they must, from being treated like contemptible beings, become contemptible. How many women thus waste life away, the prey of discontent, who might have practiced as physicians, regulated a farm, managed a shop, and stood erect, supported by their own industry, instead of hanging their heads surcharged with the dew of sensibility that consumes the beauty to which it at first gave luster. Nay, I doubt whether pity and love are so near akin as poets feign, for I have seldom seen much compassion excited by the helplessness of females, unless they were fair. Then, perhaps, pity was the soft handmaid of love, or the harbinger of lust. How much more respectable is the woman who earns her own bread by fulfilling any duty than the most accomplished beauty? Beauty, did I say? So sensible am I of the beauty of moral loveliness or the harmonious propriety that attunes the passions of a well-regulated mind that I blush at making the comparison. Yet I sigh to think how few women aim at attaining this respectability by withdrawing from the giddy whirl of pleasure or the indolent calm that stupefies the good sort of women it sucks in proud of their weakness, however. They must always be protected, guarded from care, and from all the rough toils that dignify the mind. If this be the fiat of fate, if they will make themselves insignificant and contemptible, sweetly to waste life away, let them not expect to be valued when their beauty fades. For it is the fate of the fairest flowers to be admired and pulled to pieces by the careless hand that plucked them. In how many ways do I wish, from the purest benevolence, to impress this truth on my sex, yet I fear that they will not listen to a truth that dear-bought experience has brought home to many an agitated bosom, nor willingly resign the privileges of rank and sex for the privileges of humanity, to which those have no claim who do not discharge its duties. Those writers are particularly useful, in my opinion, who make man feel for man, independent of the station he fills, or the drapery of factitious sentiments. I then would fain convince reasonable men of the importance of some of my remarks, and prevail on them to weigh dispassionately the whole tenor of my observations. I appeal to their understandings, and, as a fellow creature, claim, in the name of my sex, some interest in their hearts. I entreat them to assist to emancipate their companion, to make her a helpmeet for them. Would men but generously snap our chains, and be content with rational fellowship instead of slavish obedience? They would find us more observant daughters, more affectionate sisters, more faithful wives, more reasonable mothers, in a word, better citizens. We should then love them with true affection, because we should learn to respect ourselves, and the peace of mind of a worthy man would not be interrupted by the idle vanity of his wife, nor his babe sent to nestle in a strange bosom, having never found a home in their mothers. End of chapter 9 Recorded by Jen in Madison, Wisconsin, July 8, 2006. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Vindication of the Rights of Women by Mary Wollstonecraft Chapter 10. Parental Affection Parental affection is, perhaps, the blindest modification of perverse self-love, for we have not, like the French, two terms, l'amour propre, l'amour de soi-même, to distinguish the pursuit of a natural and reasonable desire from the ignorant calculations of weakness. Parents often love their children in the most brutal manner, 
and sacrifice every relative duty to promote their advancement in the world. To promote, such is the perversity of unprincipled prejudices, the future welfare of the very beings whose present existence they embitter by the most despotic stretch of power. Power, in fact, is ever true to its vital principle, for in every shape it would reign without control or inquiry. Its throne is built across a dark abyss, which no eye must dare to explore, lest the baseless fabric should totter under investigation. Obedience, unconditional obedience, is the catchword of tyrants of every description, and to render assurance doubly sure, one kind of despotism supports another. Tyrants would have cause to tremble if reason were to become the rule of duty in any of the relations of life, for the light might spread till perfect day appeared. And when it did appear, how would men smile at the sight of the bugbears at which they started during the night of ignorance, or the twilight of timid inquiry? Parental affection, indeed, in many minds, is but a pretext to tyrannize where it can be done with impunity, for only good and wise men are content with a respect that will bear discussion. Convinced that they have a right to what they insist on, they do not fear reason or dread the sifting of subjects that recur to natural justice, because they firmly believe that the more enlightened the human mind becomes, the deeper root will just and simple principles take. They do not rest in expedience, or grant that what is metaphysically true can be practically false. But disdaining the shifts of the moment, they calmly wait till time, sanctioning innovation, silences the hiss of selfishness or envy. If the power of reflecting on the past, and darting the keen eye of contemplation into futurity, be the grand privilege of man, it must be granted that some people enjoy this prerogative in a very limited degree. Everything now appears to them wrong, and not able to distinguish the possible from the monstrous. They fear where no fear should find a place, running from the light of reason as if it were a firebrand. Yet the limits of the possible have never been defined to stop the sturdy innovator's hand. Woman, however, a slave in every situation to prejudice, seldom exerts enlightened maternal affection, for she either neglects her children or spoils them by improper indulgence. Besides, the affection of some women for their children is, as I have before termed it, frequently very brutish, for it eradicates every spark of humanity. Justice, truth, everything is sacrificed by these Rebecca's and for the sake of their own children they violate the most sacred duties, forgetting the common relationship that binds the whole family on earth together. Yet, reason seems to say, that they who suffer one duty, or affection to swallow up the rest, have not sufficient heart or mind to fulfil that one conscientiously. It then loses the venerable aspect of a duty, and assumes the fantastic form of a whim. As the care of children in their infancy is one of the grand duties annexed to the female character by nature, this duty would afford many forcible arguments for strengthening the female understanding, if it were properly considered. The formation of the mind must be begun very early, and the temper in particular requires the most judicious attention, an attention which women cannot pay who only love their children because they are their children, and seek no further for the foundation of their duty than in the feelings of the moment. It is this want of reason in their affections which makes women so often run into extremes, and either be the most fond or most careless and unnatural mothers. To be a good mother, a woman must have sense, and that independence of mind which few women possess who are taught to depend entirely on their husbands. Meek wives are, in general, foolish mothers, wanting their children to love them best, and take their part, in secret, against the father, 
who was held up as the scarecrow. If they are to be punished, though they have offended the mother, the father must inflict the punishment. He must be the judge in all disputes. But I shall more fully discuss this subject when I treat of private education. I only mean to insist that unless the understanding of woman be enlarged, and her character rendered more firm by being allowed to govern her own conduct, she will never have sufficient sense or command of temper to manage her children properly. Her parental affection, indeed, scarcely deserves the name when it does not lead her to suckle her children because the discharge of this duty is equally calculated to inspire maternal and filial affection. And it is the indispensable duty of men and women to fulfil the duties which give birth to affections that are the surest preservations against vice. Natural affection, as it is termed, I believe to be a very weak tie. Affections must grow out of the habitual exercise of a mutual sympathy. And what sympathy does a mother exercise who sends her babe to a nurse, and only takes it from a nurse to send it to a school? In the exercise of their natural feelings, Providence has furnished women with a natural substitute for love, when the lover becomes only a friend, and mutual confidence takes place of overstrained admiration. A child then gently twists the relaxing cord, and a mutual care produces a new mutual sympathy. But a child, though a pledge of affection, will not enliven it, if both father and mother are content to transfer the charge to hirelings, for they who do their duty by proxy should not murmur if they miss the reward of duty. Parental affection produces filial duty. End of chapter 10 Read by Gesine in Valletta, April 2006
a reasonable man must steel himself against. For the absurd duty, too often inculcated, of obeying a parent only on account of his being a parent, shackles the mind and prepares it for a slavish submission to any power but reason. I distinguish between the natural and accidental duty due to parents. The parent who sedulously endeavors to form the heart and enlarge the understanding of his child has given that dignity to the discharge of a duty common to the whole animal world that only reason can give. This is the parental affection of humanity and leaves instinctive natural affection far behind. Such a parent acquires all the rights of the most sacred friendship and his advice, even when his child is advanced in life, demands serious consideration. With respect to marriage, though after one in twenty a parent seems to have no right to withhold his consent on any account, yet twenty years of solicitude call for a return, and the son ought, at least, to promise not to marry for two or three years, should the object of his choice not entirely meet with the approbation of his first friend. But respect for parents is, generally speaking, a much more debasing principle. It is only a selfish respect for property. The father who is blindly obeyed is obeyed from sheer weakness or from motives that degrade the human character. A great proportion of the misery that wanders in hideous forms around the world is allowed to rise from the negligence of parents. And still these are the people who are most tenacious of what they term a natural right. Though it be subversive of the birthright of man, the right of acting according to the direction of his own reason. I have already very frequently had occasion to observe that vicious or indolent people are always eager to profit by enforcing arbitrary privileges and generally in the same proportion as they neglect the discharge of the duties which alone render the privileges reasonable. This is at the bottom a dictate of common sense, or the instinct of self-defense, peculiar to ignorant weakness, resembling that instinct which makes a fish muddy the water it swims in to elude its enemy, instead of boldly facing it in the clear stream. From the clear stream of argument, indeed, the supporters of prescription of every denomination fly, and taking refuge in the darkness, which in the language of sublime poetry has been supposed to surround the throne of omnipotence, they dare to demand that implicit respect which is only due to his unsearchable ways. But let me not be thought presumptuous. The darkness which hides our God from us only respect speculative truths. It never obscures moral ones. They shine clearly, for God is light and never, by the constitution of our nature, requires the discharge of a duty, the reasonableness of which does not beam on us when we open our eyes. The indolent parent of high rank may, it is true, extort a show of respect from his child, and females on the continent are particularly subject to the views of their families, who never think of consulting their inclination or providing for the comfort of the poor victims of their pride. The consequence is notorious. These dutiful daughters become adulteresses and neglect the education of their children, from whom they, in their turn, exact the same kind of obedience. Females, it is true, in all countries, are too much under the dominion of their parents, and few parents think of addressing their children in the following manner, though it is in this reasonable way that heaven seems to command the whole human race. It is your interest to obey me till you can judge for yourself, and the Almighty Father of all has implanted an affection in me to serve as a guard to you whilst your reasoning is unfolding. But when your mind arrives at maturity, you must only obey me, or rather, respect my opinions, so far as they coincide with the light that is breaking in on your own mind. A slavish bondage to parents cramps every faculty of the mind, and Mr. Locke very judiciously observes, 
that if the mind be curbed and humbled too much in children, if their spirits be abased and broken much by too strict a hand over them, they lose all their vigor and industry. This strict hand may, in some degree, account for the weakness of women, for girls, from various causes, are more kept down by their parents, in every sense of the word, than boys. The duty expected from them is, like all the duties arbitrarily imposed on women, more from a sense of propriety, more out of respect for decorum than reason. And thus taught slavishly to submit to their parents, they are prepared for the slavery of marriage. I may be told that a number of women are not slaves in the marriage state. True, but they then become tyrants, for it is not rational freedom, but a lawless kind of power, resembling the authority exercised by the favorites of absolute monarchs, which they obtain by debasing means. I do not, likewise, dream of insinuating that either boys or girls are always slaves. I only insist that when they are obliged to submit to authority blindly, their faculties are weakened, and their tempers rendered imperious or abject. I also lament that parents, indolently availing themselves of a supposed privilege, damp the first faint glimmering of reason, rendering at the same time the duty which they are so anxious to enforce an empty name because they will not let it rest on the only basis which a duty can rest securely, or, unless it be founded on knowledge, it cannot gain sufficient strength to resist the squalls of passion or the silent sapping of self-love. But it is not the parents who have given the surest proof of their affection for their children, or, to speak more properly, who by fulfilling their duty, have allowed a natural parental affection to take root in their hearts, the child of exercised sympathy and reason, and not the overweening offspring of selfish pride, who most vehemently insist on their children submitting to their will, merely because it is their will. On the contrary, the parent who sets a good example patiently lets that example work, and it seldom fails to produce its natural effect filial respect. Children cannot be taught too early to submit to reason. The true definition of that necessity, which Rousseau insisted on without defining it, for to submit to reason is to submit to the nature of things, and to that God who formed them so, to promote our real interests. Why should the minds of children be warped, as they just begin to expand? only to favor the indolence of parents, who insist on a privilege without being willing to pay the price fixed by nature. I have before had occasion to observe that a right always includes a duty, and I think it may likewise fairly be inferred that they forfeit the right who do not fulfill the duty. It is easier, I grant, to command than reason, but it does not follow from hence that children cannot comprehend the reason why they are meant to do certain things habitually. For, from a steady adherence to a few simple principles of conduct, flows that salutary power which a judicious parent gradually gains over a child's mind. And this power becomes strong indeed, if tempered by an even display of affection brought home to the child's heart. For I believe, as a general rule, it must be allowed that the affection which we inspire always resembles that what we cultivate, so that natural affections, which have been supposed almost distinct from reason, may be found more nearly connected with judgment than is commonly allowed. Nay, as another proof of the necessity of cultivating the female understanding, it is but just to observe that the affections seem to have a kind of animal capriciousness when they merely reside in the heart. It is the irregular exercise of parental authority that first injures the mind. And to these irregularities, girls are more subject than boys. The will of those who never allow their will to be disputed, unless they happen to be in a good humor when they relax proportionally, is almost always unreasonable. To elude this arbitrary authority, 
girls very early learn the lessons which they afterwards practice on their husbands. For I have frequently seen a little sharp-faced miss rule a whole family, excepting that now and then Mama's anger will burst out of some accidental cloud. Either her hair was ill-dressed, or she had lost more money at cards the night before than she was willing to own to her husband, or some such moral cause of anger. Footnote. I myself heard a little girl once say to a servant, My mama has been scolding me finely this morning because her hair was not dressed to please her. Though this remark was pert, it was just. And what respect could a girl acquire for such a parent without doing violence to reason? After observing sailies of this kind, I have been led into a melancholy train of reflection respecting females, concluding that when their first affection must lead them astray, or make their duties clash till they rest on mere whims and customs, little can be expected from them as they advance in life. How indeed can an instructor remedy this evil? For to teach them virtue on any solid principle, is to teach them to despise their parents. Children cannot, ought not be taught to make allowances for the faults of their parents, because every such allowance weakens the force of reason in their minds and makes them still more indulgent to their own. It is one of the most sublime virtues of maturity that leads us to be severe with respect to ourselves and forbearing to others. But children should only be taught the simple virtues for if they begin too early to make allowance for human passions and manners, they wear off the fine edge of the criterion by which they should regulate their own, and become unjust in the same proportion as they grow indulgent. The affections of children and weak people are always selfish. They love others because others love them, and not on account of their virtues. Yet till esteem and love are blended together in the first affection, and reason made the foundation of the first duty, morality will stumble at the threshold. But till society is very differently constituted, parents, I fear, will still insist on being obeyed, because they will be obeyed, and constantly endeavor to settle that power on a divine right which will not bear the investigation of reason. End of chapter 11. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. A Vindication of the Rights of Woman by Mary Wollstonecraft. Chapter 12. On national education. The good effects resulting from attention to private education will ever be very confined, and the parent who really puts his own hand to the plough will always in some degree be disappointed till education becomes a grand national concern. A man cannot retire into a desert with his child, and if he did, he could not bring himself back to childhood and become the proper friend and playfellow of an infant or youth. And when children are confined to the society of men and women, they very soon acquire that kind of premature manhood which stops the growth of every vigorous power of mind or body. In order to open their faculties, they should be excited to think for themselves, and this can only be done by mixing a number of children together and making them jointly pursue the same objects. A child very soon contracts a benumbing indolence of mind, which he has seldom sufficient vigor to shake off, when he only asks a question instead of seeking for information, and then relies implicitly on the answer he receives. With his equals in age, this could never be the case, and the subjects of inquiry though they might be influenced, would not be entirely under the direction of men, who frequently damp, if not destroy, abilities by bringing them forward too hastily, and too hastily they will infallibly be brought forward 
if the child could be confined to the society of a man, however sagacious that man may be. Besides, in youth, the seeds of every affection should be sown, and the respectful regard, which is felt for a parent, is very different from these social affections that are to constitute the happiness of life as it advances. Of these, equality is the basis, and an intercourse of sentiments unclogged by that observant seriousness which prevents disputation, though it may not enforce submission. Let a child have ever such an affection for his parent, he will always languish to play and chat with children, and the very respect he entertains for filial esteem always has a dash of fear mixed with it, will, if it do not teach him cunning, at least prevent him from pouring out the little secrets which first open the heart to friendship and confidence, gradually leading to more expansive benevolence. Added to this, he will never acquire that frank ingenuousness of behavior which young people can only attain by being frequently in society, where they dare to speak what they think, either afraid of being reproved for their presumption nor laughed at for their folly. Forcibly impressed by the reflections which the sight of schools, as they are at present conducted, naturally suggested, I have formerly delivered my opinion rather warmly in favor of a private education, but further experience has led me to view the subject in a different light. I still, however, think schools, as they are now regulated, the hotbeds of vice and folly, and the knowledge of human nature, supposed to be attained there, merely cunning selfishness. At school, boys become gluttons and slovens, and instead of cultivating domestic affections, very early rush into the libertinism which destroys the constitution before it is formed, hardening the heart as it weakens the understanding. I should, in fact, be averse to boarding schools, if it were for no other reason than the unsettled state of mind which the expectation of the vacations produce. On these the children's thoughts are fixed with eager, anticipating hopes for, at least to speak with moderation, half of the time, and when they arrive they are spent in total dissipation and beastly indulgence. But on the contrary, when they are brought up at home, though they may pursue a plan of study in a more orderly manner than can be adopted, when near a fourth part of the year is actually spent in idleness, and as much more in regret and anticipation, yet they there acquire too high an opinion of their own importance from being allowed to tyrannize over servants and from the anxiety expressed by most mothers on the score of manners, who, eager to teach the accomplishments of a gentleman, stifle in their birth the virtues of a man. Thus brought into company when they ought to be seriously employed, and treated like men when they are still boys, they become vain and effeminate. The only way to avoid two extremes equally injurious to morality would be to contrive some way of combining a public and private education. Thus, to make men citizens, two natural steps might be taken which seem directly to lead to the desired point. For the domestic affections, that first open the heart to the various modifications of humanity would be cultivated, whilst the children were nevertheless allowed to spend great part of their time on terms of equality with other children. I still recollect with affection the country day school, where a boy trudged in the morning, wet or dry, carrying his books at his dinner, if it were at a considerable distance. A servant did not then lead master by the hand, for, when he had once put on coat and breeches, he was allowed to shift for himself, and return alone in the evening to recount the feats of the day close at the parental knee. His father's house was his home, and was ever after fondly remembered. Nay, I appeal to some superior men who were educated in this manner, whether the recollection of some shady lane where they conned their lesson or of some style where they sat making a kite or mending a bat, 
has not endeared their country to them. But what boy ever recollected with pleasure the years he spent in close confinement at an academy near London, unless indeed he should by chance remember the poor scarecrow of an usher whom he tormented, or the tart man from whom he caught a cake, to devour it with the caddish appetite of selfishness. At boarding schools of every description, the relaxation of the junior boys is mischief, and of the senior, vice. Besides, in great schools, what can be more prejudicial to the moral character than the system of tyranny and abject slavery which is established amongst the boys, to say nothing of the slavery to forms, which makes religion worse than a farce? For what good can be expected from the youth who receives the sacrament of the Lord's Supper to avoid forfeiting half a guinea, which he probably afterwards spends in some sensual manner? Half the employment of the youths is to elude the necessity of attending public worship, and well they may, for such a constant repetition of the same thing must be a very irksome restraint on their natural vivacity, as these ceremonies have the most fatal effect on their morals, and as a ritual performed by the lips, when the heart and mind are far away, is not now stored up by our church as a bank to draw on for the fees of the poor souls in purgatory, why should they not be abolished? But the fear of innovation in this country extends to everything. This is only a covert fear, the apprehensive timidity of indolent slugs, who guard, by sliming it over, the snug place, which they consider in the light of an hereditary estate and eat, drink, and enjoy themselves instead of fulfilling the duties, excepting a few empty forms for which it was endowed. These are the people who most strenuously insist on the will of the founder being observed, crying out against all reformation as if it were a violation of justice. I am now alluding particularly to the relics of popery retained in our colleges where the Protestant members appear to be such sticklers for the established church. But their zeal never makes them lose sight of the spoil of ignorance, which rapacious priests of superstitious memory have scraped together. No, wise in their generation, they venerate the prescriptive right of possession as a stronghold, and still let the sluggish bell tingle to prayers, as during the days when the elevation of the host was supposed to atone for the sins of the people, lest one reformation should lead to another, and the spirit kill the letter. These Romish customs have the most baneful effect on the morals of our clergy, for the idle vermin who two or three times a day perform, in the most slovenly manner, a service which they think useless, but call their duty, soon lose a sense of duty. At college, forced to attend or evade public worship, they acquire an habitual contempt for the very service, the performance of which is to enable them to live in idleness. It is mumbled over as an affair of business, as a stupid boy repeats his task, and frequently the college can't, escapes from the preacher the moment after he has left the pulpit and even whilst he is eating the dinner which he earned in such a dishonest manner. Nothing, indeed, could be more irreverent than the cathedral service as it is now performed in this country. Neither does it contain a set of weaker men than those who are the slaves of this childish routine. A disgusting skeleton of the former state is still exhibited but all the solemnity that interested the imagination, if it did not purify the heart, is stripped off. The performance of high mass on the continent must impress every mind, where a spark of fancy glows, with that awful melancholy, that sublime tenderness so near akin to devotion. I do not say that these devotional feelings are of more use in a moral sense than any other emotion of taste, but I contend that the theatrical pomp which gratifies our senses 
is to be preferred to the cold parade that insults the understanding without reaching the heart. Amongst remarks on national education, such observations cannot be misplaced, especially as the supporters of these establishments, degenerated into puerilities, affect to be the champions of religion. Religion, pure source of comfort in this veil of tears, how has thy clear stream been muddled by the dabblers who have presumptuously endeavored to confine in one narrow channel the living waters that ever flow toward God, the sublime ocean of existence? What would be life without that peace which the love of God, when built on humanity, alone can impart? Every earthly affection turns back at intervals to prey upon the heart that feeds it, and the purest effusions of benevolence, often rudely damped by men, must mount as a free will offering to him who gave them birth, whose bright image they faintly reflect. In public schools, however, religion, confounded with irksome ceremonies and unreasonable restraints, assumes the most ungracious aspect not the sober, austere one that commands respect while it inspires fear, but a ludicrous cast that serves to point a pun. For, in fact, most of the good stories and smart things which enliven the spirits that have been concentrated at whist are manufactured out of the incidents to which the very men labor to give a droll turn, who countenance the abuse to live on the spoil. There is not, perhaps, in the kingdom a more dogmatical or luxurious set of men than the pedantic tyrants who reside in colleges and preside at public schools. The vacations are equally injurious to the morals of the masters and pupils, and the intercourse which the former keep up with the nobility introduces the same vanity and extravagance into their families, which banish domestic duties and comforts from the lordly mansion, whose state is awkwardly aped on a smaller scale. The boys who live at a great expense, with the masters and assistants, are never domesticated, though placed there for that purpose, for, after a silent dinner, they swallow a hasty glass of wine and retire to plan some mischievous trick, or to ridicule the person or manners of the very people they have just been cringing to, and whom they ought to consider as the representatives of their parents. Can it then be a matter of surprise that boys become selfish and vicious who are thus shut out from social converse, or that a mitre often graces the brow of one of these diligent pastors? The desire of living in the same style as the rank just above them infects each individual and every class of people, and meanness is the concomitant of this ignoble ambition. But those professions are most debasing whose latter is patronage. Yet out of one of these professions, the tutors of youth are in general chosen. But can they be expected to inspire independent sentiments whose conduct must be regulated by the cautious prudence that is ever on the watch for preferment. So far, however, from thinking of the morals of boys, I have heard several masters of schools argue that they only undertook to teach Latin and Greek, and that they had fulfilled their duty by sending some good scholars to college. A few good scholars, I grant, may have been formed by emulation and discipline, but to bring forward these clever boys, the health and morals of a number have been sacrificed. The sons of our gentry and wealthy commoners are mostly educated at these seminaries, and will any one pretend to assert that the majority, making every allowance, come under the description of tolerable scholars? It is not for the benefit of society that a few brilliant men should be brought forward at the expense of the multitude. It is true that great men seem to start up, as great revolutions occur, at proper intervals to restore order and to blow aside the clouds that thicken over the face of truth. 
but let more reason and virtue prevail in society, and these strong winds would not be necessary. Public education of every denomination should be directed to form citizens, but if you wish to make good citizens, you must first exercise the affections of a son and a brother. This is the only way to expand the heart, for public affections as well as public virtues must ever grow out of the private character, or they are merely meteors that shoot athwart a dark sky and disappear as they are gazed at and admired. Few, I believe, have had much affection for mankind who did not first love their parents, their brothers, sisters, and even the domestic brutes whom they first played with. The exercise of youthful sympathies forms the moral temperature, and it is the recollection of these first affections and pursuits that gives life to those that are afterwards more under the direction of reason. In youth, the fondest friendships are formed, the genial juices mounting at the same time, kindly mix, or rather the heart, tempered for the reception of friendship, is accustomed to seek for pleasure in something more noble than the churlish gratification of appetite. In order, then, to inspire a love of home and domestic pleasures, children ought to be educated at home, for riotous holidays only make them fond of home for their own sakes. Yet the vacations, which do not foster domestic affections, continually disturb the course of study, and render any plan of improvement abortive, which includes temperance. Still, were they abolished, children would be entirely separated from their parents, and I question whether they would become better citizens by sacrificing the preparatory affections, by destroying the force of relationships that render the marriage state as necessary as respectable. But if a private education produce self-importance, or insulates a man in his family, the evil is only shifted, not remedied. This train of reasoning brings me back to a subject on which I mean to dwell, the necessity of establishing proper day schools. These should be national establishments, for whilst schoolmasters are dependent on the caprice of parents, little exertion can be expected from them, more than is necessary to please ignorant people. Indeed, the necessity of a master's giving the parents some sample of the boy's abilities which during the vacation is shown to every visitor, is productive of more mischief than would at first be supposed, for they are seldom done entirely, to speak with moderation, by the child itself. Thus the master countenances falsehoods, or winds the poor machine up to some extraordinary exertion that injures the wheels and stops the progress of gradual improvement. The memory is loaded with unintelligible words to make a show of, without the understandings acquiring any distinct ideas. But only that education deserves emphatically to be termed cultivation of mind, which teaches young people how to begin to think. The imagination should not be allowed to debauch the understanding before it gains strength, or vanity will become the forerunner of vice. For every way of exhibiting the achievements of a child is injurious to its moral character. How much time is lost in teaching them to recite what they do not understand, whilst seated on benches all in their best array, the mamas listen with astonishment to the parrot-like prattle, uttered in solemn cadences, with all the pomp of ignorance and folly. Such exhibitions only serve to strike the spreading fibers of vanity through the whole mind, for they neither teach children to speak fluently nor behave gracefully. So far from it, that these frivolous pursuits might comprehensively be termed the study of affectation, for we now rarely see a simple, bashful boy though few people of taste were ever disgusted by that awkward sheepishness so natural to the age, which schools and an early introduction into society 
have changed into impudence and apish grimace. Yet how can these things be remedied whilst schoolmasters depend entirely on parents for a subsistence, and when so many rival schools hang out their lures to catch the attention of vain fathers and mothers, whose parental affection only leads them to wish that their children should outshine those of their neighbors? Without great good luck, a sensible, conscientious man would starve before he could raise a school if he disdained to bubble weak parents by practicing the secret tricks of the craft. In the best regulated schools, however, where swarms are not crammed together, many bad habits must be acquired. But at common schools, the body, heart, and understanding are equally stunted, for parents are often only in quest of the cheapest school, and the master could not live if he did not take a much greater number than he could manage himself. Nor will this scanty pittance allowed for each child permit him to hire ushers sufficient to assist in the discharge of the mechanical part of the business. Besides, Whatever appearance the house and garden may make, the children do not enjoy the comforts of either, for they are continually reminded by irksome restrictions that they are not at home, and the state rooms, gardens, etc., must be kept in order for the recreation of the parents, who, of a Sunday, visit the school and are impressed by the very parade that renders the situation of their children uncomfortable. With what disgust have I heard sensible women, for girls are more restrained and cowed than boys, speak of the wearisome confinement which they endured at school. Not allowed, perhaps, to step out of one broad walk in a superb garden, and obliged to pace with steady deportment, stupidly backwards and forwards, holding up their heads and turning out their toes, with shoulders braced back, instead of bounding as nature directs to complete her own design in the various attitudes so conducive to health. The pure animal spirits, which make both mind and body shoot out and unfold the tender blossoms of hope, are turned sour and vented in vain wishes or pert repinings, that contract the faculties and spoil the temper, else they mount to the brain, and sharpening the understanding before it gains proportionable strength, produce that pitiful cunning which disgracefully characterizes the female mind, and, I fear, will ever characterize it whilst women remain the slaves of power. The little respect which the male world pay to chastity is, I am persuaded, the grand source of many of the physical and moral evils that torment mankind, as well as of the vices and follies that degrade and destroy women. Yet, at school, boys infallibly lose that decent bashfulness which might have ripened into modesty at home. I have already animadverted on the bad habits which females acquire when they are shut up together, and I think that the observation may fairly be extended to the other sex, till the natural inference is drawn, which I have had in view throughout, that to improve both sexes, they ought, not only in private families, but in public schools, to be educated together. If marriage be the cement of society, mankind should all be educated after the same model, or the intercourse of the sexes will never deserve the name of fellowship, nor will women ever fulfill the peculiar duties of their sex till they become enlightened citizens, till they become free by being enabled to earn their own subsistence independent of men. In the same manner, I mean, to prevent misconstruction, as one man is independent of another. Nay, marriage will never be held sacred till women, by being brought up with men, 
are prepared to be their companions rather than their mistresses, for the mean doublings of cunning will ever render them contemptible, whilst oppression renders them timid. So convinced am I of this truth that I will venture to predict that virtue will never prevail in society till the virtues of both sexes are founded on reason, and till the affection common to both are allowed to gain their due strength by the discharge of mutual duties. Were boys and girls permitted to pursue the same studies together, those graceful decencies might early be inculcated, which produce modesty without those sexual distinctions that taint the mind. Lessons of politeness and that formulary of decorum, which treads on the heels of falsehood, would be rendered useless by habitual propriety of behavior. Not, indeed, put on for visitors like the courtly robe of politeness, but the sober effect of cleanliness of mind. Would not this simple elegance of sincerity be a chaste homage paid to domestic affections, far surpassing the meretricious compliments that shine with false luster in the heartless intercourse of fashionable life? But till more understanding preponderate in society, there will ever be a want of heart and taste, and the harlot's rouge will supply the place of that celestial suffusion which only virtuous affections can give to the face. Gallantry, and what is called love, may subsist without simplicity of character, but the main pillars of friendship are respect and confidence. Esteem is never founded on it cannot tell what. A taste for the fine arts requires great cultivation, but not more than a taste for the virtuous affections, and both suppose that enlargement of mind which opens so many sources of mental pleasure. Why do people hurry to noisy scenes in crowded circles? I should answer because they want activity of mind, because they have not cherished the virtues of the heart. They only, therefore, see and feel in the gross and continually pine after variety, finding everything that is simple insipid. This argument may be carried further than philosophers are aware of, for if nature destined woman, in particular, for the discharge of domestic duties, she made her susceptible of the attached affections in a great degree. Now, women are notoriously fond of pleasure, and naturally must be so, according to my definition, because they cannot enter into the minutia of domestic taste. Lacking judgment, the foundation of all taste. For the understanding, in spite of sensual cavillers, reserves to itself the privilege of conveying pure joy to the heart. With what a languid yawn have I seen an admirable poem thrown down, that a man of true taste returns to again and again with rapture, and whilst melody has almost superseded respiration, a lady has asked me where I bought my gown. I have seen also, and I glanced coldly over a most exquisite picture, rest sparkling with pleasure on a caricature rudely sketched, and whilst some terrific feature in nature has spread a sublime stillness through my body, I have been desired to observe the pretty tricks of a lapdog that my perverse fate forced me to travel with. Is it surprising that such a tasteless being should rather caress this dog than her children, or that she should prefer the rant of flattery to the simple accents of sincerity? To illustrate this remark, I must be allowed to observe that men of the first genius and most cultivated minds have appeared to have the highest relish for the simple beauties of nature, and they must have forcibly felt what they have so well described, the charm which natural affections and unsophisticated feelings spread round the human character. It is this power of looking into the heart and responsively vibrating with each emotion 
that enables the poet to personify each passion and the painter to sketch with a pencil a fire. True taste is ever the work of the understanding employed in observing natural effects. And until women have more understanding, it is vain to expect them to possess domestic taste. Their lively senses will ever be at work to harden their hearts, and the emotions struck out of them will continue to be vivid and transitory, unless a proper education stores their minds with knowledge. It is the want of domestic taste, and not the acquirement of knowledge, that takes women out of their families and tears the smiling babe from the breast that ought to afford it nourishment. Women have been allowed to remain in ignorance and slavish dependence many, very many years, and still we hear of nothing but their fondness of pleasure and sway, their preference of rakes and soldiers, their childish attachment to toys and the vanity that makes them value accomplishments more than virtues. History brings forward a fearful catalogue of the crimes which their cunning has produced. When the weak slaves have had sufficient address to overreach their masters, in France and in how many other countries have men been the luxurious despots and women the crafty ministers? Does this prove that ignorance and dependence domesticate them? Is not their folly the byword of the libertines who relax in their society? And do not men of sense continually lament that an immoderate fondness for dress and dissipation carries the mother of a family forever from home? Their hearts have not been debauched by knowledge, nor their minds led astray by scientific pursuits. Yet they do not fulfill the peculiar duties which as women they are called upon by nature to fulfill. On the contrary, the state of warfare which subsists between the sexes makes them employ those wiles that frustrate the more open designs of force. When, therefore, I call women slaves, I mean in a political and civil sense, for indirectly they obtain too much power and are debased by their exertions to obtain illicit sway. Let an enlightened nation, then, try what effect reason would have to bring them back to nature and their duty, and allowing them to share the advantages of education and government with man, see whether they will become better as they grow wiser and become free. They cannot be injured by the experiment, for it is not in the power of man to render them more insignificant than they are at present. To render this practicable, day schools for particular ages should be established by government, in which boys and girls might be educated together. The school for the younger children from five to nine years of age ought to be absolutely free and open to all classes. Footnote. Treating this part of the subject, I have borrowed some hints from a very sensible pamphlet written by the late Bishop of Autun on public education. A sufficient number of masters should also be employed by a select committee in each parish to whom any complaint of negligence, etc., might be made if signed by six of the children's parents. Ushers would then be unnecessary, for I believe experience will ever prove that this kind of subordinate authority is particularly injurious to the morals of youth. What, indeed, can tend to deprave the character more than outward submission and inward contempt. Yet, how can boys be expected to treat an usher with respect when the master seems to consider him in the light of a servant, and almost to countenance the ridicule which becomes the chief amusement of the boys during the play hours? But nothing of this kind could occur in an elementary day school, where boys and girls, the rich and poor, should meet together and to prevent any of the distinctions of vanity, they should be dressed alike, and all obliged to submit to the same discipline, or leave the school. The schoolroom ought to be surrounded by a large piece of ground, in which the children might usefully exercise. For at this age, 
they should not be confined to any sedentary employment for more than an hour at a time. But these relaxations might all be rendered a part of elementary education, for many things improve and amuse the senses when introduced as a kind of show, to the principles of which, dryly laid down, children would turn a deaf ear. For instance, botany, mechanics, and astronomy. Reading, writing, and arithmetic, natural history, and some simple experiments in natural philosophy might fill up the day. But these pursuits should never encroach on gymnastic plays in the open air. The elements of religion, history, the history of man and politics, might also be taught by conversations in the Socratic form. After the age of nine, girls and boys intended for domestic employments or mechanical trades ought to be removed to other schools and receive instruction in some measure appropriated to the destination of each individual, the two sexes being still together in the morning, but in the afternoon the girls should attend a school where plain work, mantua-making, millinery, etc., would be their employment. The young people of superior abilities or fortune might now be taught in another school the dead and living languages, the elements of science, and continue the study of history and politics on a more extensive scale, which would not exclude polite literature. Girls and boys still together, I hear some readers ask? Yes, and I should not fear any other consequence than that some early attachment might take place, which whilst it had the best effect on the moral character of the young people, might not perfectly agree with the views of the parents. For it will be a long time, I fear, before the world is so enlightened that parents, only anxious to render their children virtuous, will let them choose companions for life themselves. Besides, this would be a sure way to promote early marriages, and from early marriages, the most salutary physical and moral effects naturally flow. What a different character does a married citizen assume from the selfish coxcomb who lives but for himself and who is often afraid to marry, lest he should not be able to live in a certain style. Great emergencies accepted, which would rarely occur in a society of which equality was the basis, a man could only be prepared to discharge the duties of public life by the habitual practice of those inferior ones which form the man. In this plan of education, the constitution of boys would not be ruined by the early debaucheries which now make men so selfish, nor girls rendered weak and vain by indolence and frivolous pursuits. But I presuppose that such a degree of equality should be established between the sexes as would shut out gallantry and coquetry, yet allow friendship and love to temper the heart for the discharge of higher duties. These would be schools of morality, and the happiness of man allowed to flow from the pure springs of duty and affection. What advances might not the human mind make? Society can only be happy and free in proportion as it is virtuous. But the present distinctions established in society corrode all private and blast all public virtue. I have already inveighed against the custom of confining girls to their needle and shutting them out from all political and civil employments, for by thus narrowing their minds they are rendered unfit to fulfill the peculiar duties which nature has assigned them. Only employed about the little incidents of the day, they necessarily grow up cunning. My very soul has often sickened at observing the sly tricks practiced by women to gain some foolish thing on which their silly hearts were set. Not allowed to dispose of money or call anything their own, they learn to turn the market penny. Or should a husband offend by staying from home or give rise to some emotions of jealousy, a new gown or any pretty bauble smooths Juno's angry brow. But these littlenesses would not degrade their character if women were led to respect themselves, if political and moral subjects were open to them. And 
I will venture to affirm that this is the only way to make them properly attentive to their domestic duties. An active mind embraces the whole circle of its duties and finds time enough for all. It is not, I assert, a bold attempt to emulate masculine virtues. It is not the enchantment of literary pursuits or the steady investigation of scientific subjects that lead women astray from duty. No, it is indolence and vanity, the love of pleasure and the love of sway that will reign paramount in an empty mind. I say empty emphatically because the education which women now receive scarcely deserves the name for the little knowledge they are led to acquire during the important years of youth is merely relative to accomplishments and accomplishments without a bottom for unless the understanding be cultivated superficial and monotonous is every grace like the charms of a made-up face they only strike the senses in a crowd but at home wanting mind they want variety. The consequence is obvious. In gay scenes of dissipation, we meet the artificial mind and face. For those who fly from solitude, dread, next to solitude, the domestic circle. Not having it in their power to amuse or interest, they feel their own insignificance or find nothing to amuse or interest themselves. Besides, what can be more indelicate than a girl's coming out in the fashionable world, which, in other words, is to bring to market a marriageable miss, whose person is taken from one public place to another, richly caparisoned. Yet, mixing in the giddy circle under restraint, these butterflies long to flutter at large, for the first affection of their souls is their own person's, to which their attention has been called with the most sedulous care, whilst they were preparing for the period that decides their fate for life. Instead of pursuing this idle routine, sighing for the tasteless show and heartless state, with what dignity would the youths of both sexes form attachments in the schools that I have cursorily pointed out? in which, as life advanced, dancing, music, and drawing might be admitted as relaxations, for at these schools young people of fortune ought to remain more or less till they were of age. Those who were designed for particular professions might attend three or four mornings in the week, the schools appropriated for their immediate instruction. I only drop these observations at present as hints, rather, indeed, as an outline of the plan, I mean, than a digested one. But I must add that I highly approve of one regulation mentioned in the pamphlet already alluded to from the Bishop of Autun, that of making the children and youths independent of the masters respecting punishments. They should be tried by their peers, which would be an admirable method of fixing sound principles of justice in the mind, and might have the happiest effect on the temper, which is very early soured or irritated by tyranny, till it becomes peevishly cunning or ferociously overbearing. My imagination darts forward with benevolent fervor to greet these amiable and respectable groups, in spite of the sneering of cold hearts, who are at liberty to utter with frigid self-importance, the damning epithet romantic, the force of which I shall endeavor to blunt by repeating the words of an eloquent moralist. I quote, I know not whether the illusions of a truly humane heart, whose zeal renders everything easy, is not preferable to that rough and repulsing reason, which always finds in indifference for the public good the first obstacle to whatever would promote it. Close quote. I know that libertines will also exclaim that woman would be unsexed by acquiring strength of body and mind, and that beauty, soft, bewitching beauty, would no longer adorn the daughters of men. I am of a very different opinion, for I think that, on the contrary, 
we should then see dignified beauty and true grace, to produce which many powerful physical and moral causes would concur. Not relaxed beauty, it is true, nor the graces of helplessness, but such as appears to make us respect the human body as a majestic pile fit to receive a noble inhabitant in the relics of antiquity. I do not forget the popular opinion that the Grecian statues were not modeled after nature. I mean, not according to the proportions of a particular man, but that beautiful limbs and features were selected from various bodies to form an harmonious whole. This might, in some degree, be true. The fine ideal picture of an exalted imagination might be superior to the materials which the painter found in nature, and thus it might with propriety be termed rather the model of mankind than of a man. It was not, however, the mechanical selection of limbs and features, but the ebullition of an heated fancy that burst forth, and the fine senses and enlarged understanding of the artist selected the solid matter which he drew into this glowing focus. I observed that it was not mechanical because a whole was produced, a model of that grand simplicity of those concurring energies which arrest our attention and command our reverence. For only insipid, lifeless beauty is produced by a servile copy of even beautiful nature. Yet, independent of these observations, I believe, that the human form must have been far more beautiful than it is at present, because extreme indolence, barbarous ligatures, and many causes, which forcibly act on it in our luxurious state of society, did not retard its expansion or render it deformed. Exercise and cleanliness appeared to be not only the surest means of preserving health, but of promoting beauty the physical causes only considered. Yet this is not sufficient. Moral ones must concur, or beauty will be merely of that rustic kind which blooms on the innocent, wholesome countenances of some country people whose minds have not been exercised. To render the person perfect, physical and moral beauty ought to be attained at the same time, each lending and receiving force by the combination. Judgment must reside on the brow, affection and fancy beam in the eye, and humanity curve the cheek, or vain as the sparkling of the finest eye, or the elegantly turned finish of the fairest features. While in every motion that displays the active limbs and well-knit joints, grace and modesty should appear. But this fair assemblage is not to be brought together by chance. It is the reward of exertions meant to support each other, for judgment can only be acquired by reflection, affection, and by the discharge of duties, and humanity by the exercise of compassion to every living creature. Humanity to animals should be particularly inculcated as a part of national education, for it is not at present one of our national virtues. Tenderness for their humble, dumb domestics amongst the lower class is oftener to be found in a savage than a civilized state. For civilization prevents that intercourse which creates affection in the rude hut or mud cabin and leads uncultivated minds who are only depraved by the refinements which prevail in society where they are trodden underfoot by the rich, to domineer over them, to revenge the insults that they are obliged to bear from their superiors. This habitual cruelty is first taught at school, where it is one of the rare sports of the boys to torment the miserable brutes that fall in their way. The transition as they grow up from barbarity to brutes to domestic tyranny over wives, children, and servants is very easy. Justice or even benevolence will not be a powerful spring of action unless it extend to the whole creation. Nay, I believe that it may be delivered as an axiom 
that those who can see pain unmoved will soon learn to inflict it. The vulgar are swayed by present feelings and the habits which they have accidentally acquired. But on partial feelings, much dependence cannot be placed, though they be just. For when they are not invigorated by reflection, custom weakens them till they are scarcely felt. The sympathies of our nature are strengthened by pondering cogitations and deadened by thoughtless use. Macbeth's heart smote him more for one murder, the first, than for a hundred subsequent ones, which were necessary to back it. But when I used the epithet vulgar, I did not mean to confine my remark to the poor for partial humanity, founded on present sensations or whim, is quite as conspicuous, if not more so, amongst the rich. The lady who sheds tears for the bird starved in a snare and execrates the devils in the shape of men who goad to madness the poor ox or whip the patient ass, tottering under a burden above its strength, will, nevertheless, keep her coachman and horses whole hours waiting for her when the sharp frost bites or the rain beats against the well-closed windows, which do not admit a breath of air to tell her how roughly the wind blows without. And she who takes her dogs to bed and nurses them with a parade of sensibility when sick will suffer her babes to grow up crooked in a nursery. This illustration of my argument is drawn from a matter of fact. The woman whom I allude to was handsome, reckoned very handsome, by those who do not miss the mind when the face is plump and fair. But her understanding had not been led from female duties by literature, nor her innocence debauched by knowledge. No, she was quite feminine, according to the masculine acceptation of the word. And so far from loving these spoiled brutes that filled the place which her children ought to have occupied, she only lisped out a pretty mixture of French and English nonsense to please the men who flocked round her. The wife, mother, and human creature were all swallowed up by the factitious character which an improper education and the selfish vanity of beauty had produced. I do not like to make a distinction without a difference and I own that I have been as much disgusted by the fine lady who took her lapdog to her bosom instead of her child, as by the ferocity of a man who, beating his horse, declared that he knew as well when he did wrong as a Christian. This brood of folly shows how mistaken they are who, if they allow women to leave their harems, do not cultivate their understanding in order to plant virtues in their hearts. For had they sense, they might acquire that domestic taste which would lead them to love with reasonable subordination their whole family, from the husband to the house-dog. Nor would they ever insult humanity in the person of the most menial servant by paying more attention to the comfort of a brute than to that of a fellow-creature. My observations on national education are obviously hints, but I principally wish to enforce the necessity of educating the sexes together to perfect both, and of making children sleep at home, that they may learn to love home, yet to make private support, instead of smothering public affections, they should be sent to school to mix with a number of equals for only by the jostlings of equality can we form a just opinion of ourselves. To render mankind more virtuous and happier, of course, both sexes must act from the same principle. But how can that be expected when only one is allowed to see the reasonableness of it? To render also the social compact truly equitable, and in order to spread those enlightening principles, which alone can meliorate the fate of man, women must be allowed to found their virtue on knowledge, which is scarcely possible unless they be educated by the same pursuits as men. 
for they are now made so inferior by ignorance and low desires as not to deserve to be ranked with them, or by the serpentine wrigglings of cunning. They mount the tree of knowledge and only acquire sufficient to lead men astray. It is plain from the history of all nations that women cannot be confined to merely domestic pursuits, for they will not fulfill family duties unless their minds take a wider range, and whilst they are kept in ignorance, they become in the same proportion the slaves of pleasure as they are the slaves of man. Nor can they be shut out of great enterprises, though the narrowness of their minds often make them mar what they are unable to comprehend. The libertinism and even the virtues of superior men will always give women of some description great power over them, and these weak women, under the influence of childish passions and selfish vanity, will throw a false light over the objects which the very men view with their eyes, who ought to enlighten their judgment. Men of fancy, and those sanguine characters who mostly hold the helm of human affairs, in general, relax in the society of women. And certainly, I need not cite, to the most superficial reader of history, the numerous examples of vice and oppression which the private intrigues of female favorites have produced. Not to dwell on the mischief that naturally arises from the blundering interposition of well-meaning folly. For in the transactions of business it is much better to have to deal with a knave than a fool, because a knave adheres to some plan, and any plan of reason may be seen through much sooner than a sudden flight of folly. The power which vile and foolish women have had over wise men who possessed sensibility is notorious. I shall only mention one instance. Whoever drew a more exalted female character than Rousseau, though, in the lump, he constantly endeavored to degrade the sex? And why was he thus anxious? Truly, to justify to himself the affection which weakness and virtue had made him cherish for that fool Teresa. He could not raise her to the common level of her sex, and therefore he labored to bring woman down to hers. He found her a convenient, humble companion, and pride made him determined to find some superior virtues in the being whom he chose to live with. But did not her conduct during his life and after his death clearly show how grossly he was mistaken who called her a celestial innocent? Nay, in the bitterness of his heart he himself laments that when his bodily infirmities made him no longer treat her like a woman, she ceased to have an affection for him, and it was very natural that she should, for having so few sentiments in common, when the sexual tie was broken, what was to hold her? To hold her affection, whose sensibility was confined to one sex, nay, to one man, it requires sense to turn sensibility into the broad channel of humanity. Many women have not mind enough to have an affection for a woman or a friendship for a man. But the sexual weakness that makes women depend on man for a subsistence produces a kind of caddish affection which leads a wife to purr about her husband as she would about any man who fed and caressed her. Men are, however, often gratified by this kind of fondness, which is confined in a beastly manner to themselves. But should they ever become more virtuous, they will wish to converse at their fireside with a friend, after they cease to play with a mistress. Besides, understanding is necessary to give variety and interest to sensual enjoyments. For low indeed, in the intellectual scale, is the mind that can continue to love when neither virtue nor sense give a human appearance to an animal appetite. But sense will always preponderate, and if women are not, in general, brought more on a level with men, some superior women, like the Greek courtesans, will assemble the men of abilities around them, and draw from their families many citizens, who would have stayed at home had their wives had more sense or the graces which result from the exercise of the understanding and fancy, 
illegitimate parents of taste. A woman of talents, if she be not absolutely ugly, will always obtain great power, raised by the weakness of her sex, and in proportion as men acquire virtue and delicacy, by the exertion of reason, they will look for both in women, but they can only acquire them in the same way that men do. In France or Italy, have the women confined themselves to domestic life? Though they have not hitherto had a political existence, yet have they not illicitly had great sway, corrupting themselves and the men with whose passions they played? In short, in whatever light I view the subject, reason and experience convince me that the only method of leading women to fulfill their peculiar duties is to free them from all restraint by allowing them to participate in the inherent rights of mankind. Make them free, and they will quickly become wise and virtuous, as men become more so. For the improvement must be mutual, or the justice which one half of the human race are obliged to submit to, retorting on their oppressors, the virtue of man will be worm-eaten by the insect whom he keeps under his feet. Let men take their choice. Man and woman were made for each other, though not to become one being, and if they will not improve women, they will deprave them. I speak of the improvement and emancipation of the whole sex, for I know that the behavior of a few women who, by accident or following a strong bent of nature, have acquired a portion of knowledge superior to that of the rest of their sex, has often been overbearing. But there have been instances of women who, attaining knowledge, have not discarded modesty, nor have they always appeared to pedantically despise the ignorance which they labored to disperse in their own minds. The exclamations, then, which any advice respecting female learning commonly produces, especially from pretty women, often arise from envy. When they chance to see that even the luster of their eyes and the flippant sportiveness of refined coquetry will not always secure them attention during a whole evening, should a woman of a more cultivated understanding endeavor to give a rational turn to the conversation, the common source of consolation is that such women seldom get husbands. What arts have I not seen silly women use to interrupt by flirtation, a very significant word to describe such a maneuver, a rational conversation which made the men forget that they were pretty women. But allowing what is very natural to man, that the possession of rare abilities is really calculated to excite overweening pride, disgusting in both men and women, in what a state of inferiority must the female faculties have rusted when such a small portion of knowledge as those women attained, who have been sneeringly termed learned women, could be singular, sufficiently so to puff up the possessor and excite envy in her contemporaries and some of the other sex. Nay, has not a little rationality exposed many women to the severest censure. I advert to well-known facts, for I have frequently heard women ridiculed and every little weakness exposed only because they adopted the advice of some medical men and deviated from the beaten track in their mode of treating their infants. I have actually heard this barbarous aversion to innovation carried still further and a sensible woman stigmatized as an unnatural mother who has thus been wisely solicitous to preserve the health of her children when in the midst of her care she has lost one by some of the casualties of infancy which no prudence can ward off. Her acquaintance have observed that this was the consequence of new-fangled notions the newfangled notions of ease and cleanliness. And those who, pretending to experience, though they have long adhered to prejudices that have, according to the opinion of the most sagacious,
physicians, penned the human race, almost rejoiced at the disaster that gave a kind of sanction to prescription. Indeed, if it were only on this account, the national education of women is of the utmost consequence, for what a number of human sacrifices are made to that Moloch prejudice, and in how many ways are children destroyed by the lasciviousness of man. The want of natural affection in many women, who are drawn from their duty by the admiration of men and the ignorance of others, render the infancy of man a much more perilous state than that of brutes. Yet men are unwilling to place women in situations proper to enable them to acquire sufficient understanding to know how even to nurse their babes. So forcibly does this truth strike me, that I would rest the whole tendency of my reasoning upon it, for whatever tends to incapacitate the maternal character takes woman out of her sphere. But it is vain to expect the present race of weak mothers either to take that reasonable care of a child's body, which is necessary to lay the foundation of a good constitution, supposing that it do not suffer from the sins of its fathers, or to manage its temper so judiciously that the child will not have, as it grows up, to throw off all that its mother, its first instructor, directly or indirectly taught. And unless the mind have uncommon vigor, womanish follies will stick to the character throughout life. The weakness of the mother will be visited on the children. And while women are educated to rely on their husbands for judgment, this must ever be the consequence. For there is no improving an understanding by halves, nor can any being act wisely from imitation because in every circumstance of life there is a kind of individuality which requires an exertion of judgment to modify general rules. The being who can think justly in one track will soon extend its intellectual empire, and she who has sufficient judgment to manage her children will not submit to right or wrong, to her husband or patiently to the social laws which makes a non-entity of a wife. In public schools, women, to guard against the errors of ignorance, should be taught the elements of anatomy and medicine, not only to enable them to take proper care of their own health, but to make them rational nurses of their infants, parents, and husbands. For the bills of mortality are swelled by the blunders of self-willed old women who give nostrums of their own without knowing anything of the human frame. It is likewise proper, only in a domestic view, to make women acquainted with the anatomy of the mind by allowing the sexes to associate together in every pursuit and by leading them to observe the progress of the human understanding in the improvement of the sciences and arts, never forgetting the science of morality, nor the study of the political history of mankind. A man has been termed a microcosm, and every family might also be called a state. States, it is true, have mostly been governed by arts that disgrace the character of man, and the want of a just constitution and equal laws have so perplexed the notions of the worldly wise that they more than question the reasonableness of contending for the rights of humanity. Thus, morality, polluted in the national reservoir, sends off streams of vice to corrupt the constituent parts of the body politic. But should more noble, or rather more just, principles regulate the laws, which ought to be the government of society, and not those who execute them, duty might become the rule of private conduct. Besides, by the exercise of their bodies and minds, 
women would acquire that mental activity so necessary in the maternal character, united with the fortitude that distinguishes steadiness of conduct from the obstinate perverseness of weakness. For it is dangerous to advise the indolent to be steady, because they instantly become rigorous, and to save themselves trouble, punish with severity faults that the patient fortitude of reason might have prevented. But fortitude presupposes strength of mind. And is strength of mind to be acquired by indolent acquiescence? By asking advice instead of exerting the judgment? By obeying through fear instead of practicing the forbearance which we all stand in need of ourselves. The conclusion which I wish to draw is obvious. Make women rational creatures and free citizens, and they will quickly become good wives and mothers. That is, if men do not neglect the duties of husbands and fathers, Discussing the advantages which a public and private education combined, as I have sketched, might rationally be expected to produce, I have dwelt most on such as are particularly relative to the female world, because I think the female world oppressed. Yet the gangrene which the vices engendered by oppression have produced is not confined to the morbid part but pervades society at large, so that when I wish to see my sex become more like moral agents, my heart bounds with the anticipation of the general diffusion of that sublime contentment which only morality can diffuse. End of chapter 12 on National Education Read by Denny Sayers in Modesto, California for LibriVox, Spring 2006. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Caitlin Sticko, 2006. Vindication of the Rights of Women by Mary Wollstonecraft, Chapter 13. Chapter 13. Some Instances of the Folly Which the Ignorance of Women Generates, with Concluding Reflections on the Moral Improvement that a Revolution in Female Manners Might Naturally Be Expected to Produce. There are many follies, in some degree, peculiar to women, sins against reason of commission as well as of omission, but all flowing from ignorance or prejudice. I shall only point out such as appear to be injurious to their moral character. And in animadverting on them, I wish especially to prove that the weakness of mind and body, which men have endeavored by various motives to perpetuate, prevents their discharging the peculiar duty of their sex. For when weakness of body will not permit them to suckle their children, and weakness of mind makes them spoil their tempers, is woman in a natural state? Section 13.1 One glaring instance of the weakness which proceeds from ignorance first claims attention and calls for severe reproof. In this metropolis, a number of lurking leeches infamously gain a subsistence by practicing on the credulity of women, pretending to cast nativities, to use the technical phrase, and many females who proud of their rank and fortune, look down on the vulgar with sovereign contempt, show by this credulity that the distinction is arbitrary 
and that they have not sufficiently cultivated their minds to rise above vulgar prejudices. Women, because they have not been led to consider the knowledge of their duty as the one thing necessary to know, or to live in the present moment by the discharge of it, are very anxious to peep into futurity, to learn what they have to expect, to render life interesting and to break the vacuum of ignorance. I must be allowed to expostulate seriously with the ladies who follow these idle inventions, for ladies, mistresses of families, are not ashamed to drive in their own carriages to the door of the cunning man. And if any of them should peruse this work, I entreat them to answer to their own hearts the following questions, not forgetting that they are in the presence of God. Do you believe that there is but one God, and that he is powerful, wise, and good? Do you believe that all things were created by him, and that all beings are dependent on him? Do you rely on his wisdom? so conspicuous in his works and in your own frame? And are you convinced that he has ordered all things which do not come under the cognizance of your senses in the same perfect harmony to fulfill his designs? Do you acknowledge that the power of looking into futurity and seeing things that are not, as if they were, is an attribute of the Creator? And should he by an impression on the minds of his creatures, think fit to impart to them some event hid in the shades of time, yet unborn, to whom would the secret be revealed by immediate inspiration? The opinion of ages will answer this question. To reverend old men, to people distinguished for eminent piety, the oracles of old were thus delivered by priests dedicated to the service of God, who were supposed to inspire them. The glare of worldly pomp which surrounded these impostors, and the respect paid to them by artful politicians who knew how to avail themselves of this useful engine to bend the necks of the strong under the dominion of the cunning, spread a sacred mysterious veil of sanctity over their lies and abominations. Impressed by such solemn devotional parade, a Greek or Roman lady might be excused if she inquired of the oracle when she was anxious to pry into futurity or to inquire about some dubious event. And her inquiries, however contrary to reason, could not be reckoned impious. But... Can the professors of Christianity ward off that imputation? Can a Christian suppose that the favorites of the Most High, the highly favored, would be obliged to lurk in disguise and practice the most dishonest tricks to cheat silly women out of the money which the poor cry for in vain? Say not that such questions are an insult to common sense, for it is your own conduct, O oh ye foolish women, which throws an odium on your sex. And these reflections should make you shudder at your thoughtlessness and irrational devotion. For I do not suppose that all of you laid aside your religion, such as it is, when you entered those mysterious dwellings. Yet, as I have throughout supposed myself talking to ignorant women, for ignorant ye are in the most emphatical sense of the word. It would be absurd to reason with you on the egregious folly of desiring to know what the supreme wisdom has concealed. Probably you would not understand me were I to attempt to show you that it would be absolutely inconsistent with the grand purpose of life, that of rendering human creatures wise and virtuous, and that, were it sanctioned by God, it would disturb the order established in creation. And if it not be sanctioned by God, do you expect to hear truth? Can events be foretold, events which have not yet assumed a body to become subject to mortal inspection? Can they be foreseen by a vicious worldling who pampers his appetites by preying on the foolish ones? Perhaps, however, you devoutly believe in the devil, 
and imagine, to shift the question, that he may assist his votaries. But if really respecting the power of such a being, an enemy to goodness and to God, can you go to church after having been under such an obligation to him? From these delusions to those still more fashionable deceptions, practiced by the whole tribe of magnetizers, the transition is very natural. With respect to them, it is equally proper to ask women a few questions. Do you know anything of the construction of the human frame? If not, it is proper that you should be told what every child ought to know. That when its admirable economy has been disturbed by intemperance or indolence, I speak not of violent disorders, but of chronical diseases, it must be brought into a healthy state again by slow degrees. And if the functions of life have not been materially injured, regimen, another word for temperance, air, exercise, and a few medicines prescribed by persons who have studied the human body are the only human means yet discovered of recovering that inestimable blessing health, which will bear investigation. Do you then believe that these magnetizers, who by hocus-pocus tricks pretend to work a miracle, are delegated by God, or assisted by the solver of all these kind of difficulties, the devil? Do they, when they put to flight, as it is said, disorders that have baffled the powers of medicine, work in conformity to the light of reason? Or do they affect these wonderful cures by supernatural aid? By a communication, an adept may answer, with the world of spirits. A noble privilege, it must be allowed. Some of the ancients mentioned familiar demons who guarded them from danger, by kindly intimating, we cannot guess in what manner, when any danger was nigh, or pointed out what they ought to undertake. Yet the men who laid claim to this privilege, out of the order of nature, insisted that it was the reward or consequence of superior temperance and piety. But the present workers of wonders are not raised above their fellows by superior temperance or sanctity. They do not cure for the love of God, but money. These are the priests of quackery, though it may be true they have not the convenient expedient of selling masses for souls in purgatory, nor churches where they can display crutches and models of limbs made sound by a touch or a word. I am not conversant with the technical terms, nor initiated into the arcana. Therefore, I may speak improperly. But it is clear that men who will not conform to the law of reason and earn a subsistence in an honest way, by degrees, are very fortunate in becoming acquainted with such obliging spirits. We cannot, indeed, give them credit for either great sagacity or goodness, else they would have chosen more noble instruments when they wished to show themselves the benevolent friends of man. It is, however, little short of blasphemy to pretend to such power. From the whole tenor of the dispensations of providence, it appears evident to sober reason that certain vices produce certain effects. And can anyone so grossly insult the wisdom of God as to suppose that a miracle will be allowed to disturb his general laws, to restore the health of the intemperate and vicious, merely to enable them to pursue the same course with impunity? Be whole and sin no more, said Jesus, and are greater miracles to be performed by those who do not follow his footsteps, who healed the body to reach the mind. The mentioning of the name of Christ after such vile impostors may displease some of my readers. I respect their warmth, but let them not forget 
that the followers of these delusions bear his name and profess to be the disciples of him who said, By their works we should know who were the children of God or the servants of sin. I allow that it is easier to touch the body of a saint or to be magnetized than to restrain our appetites or govern our passions. But health of body or mind can only be recovered by these means, or we make the supreme judge partial and revengeful. Is he a man that he should change or punish out of resentment? He, the common father, wounds but to heal, says reason, and our irregularities, producing certain consequences, we are forcibly shown the nature of vice, that thus learning to know good from evil by experience, we may hate one and love the other in proportion to the wisdom which we attain. The poison contains the antidote, and we either reform our evil habits and cease to sin against our own bodies, to use the forcible language of scripture, or a premature death, the punishment of sin, snaps the thread of life. Here an awful stop is put to our inquiries. But why should I conceal my sentiments? Considering the attributes of God, I believe that whatever punishment may follow will tend, like the anguish of disease, to show the malignity of vice for the purpose of reformation. Positive punishment appears so contrary to the nature of God, discoverable in all his works and in our own reason, that I could sooner believe that the deity paid no attention to the conduct of men than that he punished without the benevolent design of reforming. To suppose only that an all-wise and powerful being, as good as he is great, should create a being foreseeing that after fifty or sixty years of feverish existence it would be plunged into never-ending woe, is blasphemy. On what will the worm feed that is never to die? On folly, on ignorance, say ye. I should blush indignantly at drawing the natural conclusion, could I insert it, and wish to withdraw myself from the wing of my God. On such a supposition, I speak with reverence, he would be a consuming fire. We should wish, though vainly, to fly from his presence when fear absorbed love and darkness involved all his counsels. I know that many devout people boast of submitting to the will of God blindly, as to an arbitrary scepter or rod, on the same principle as the Indians worship the devil. In other words, like people in the common concerns of life, they do homage to power and cringe under the foot that can crush them. Rational religion, on the contrary, is a submission to the will of a being so perfectly wise that all he wills must be directed by the proper motive, must be reasonable. And if we thus respect God, can we give credit to the mysterious insinuations which insult his laws? Can we believe, though it should stare us in the face, that he would work a miracle to authorize confusion by sanctioning an error. Yet we must either allow these impious conclusions, or treat with contempt every promise to restore health to a diseased body by supernatural means, or to foretell the incidents that can only be foreseen by God. Section 13.2 Another instance of that feminine weakness of character, often produced by a confined education, is a romantic twist of the mind, which has been very properly termed sentimental. Women, subjected by ignorance to their sensations and only taught to look for happiness in love, refine on sensual feelings and adopt metaphysical notions respecting that passion which lead them, shamefully, to neglect the duties of life, and frequently, in the midst of these sublime refinements, they plunge into actual vice. These are the women who are amused by the reveries of the stupid novelists, who, knowing little of human nature, 
work up stale tales and describe meretricious scenes, all retailed in sentimental jargon, which equally tend to corrupt the taste and draw the heart aside from its daily duties. I do not mention the understanding, because never having been exercised, its slumbering energies rest inactive, like the lurking particles of fire which are supposed universally to pervade matter. Females, in fact, denied all political privileges and not allowed as married women, excepting in criminal cases, a civil existence, have their attention naturally drawn from the interest of the whole community to that of the minute parts, though the private duty of any member of society must be very imperfectly performed when not connected with the general good. The mighty business of female life is to please, and restrained from entering into more important concerns by political and civil oppression, sentiments become events, and reflection deepens what it should and would have effaced if the understanding had been allowed to take a wider range. But, confined to trifling employments, they naturally imbibe opinions which the only kind of reading calculated to interest an innocent, frivolous mind inspires. Unable to grasp anything great, is it surprising that they find the reading of history a very dry task, and disquisitions addressed to the understanding intolerably tedious and almost unintelligible? Thus are they necessarily dependent on the novelist for amusement. Yet, when I exclaim against novels, I mean when contrasted with those works which exercise the understanding and regulate the imagination. For any kind of reading, I think better than leaving a blank still a blank, because the mind must receive a degree of enlargement and obtain a little strength by a slight exertion of its thinking powers. Besides, even the productions that are only addressed to the imagination raise the reader a little above the gross gratification of appetites to which the mind has not given a shade of delicacy. This observation is the result of experience, for I have known several notable women, and one in particular, who is a very good woman, as good as such a narrow mind would allow her to be, who took care that her daughters, three in number, should never see a novel. As she was a woman of fortune and fashion, they had various masters to attend them, and a sort of menial governess to watch their footsteps. From their masters they learned how tables, chairs, etc. were called in French and Italian. But as the few books thrown in their way were far above their capacities, or devotional, they neither acquired ideas nor sentiments, and passed their time, when not compelled to repeat words, in dressing, quarrelling with each other, or conversing with their maids by stealth, till they were brought into company as marriageable. Their mother, a widow, was busy in the meantime in keeping up her connections, as she termed a numerous acquaintance, lest her girls should want a proper introduction into the great world. And these young ladies, with minds vulgar in every sense of the word, and spoiled tempers, entered life puffed up with notions of their own consequence, and looking down with contempt on those who could not vie with them in dress and parade. With respect to love, nature or their nurses had taken care to teach them the physical meaning of the word, and as they had few topics of conversation and fewer refinements of sentiment, they expressed their gross wishes not in very delicate phrases when they spoke freely talking of matrimony. Could these girls have been injured by the perusal of novels? I almost forgot a shade in the character of one of them. She affected a simplicity bordering on folly, and with a simper would utter the most immodest remarks and questions 
the full meaning of which she had learned whilst secluded from the world, and afraid to speak in her mother's presence, who governed with a high hand. They were all educated, as she prided herself, in a most exemplary manner, and read their chapters and psalms before breakfast, never touching a silly novel. This is only one instance, but I recollect many other women who, not led by degrees to proper studies, and not permitted to choose for themselves, have indeed been overgrown children, or have obtained, by mixing in the world, a little of what is termed common sense, that is, a distinct manner of seeing common occurrences, as they stand detached. But what deserves the name of intellect, the power of gaining general or abstract ideas, or even intermediate ones, was out of the question. Their minds were quiescent, and when they were not roused by sensible objects and employments of that kind, they were low-spirited, would cry or go to sleep. When, therefore, I advise my sex not to read such flimsy works, it is to induce them to read something superior. For I coincide, in opinion, with a sagacious man who, having a daughter and niece under his care, pursued a very different plan with each. The niece, who had considerable abilities, had, before she was left to his guardianship, been indulged in desultory reading. Her he endeavoured to lead, and did lead, to history and moral essays. But his daughter, whom a fond, weak mother had indulged, and who consequently was averse to everything like application, he allowed to read novels, and used to justify his conduct by saying that if she ever attained a relish for reading them, he should have some foundation to work upon, and that erroneous opinions were better than none at all. In fact, the female mind has been so totally neglected that knowledge was only to be acquired from this muddy source, till from reading novels some women of superior talents learned to despise them. The best method, I believe, that can be adopted to correct a fondness for novels is to ridicule them, not indiscriminately, for then it would have little effect. But if a judicious person, with some turn for humour, would read several to a young girl, and point out, both by tones and apt comparisons with pathetic incidents and heroic characters in history, how foolishly and ridiculously they caricatured human nature, just opinions might be substituted instead of romantic sentiments. In one respect, however, the majority of both sexes resemble, and equally show a want of taste and modesty. Ignorant women, forced to be chaste to preserve their reputation, allow their imagination to revel in the unnatural and meretricious scenes sketched by the novel writers of the day, slighting as insipid the sober dignity and matronly grace of history. Footnote. I am not now alluding to that superiority of mind which leads to the creation of ideal beauty, when life, surveyed with a penetrating eye, appears a tragicomedy, in which little can be seen to satisfy the heart without the help of fancy. Whilst men carry the same vitiated taste into life and fly for amusement to the wanton from the unsophisticated charms of virtue, and the grave respectability of sense. Besides, the reading of novels makes women, and particularly ladies of fashion, very fond of using strong expressions and superlatives in conversation. And though the dissipated, artificial life which they lead prevents their cherishing any strong, legitimate passion, the language of passion, in affected tones, slips for ever from their glib tongues, and every trifle produces those phosphoric bursts which only mimic in the dark 
the flame of passion. End of chapter 13a. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Caitlin Stickow, 2006. A Vindication of the Rights of Woman by Mary Wollstonecraft. Section 13.3 Ignorance and the mistaken cunning that nature sharpens in weak heads as a principle of self-preservation render women very fond of dress and produce all the vanity which such a fondness may naturally be expected to generate to the exclusion of emulation and magnanimity i agree with rousseau that the physical part of the art of pleasing consists in ornaments and for that very reason I should guard girls against the contagious fondness for dress so common to weak women that they may not rest in the physical part. Yet weak are the women who imagine they can long please without the aid of the mind, or, in other words, without the moral art of pleasing. But the moral art, if it be not a profanation to use the word art when alluding to the grace which is an effect of virtue and not the motive of action, is never to be found with ignorance. The sportiveness of innocence, so pleasing to refined libertines of both sexes, is widely different in its essence from this superior gracefulness. A strong inclination for external ornaments ever appears in barbarous states. Only the men, not the women, adorn themselves. For where women are allowed to be so far on a level with men, society has advanced at least one step in civilization. The attention to dress, therefore, which has been thought a sexual propensity, I think natural to mankind but I ought to express myself with more precision. When the mind is not sufficiently opened to take pleasure in reflection, the body will be adorned with sedulous care, and ambition will appear in tattooing or painting it. So far is the first inclination carried that even the hellish yoke of slavery cannot stifle the savage desire of admiration which black heroes inherit from both their parents, for all the hardly earned savings of a slave are commonly expended in a little tawdry finery, and I have seldom known of a good male or female servant that was not particularly fond of dress. Their clothes were their riches, and I argue from analogy that the fondness for dress, so extravagant in females, arises from the same cause, want of cultivation of mind. When men meet, they converse about business, politics, or literature. But, says Swift, quote, how naturally do women apply their hands to each other's lappets and ruffles, end quote. And very natural it is, for they have not any business to interest them, have not a taste for literature, and they find politics dry, because they have not acquired a love for mankind by turning their thoughts to the grand pursuits that exalt the human race and promote general happiness. Besides, various are the paths to power and fame, which by accident or choice men pursue, and though they jostle against each other, for men of the same profession are seldom friends, yet there is a much greater number of their fellow creatures with whom they never clash. But women are very differently situated with respect to each other, for they are all rivals. Before marriage it is their business to please men, and after, with a few exceptions, they follow the same scent with all the persevering pertinacity of instinct. Even virtuous women never forget their sex in company, for they are ever trying to make themselves agreeable. 
a female beauty and a male wit appear to be equally anxious to draw the attention of the company to themselves, and the animosity of contemporary wits is proverbial. Is it then surprising that when the sole ambition of women centres in beauty and interest gives vanity additional force, perpetual rivalships should ensue? They are all running the same race, and would rise above the virtue of mortals if they did not view each other with a suspicious and even envious eye. An immoderate fondness for dress, for pleasure and for sway, are the passions of savages, the passions that occupy those uncivilized beings who have not yet extended the dominion of the mind, or even learned to think with the energy necessary to concatenate that abstract train of thought which produces principles, and that women, from their education and the present state of civilized life, are in the same condition cannot, I think, be controverted. To laugh at them, then, or satirize the follies of a being who is never allowed to act freely from the light of her own reason, is as absurd as cruel, for that they who are taught blindly to obey authority will endeavor cunningly to elude it, is most natural and certain. Yet let it be proved that they ought to obey men implicitly, and I shall immediately agree that it is a woman's duty to cultivate a fondness for dress in order to please and a propensity to cunning for her own preservation. The virtues, however, which are supported by ignorance, must ever be wavering. The house built on sand could not endure a storm. It is almost unnecessary to draw the inference. If women are to be made virtuous by authority, which is a contradiction in terms, let them be immured in seraglios and watched with a jealous eye. Fear not that the iron will enter into their souls, for the souls that can bear such treatment are made of yielding materials, just animated enough to give life to the body. Quote, Matter too soft, a lasting mark to bear, and best distinguished by black, brown, or fair. End quote. The most cruel wounds will, of course, soon heal and they may still people the world and dress to please men. All the purposes which certain celebrated writers have allowed that they were created to fill. Section 13.4 Women are supposed to possess more sensibility and even humanity than men, and their strong attachments and instantaneous emotions of compassion are given as proofs. But the clinging affection of ignorance has seldom anything noble in it, and may mostly be resolved into selfishness, as well as the affection of children and brutes. I have known many weak women whose sensibility was entirely engrossed by their husbands, and as for their humanity, it was very faint indeed, or rather, it was only a transient emotion of compassion, Humanity does not consist in a squeamish ear, says an eminent orator. It belongs to the mind as well as the nerves. But this kind of exclusive affection, though it degrade the individual, should not be brought forward as a proof of the inferiority of the sex, because it is the natural consequence of confined views. For even women of superior sense having their attention turned to little employments and private plans, rarely rise to heroism, unless when spurred on by love. And love as a heroic passion, like genius, appears but once in an age. I therefore agree with the moralist who asserts, quote, that women have seldom so much generosity as men, end quote, and that their narrow affections, to which justice and humanity are often sacrificed, render the sex apparently inferior, especially as they are commonly inspired by men. But I contend 
that the heart would expand as the understanding gained strength if women were not depressed from their cradles. I know that a little sensibility and great weakness will produce a strong sexual attachment, and that reason must cement friendship. Consequently, I allow that more friendship is to be found in the male than female world, and that men have a higher sense of justice. The exclusive affections of women seem indeed to resemble Cato's most unjust love for his country. He wished to crush Carthage, not to save Rome, but to promote its vain glory, and in general it is to similar principles that humanity is sacrificed, for genuine duties support each other. Besides, how can women be just or generous when they are the slaves of injustice? Section 13.5 as the rearing of children, that is, the laying a foundation of sound health, both of body and mind, in the rising generation, has justly been insisted on as the peculiar destination of woman, the ignorance that incapacitates them must be contrary to the order of things. And I contend that their minds can take in much more, and ought to do so or they will never become sensible mothers. Many men attend to the breeding of horses and overlook the management of the stable who would, strange want of sense and feeling, think themselves degraded by paying any attention to the nursery. Yet how many children are absolutely murdered by the ignorance of women? But when they escape, and are neither destroyed by unnatural negligence nor blind fondness, how few are managed properly with respect to the infant mind, so that to break the spirit allowed to become vicious at home, a child is sent to school, and the methods taken there, which must be taken to keep a number of children in order, scatter the seeds of almost every vice in the soil thus forcibly torn up. I have sometimes compared the struggles of these poor children, who ought never to have felt restraint, nor would, had they been always held in with an even hand, to the despairing plunges of a spirited filly, which I have seen breaking on a strand its feet sinking deeper and deeper in the sand every time it endeavoured to throw its rider, till at last it sullenly submitted. I have always found horses, an animal I am attached to, very tractable when treated with humanity and steadiness, so that I doubt whether the violent methods taken to break them do not essentially injure them. I am, however, certain that a child should never be thus forcibly tamed after it has injudiciously been allowed to run wild, for every violation of justice and reason in the treatment of children weakens their reason. And so early do they catch a character that the base of their moral character, experience leads me to infer, is fixed before their seventh year the period during which women are allowed the sole management of children. Afterwards, it too often happens that half the business of education is to correct, and very imperfectly it is done, if done hastily, the faults which they would never have acquired if their mothers had had more understanding. One striking instance of the folly of women must not be omitted, the manner in which they treat servants in the presence of children, permitting them to suppose that they ought to wait on them and bear their humours. A child should always be made to receive assistance from a man or woman as a favour, and as the first lesson of independence they should practically be taught, by the example of their mother, not to require that personal attendance which it is an insult to humanity to require when in health, and instead of being led to assume airs of consequence, 
a sense of their own weakness should first make them feel the natural equality of man. Yet how frequently have I indignantly heard servants imperiously called to put children to bed, and being sent away again and again, because master or miss hung about mamma to stay a little longer, thus made slavishly to attend the little idol, all those most disgusting humours were exhibited which characterise a spoiled child. In short, speaking of the majority of mothers, they leave their children entirely to the care of servants, or, because they are their children, treat them as if they were little demigods, though I have always observed that women who thus idolise their children seldom show common humanity to servants, or feel the least tenderness for any children but their own. It is, however, these exclusive affections, and an individual manner of seeing things, produced by ignorance, which keep women for ever at a stand with respect to improvement, and make many of them dedicate their lives to their children only to weaken their bodies and spoil their tempers, frustrating also any plan of education that a more rational father may adopt, for unless a mother concurs, the father who restrains will ever be considered as a tyrant. But, fulfilling the duties of a mother, a woman with a sound constitution may still keep her person scrupulously neat, and assist to maintain her family, if necessary, or, by reading and conversations with both sexes indiscriminately, improve her mind. For nature has so wisely ordered things, that did women suckle their children, they would preserve their own health, and there would be such an interval between the birth of each child, that we should seldom see a house full of babes. And did they pursue a plan of conduct, and not waste their time in following the fashionable vagaries of dress, the management of their household and children need not shut them out from literature, nor prevent their attaching themselves to a science with that steady eye which strengthens the mind, or practising one of the fine arts that cultivate the taste. But, visiting to display finery, card-playing, and balls, not to mention the idle bustle of morning trifling, draw women from their duty, to render them insignificant, to render them pleasing, according to the present acceptation of the word, to every man but their husband. For a round of pleasures in which the affections are not exercised cannot be said to improve the understanding, though it be erroneously called seeing the world. Yet the heart is rendered cold and averse to duty by such a senseless intercourse, which becomes necessary from habit, even when it has ceased to amuse. But, till more equality be established in society, till ranks are confounded and women freed, we shall not see that dignified domestic happiness the simple grandeur of which cannot be relished by ignorant or vitiated minds, nor will the important task of education ever be properly begun till the person of a woman is no longer preferred to her mind. For it would be as wise to expect corn from tares or figs from thistles as that a foolish, ignorant woman should be a good mother. Section 13.6 It is not necessary to inform the sagacious reader, now I enter on my concluding reflections, that the discussion of this subject merely consists in opening a few simple principles and clearing away the rubbish which obscured them. But as all readers are not sagacious, I must be allowed to add some explanatory remarks to bring the subject home to reason, to that sluggish reason which supinely takes opinions on trust and obstinately supports them to spare itself the labour of thinking. Moralists have unanimously agreed 
that unless virtue be nursed by liberty, it will never attain due strength. And what they say of man, I extend to mankind, insisting that in all cases morals must be fixed on immutable principles, and that the being cannot be termed rational or virtuous who obeys any authority but that of reason. To render women truly useful members of society, I argue that they should be led, by having their understandings cultivated on a large scale, to acquire a rational affection for their country, founded on knowledge, because it is obvious that we are little interested about what we do not understand. And to render this general knowledge of due importance, I have endeavoured to show that private duties are never properly fulfilled unless the understanding enlarges the heart, and that public virtue is only an aggregate of private. But the distinctions established in society undermine both by beating out the solid gold of virtue till it becomes only the tinsel covering of vice. For whilst wealth renders a man more respectable than virtue, wealth will be sought before virtue. And whilst women's persons are caressed when a childish simper shows an absence of mind, the mind will lie fallow. Yet true voluptuousness must proceed from the mind, for what can equal the sensations produced by mutual affection? supported by mutual respect. What are the cold or feverish caresses of appetite but sin embracing death, compared with the modest overflowings of a pure heart and exalted imagination? Yes, let me tell the libertine of fancy, when he despises understanding in woman, that the mind, which he disregards, gives life to the enthusiastic affection from which rapture, short-lived as it is, alone can flow, and that without virtue a sexual attachment must expire like a tallow candle in the socket, creating intolerable disgust. To prove this, I need only observe that men who have wasted great parts of their lives with women, and with whom they have sought for pleasure with eager thirst, entertain the meanest opinion of the sex. Virtue, true refiner of joy, if foolish men were to fright thee from the earth in order to give loose to all their appetites without a check, some sensual white of taste would scale the heavens to invite thee back to give a zest to pleasure. That women at present are by ignorance rendered foolish or vicious is, I think, not to be disputed, and that the most salutary effects tending to improve mankind might be expected from a revolution in female manners appears at least with a face of probability to rise out of the observation. For as marriage has been termed the parent of those endearing charities which draw man from the brutal herd, the corrupting intercourse that wealth idleness and folly produced between the sexes, is more universally injurious to morality than all the other vices of mankind collectively considered. To adulterous lust, the most sacred duties are sacrificed, because, before marriage, men, by a promiscuous intimacy with women, learn to consider love as a selfish gratification learn to separate it not only from esteem, but from the affection merely built on habit, which mixes a little humanity with it. Justice and friendship are also set at defiance, and that purity of taste is vitiated, which would naturally lead a man to relish an artless display of affection rather than affected airs. But that noble simplicity of affection which dares to appear unadorned, has few attractions for the libertine, though it be the charm which, cementing the matrimonial tie, secures to the pledges of a warmer passion the necessary parental attention, for children will never be properly educated 
till friendship subsists between parents. Virtue flies from a house divided against itself, and a whole legion of devils take up their residence there. The affection of husbands and wives cannot be pure when they have so few sentiments in common, and when so little confidence is established at home, as must be the case when their pursuits are so different, that intimacy from which tenderness should flow will not, cannot, subsist between the vicious. Contending, therefore, that the sexual distinction which men have so warmly insisted upon is arbitrary, I have dwelt on an observation that several sensible men with whom I have conversed on the subject allowed to be well founded, and it is simply this, that the little chastity to be found amongst men, and consequent disregard of modesty, tend to degrade both sexes, and further, that the modesty of women, characterized as such, will often be only the artful veil of wantonness, instead of being the natural reflection of purity, till modesty be universally respected. From the tyranny of man, I firmly believe, the greater number of female follies proceed, and the cunning, which I allow makes at present a part of their character, I likewise have repeatedly endeavoured to prove is produced by oppression. Were not dissenters, for instance, a class of people with strict truth characterised as cunning? And may I not lay some stress on this fact to prove that when any power but reason curbs the free spirit of man, dissimulation is practised, and the various shifts of art are naturally called forth. Great attention to decorum, which was carried to a degree of scrupulosity, and all that puerile bustle about trifles and consequential solemnity which Butler's caricature of a dissenter brings before the imagination, shaped their persons as well as their minds in the mould of prim littleness. I speak collectively, for I know how many ornaments to human nature have been enrolled amongst sectaries. Yet I assert that the same narrow prejudice for their sect, which women have for their families, prevailed in the dissenting part of the community, however worthy in other respects, and also that the same timid prudence or headstrong efforts often disgraced the exertions of both. Oppression thus formed many of the features of their character perfectly to coincide with that of the oppressed half of mankind, for is it not notorious that dissenters were like women, fond of deliberating together and asking advice of each other, till by a complication of little contrivances some little end was brought about? A similar attention to preserve their reputation was conspicuous in the dissenting and female world, and was produced by a similar cause. Asserting the rights which women in common with men ought to contend for, I have not attempted to extenuate their faults, but to prove them to be the natural consequence of their education and station in society. If so, it is reasonable to suppose that they will change their character and correct their vices and follies when they are allowed to be free in a physical, moral, and civil sense. Let woman share the rights, and she will emulate the virtues of man for she must grow more perfect when emancipated, or justify the authority that chains such a weak being to her duty. If the latter, it will be expedient to open a fresh trade with Russia for whips, a present which a father should always make to his son-in-law on his wedding day, that a husband may keep his whole family in order by the same means, and without any violation of justice reign, wielding this sceptre, sole master of his house, because he is the only being in it who has reason. The divine, indefeasible, earthly sovereignty breathed into man by the master of the universe. Allowing this position, women have not any inherent rights to claim, 
and by the same rule their duties vanish, for rights and duties are inseparable. Be just then, O ye men of understanding, and mark not more severely what women do amiss than the vicious tricks of the horse or the ass for whom ye provide provender, and allow her the privileges of ignorance to whom ye deny the rights of reason, or ye will be worse than Egyptian taskmasters, expecting virtue where nature has not given understanding. End of chapter 13b End of book A Vindication of the Rights of Woman by Mary Wollstonecraft